Hey everybody, it's that time of year. I'm in Franklin, Tennessee, and getting ready to release episode 43. Three years ago today, we kicked off the first episode of the Sean Ryan Show, and since then, we've had 43 episodes. And in just 43 episodes, we have hit up to number 55 overall out of over 8 million podcasts. I just want to say thank you all. That's all you guys. It's the reviews. It's the likes. It's the subscribes. It's all of that. It's sharing the content. It's sharing the love. I think we spread a very positive message here on this platform, and we're going to continue to do that. And um, I just want to say Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, Happy Holidays, whatever your flavor is this time of year, me and the team at Vigilance Elite just want to wish you the best. We love you all. Let's get to the next guest. My next guest I had the pleasure of working with very briefly at my time in SEAL Team 2 before he went on to SEAL Team 6 Development Group. Guys, this is another really, really deep one. It's one of the best episodes I've ever done. If I had to say one thing about Eddie with my time with him outside of my studio is he's one of the few guys in the SEAL teams that just has a reputation and his reputation is he's just a guy that everybody wants to be around. He's just a solid human being. He's a solid operator. He spreads a lot of love. He's got a hell of a story. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome my friend Eddie Penny to the Sean Ryan Show. Please like, subscribe, and comment to the channel. Head over to iTunes and Spotify. Leave us a review. Once again, we love you all. Merry Christmas. Happy Holidays. Happy Hanukkah. I hope you guys enjoy the show. And uh, it's going to be a hell of a year in 2023. Happy New Year, too. Love you guys. Cheers. <laughs> Eddie Penny, welcome to the show, brother. Thank you for having me, man. I appreciate it. It's been damn near 20 years. Don't, again, don't put the number to it. Can you it, believe man. that? <laughs> it's crazy. It's been a long time. It's been a long time. So former Marine, then you went to SEAL Team 2, then you went to Development Group, CEO of Contingent Group, CEO of Unafraid. You got a podcast with your wife now. Who seems lovely, by the way. She's awesome. She, she definitely makes you happy. She's the queen. She's That's the awesome. queen for sure. But uh, anything else? Am I missing anything? Uh, some, you know, some side hustles here for like leadership or team building stuff that I do with other other individuals, organizations, some speaking. But yeah, kind of, I fall under the unafraid brand or that that whole mindset piece. So that's about uh, covers it. Just getting into motivational speaking. Pretty, yeah, just recently, it just kind of. I wouldn't say walking away from contingent group, but just kind of getting other people to take certain things on and then moving over to the encouragement side. That's your passion though, right? Right now, yeah. It's like it's taken over and I and I yeah, can't fight it. It's just like God, that's what I want to do. I like it. Well, we got a lot to dig into. Uh, yeah, we do. The first thing I noticed after not seeing you for twenty years, your vocabulary has changed quite a bit. There's no more four letter uh Yes, that's uh, yeah. I four letter bad words in there. About six months ago, I was I've been trying to just 
better myself. I like, I don't want to do this. I just kind of noticed I'm cussing more and it'd be around my children, not even realizing it was like kind of default from the military. I mean, you know who we hang out with. We kind of have a bad, bad mouth. Uh, and I, and I don't look at other people bad for it. It's just like, I, I don't want to do that. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. So I've been, and it's been, it's been a struggle. You've it's only a, been doing that for six months. For about it up. six months. Yeah. And I'd say probably like the last month, maybe month and a half that it's like, okay, I'm really doing good. I might have like one slip up a day or something, but I'm like, oh gosh, just, just trying to better myself. I just don't want, I just don't want to do it. Man, it's, I've been That's trying it. to do it. It's hard. And I can't. It's freaking I hard. You don't even dance around the words. It's it's like it was never part of your vocabulary. Doing a great job. <laughs> yeah, well, well, we'll see <laughs> here. You know the things we're going to talk about. I'll do I'll do my best. Uh, but yeah, I just I noticed like certain podcasts, and again, it doesn't offend me whatsoever. I mean, I'd be a huge hypocrite if I said it did, because uh, I used it probably too much. It was like every other word, and uh, I just like man, I just it's not a I don't want to be known for that, especially when you're talking to other people, you're trying to encourage other people and my children, like trying to be the example, right? And yeah. that's one of the things that I need to get rid of. And and it's been, it hasn't been easy. Yeah, we're doing a hell of a job. I appreciate that, buddy. So, but hey, everybody that comes on starts off with a gift. This is a box of donuts. <laughs> it might be, it might be. The Sean Ryan Show. We were just talking about this. Thank Made you. in America, legal in all 50 states. So far, right? Yeah, right now they are. I love it, man. Thank you. I appreciate that. You're welcome. And I'm going to probably eat those on the flight home, all of them. Good for you. <laughs> but And we we didn't say author. You just yeah, so, released yeah, that's your a, new yeah, book, it's Unafraid. It's so new. And then, yeah, author of Unafraid and now working on book number two and kind of number three. How's the book doing? It's doing good, man. We're getting a lot of good feedback. Uh, and that was kind of the beginning of like when we went in the beginning, when we, uh, when myself and Keith Wood, the co-writer, great friend now, we started writing. I was like, hey, there's there's one thing and, and that is to help others and like glorify God. Like I do not want to skimp on that piece because for me, that was my like, saved my life. It really did. And uh, we can get into that stuff. But uh, yeah, it, it's been awesome. The feedback we've gotten from it's helping a lot of people, uh, both veterans, single parents, and people that are just struggling. It doesn't really just go for veterans. It's really for anyone and everyone. Because I, I mentioned briefly, uh, as you know, at the end of each chapter, we got the hot wash. And it's kind of like a debrief or a critique of that particular chapter in my life. And I'm just kind of talk about things. And it, it originally started to be letters to my children. Like, hey, don't make the same mistakes that I did. And and we kind of brought in this, like, hey, this this needs to be to everyone. So it's kind of dedicated to everyone. It's like, hey, and people that aren't even affiliated with the military, law enforcement, or anything that could be close to it or reaching out uh, saying, hey, this really helped, you know, my organization or my business. And that they're just hearing that, it's everything. Definitely needed. It'll be linked in the description. And everybody go buy his book and leave a review. Yeah, leave a review for the huge. book. So I'll leave a review right after this interview, but I can't wait to dig into it. Uh, we're going to talk all about the book. One chapter in particular that caught my attention was Kill Addict. Yeah. So I want to get into that. But um, And then the interview, we'll start with childhood. This is your biography here. So we're going to start with your childhood, moving into your uh, Marine Corps years, SEAL team, dev group the dreaded transition and and everything you got going on now. Awesome. But um, first, before we kind of get into the weeds, you're sitting here, I'm sitting here because of my Patreon community, the Vigilance Lead Patreon community. They support the show. They support everybody that works here. They're awesome. And um, anyways, I give them, I tell them who's coming on the show. They're all excited about you. There's a ton of questions. We only have time for one because there's going to be a long one. But, Make it um, easy. <laughs> yeah. It's a tough question, though. It's a tough question. So this is from Eric Covington. What advice as a single dad would, you, would he give to help communicate to a young daughter to have a foundation of understanding on how to deal with fear? the woke world and how to keep a solid mindset growing up in today's culture as a kid and a young woman. 
That's a that's a great question, and that's a great question. He said the word mindset, which I I love, as you know. Um, as a father, speaking, and this is based off personal experience. Uh, as I talk about the book, getting custody of my children. One was a boy, and I had two daughters, five and ten, and then my son was a ten month old, and coming from an operator where you're kind of in savage mode and then coming back and like, you need to focus on these little people and the difference between me talking to my son versus my daughters. I'm used to talking to guys like us, team guys, military guys that are getting shot at that are shooting other people. So I kind of had to change or shift by knowing my audience. And I, and it took me a while and, and, and I made a lot of mistakes. I, my tone, I was kind of more of a do as I say, not, you know, like I'm the drill instructor kind of, and it was, it was completely wrong. Uh, but to answer that question, I would say that empathy, getting on their level, having those feelings, listening, this was very hard for me, was listening. You do not know it all just because you're a father or a mother that's raising these children. We don't know it all. Those little, those little people running around can teach us a lot about just humanity, each other, yourself. Uh, they're trying to communicate. And a lot of times that I've learned when they're at a certain age, they just don't know the words to communicate what they're feeling. They don't know what that is. Like the sadness. They don't, a lot of them don't know that that's what they're feeling. I mean, we're grown adults making mistakes like, man, I'm angry. I should probably pull myself out of this situation before I've maybe punch somebody in the face or do something I shouldn't do. Uh, but getting on their level, listening to them, processing what they they say, take that pause, and then you know delivering that in a proper way by not raising your voice, uh, guilty. Uh, but be the example. They're gonna watch you. They're gonna watch what you do. They're gonna watch how you speak. Back to the cussing piece, right? Watch how you speak. How you interact with people. How do you go grocery shopping? How do you drive? All these little things, they're, get, they're like, they're just gathering, they're little sponges, they're just gathering all this information. Um, and then try to develop that relationship as best you can. But like, to go off of that question from what I personally is, what I failed to do was just listen. Listen to what they were trying to communicate, get more information out of them, get on their level, and just get in their world. Get in their world, which is tough to do because we're, we're like, we're for the most part, self-absorbed humans. Like we're, we're kind of thinking about me, 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 and you know, and I'm no exception to it. Um, but that would be my advice is like, and it's tough. It is tough. It, Cause if it wasn't tough, everyone would be doing it and we're not doing it. And especially we see bringing the media and we go to school and like twerking's the coolest thing. I mean, more people know about twerking than they know about like being a good person yeah. or morals and ethics or integrity. And it's sad so the, the, the place, and we can't, we, I think a lot of us blame it on the school system. And I'm not saying that they are not guilty, but it starts in the home. Yeah. I mean, it starts in the home. For us to become an operator, where did it start? It started in BUDS, the foundation. This is what a SEAL is. This is what an operator does. And then we just grew upon that. It's like anything with a peewee football to grade school football, to high school football, to college football, to NFL, and you're just stacking on this experience and wisdom as we go. Well, the foundation starts back when you're in peewee, how to treat people, right? What is teamwork? What does it mean to lose? What can we improve upon? Learning learning the lesson, right? But that goes back to the home. So the parents, yeah, it starts with you and it ends with you. Plain and simple, and I truly believe that. And I'm not going to pretend that I make all the right decisions. I don't. I fail almost daily, I would say. I'm like, crap, I got to fix that. Mm, I got to fix that. Uh, I don't want my kid to see me drinking a lot. I don't want them to hear me cussing. I don't want them to hear me raise my voice to my wife because that's not okay. Because guess what? They're going to do the same thing. If I think if we take a step back and look at how we were raised, we're probably doing a lot of the same things. Yeah. So. Totally agree with so, that. So long answer, but that's uh, it's a great question. That That is a great question. Uh, that's situation dictates per family, but great question. Yeah. You know, there was a lot of questions on there for you. A lot of it had to do with dev group and stuff, but I, you know, listening to your story, um, I listened to one of your podcasts from Mike Ritland several years ago and man, you think, you know, a guy and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and the parent piece in there yeah. was really, really 
powerful and touching. And so I thought that was the perfect question for you. That's a good question. But, um, <clears throat> and then just to add to that, I do, you know, everybody these days is looking for somebody to blame. And yeah, the school system, it's all over the news, you know, what they're teaching. And I disagree with a lot of it. Yeah, so, so do I. With that being said, you are your kid's biggest example. And if you don't like that kind of shit, they're, you're the example. Just yep. lead by example, and 100%. they're going to follow. And which is hard to do, and I and I talk about that as you never know who's watching you. I go over like coaches that I watched, certain individuals that I watched. But I did one little thing, one certain thing that means nothing to them, but it meant the world to me. That changed my work ethic, the way I treat people. It's huge. Yeah. It's just one thing. There's a there's a study out there, and I and I and I don't know where it came from, but it's like for every every negative thing that we do, it takes 10 positives to erase that negative. So if we raise our voice at our kids or do something, we don't listen to them. We assume that we know what's going on. They're going to hold on to that. They're not going to remember that. Hey, good job on your football in your football game or good job on your grades. It takes 10 of those good attaboys to get rid of that negative. Damn. It just goes to show you how powerful that negative piece is. And unfortunately my children growing up dealt with more negative than positive from me. Because to be honest with you, I was the child. I didn't know what to do. I was lost. And yeah. I turned to drinking. I turned to pills to sleep at night. And uh, yeah, they taught me a lot. Well, before we get into that, let's start with your childhood. I know you grew up in Ohio. Yep, Cincinnati, Ohio. Uh, played sports pretty much the whole time. Uh, mostly football, baseball, and then... Um, Were you good at them? I was good at baseball. I was good at peewee football. And then when I got to like seventh, eighth grade, uh, I was kind of late. Late growing, bloomer. Late bloomer. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I told my dad, I was like, hey, these, these, guys are, these guys are too big. And I'm like, I just, I just don't want to do it. So I quit. And, uh, and I'm glad I did. And when I did that, I joined the swim team. Which was great for buds, not yeah. realizing that I was going to go to buds. Uh, but as a child, I was always running through the woods. I would play video games maybe on Saturdays. I think my mom would let me have it for about an hour or two, and I play Contra. You know, up, up, down, down, left, right, left, right, BA, start, <laughs> right. You know the the good codes. Oh yeah. So uh, I would do that, but mostly in the woods, building forts, running like a madman, making spears. Um, all kinds of stuff, man. But that was like, that was my passion, just being out in the woods and roaming the creeks, looking for snakes to kill them. Cause that was with a, a good buddy Oz that I grew up with that, uh, we call ourselves the snake killers and we just <laughs> go out, you know, looking for Yeti or something and killing snakes. But nice. it was, it was a great childhood, man. It was always outdoors, fishing, just something, swimming yeah. in lakes. Uh, it was, it was a good time. It was awesome. Brothers and sisters. I had a cat. A cat. I did. No brother and sisters, only child. I tortured that cat, Alex. I don't see you as a cat person. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I don't either. But the, there he was. I think our neighbor had a litter. My mom said, maybe this guy needs a cat because I'm not going to give him a son <laughs> or, uh, or a brother or sister. So we had a cat. I mean, it was, it was awesome. But I like, I would, uh, when we moved, when I was in seventh grade, I'd like drop him off the balcony. We had like a the loft kind of like overlooks. I would drop him off and we had a couch underneath and he would kind of bounce off the couch. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was out of good fun. I wasn't like, hey, let's torture this guy. But yeah. uh, he, he did not like me. I would like hold him. I mean, just, yeah. Things you shouldn't be doing. Just things I shouldn't be doing. Yeah. Were you popular growing up? Uh, I wouldn't say popular. I was friends with everybody. Like yeah. the jocks. The, that guy was just nice to everybody. Um, never really bullied or picked on. But I mean, I was kind of into my little clique with the swim team. Uh, that was probably, yeah, I was friends with everyone. Well, good childhood. Good childhood. Good, yeah, it good, sounds, good childhood. Like, yeah. sounds like a good. good childhood. Tight with your parents and everything. Yeah, so my parents were divorced. Um, and I lived with my mom for, for most of the time. I'd go see my dad every other weekend and like dinner on Wednesday or Thursday night. Would go out to whatever, get some food, and he would drop me back off of the house. Uh, but yeah, I mean, like my dad, when I was a child was like my little hero, always would look up to him. 
Uh, but yeah, my mom, my mom took care of me. She was always there. That's like been one constant, uh, for a long time. It's always her. She's always been there. That's what do cool. they do? As a profession. So my mom, my mom's retired now. My dad still does kind of drywall. He's in the drywall business, been in the drywall business for a long time. And then my mom does, um, she did like clerical work. I think she did like payroll or something. So she'd always drive downtown, you know, worked on like the high rises and stuff like that. And then come back after work. Uh, so she did that for the most time. She took some accounting courses on, uh, not online, but like through like the community college, I guess, or whatever it was. I, I don't remember what it was. Yeah. But yeah, she kind of like a business, businessy type. Well, where did your interest in the, in the military come then? Uh, I, I guess, you know, my, when I was my dad's weekend, his, his way of parenting was like, Hey, check out this new Sylvester Stallone movie or like <laughs> check out Arnold Schwarzenegger, or, check out this new guy Van Damme. Right. And I would watch them all. And I was just like glued to the, to the thing, I, I, like to the, to the TV, just like glued to it. And I would watch them over and over and over again, like looking at their gear, like, what is that? What is this? And I would just like try to, and we didn't have internet. So you try to like magazines or try to figure things out or go to the library, like military, like what's, what, what's anything. And, uh, I just fell in love with it. Like just something got stirred up inside me and it like became a passion. So, I mean, gosh, as long as I can remember, I mean, grade school, I was like, dude, I want to be in the military. Like oh, I want to be in the so military. It started real early. It started real early. And then I remember a specific day, my mom took me to a night game, a Cincinnati Reds game. And, uh, you know, they just got done with the Star Spangled Banner, and and it was during uh, Desert Storm. So I don't even remember. They had the yellow ribbons. They had like a sticker with an eagle head, support our sh- troops, yep. and like I mean, very patriotic stuff from what I from what I can remember. Nothing what I kind of feel like. Definitely not in the Vietnam era, which I was not around. But you can hear the stories, or kind of what's going on now. But uh, very supportive. It seemed like at my you know to my young eyes. And then at the end of the Star Spangled Banner, which I definitely stood for, uh, you know, took my hand down. And afterwards, they had like fighter jets fly over in just that noise. I was like, dude, it rocked my world. I was like, I, I talked to my mom because I'm like, you know, I'm looking up at her. I'm like, that's what I want to do. And I didn't want to be a pilot. I just knew that I wanted to be in the military. Seeing that flag flow, I just felt like the a great sense of pride in this country. And, and and I didn't know what the heck I was even asking for, what I was thinking about. But for some reason, that planted a seed that just morphed inside me. It was awesome. And that's that I remember that night. It was a night game, Cincinnati Reds game. I'll never forget it. Damn. And that was it. That, that's all she wrote. Well, so when did you start really getting serious and looking into it? So I did this, I did the swim team after, you know, for a while. And I, and I, thought about it. And then, you know, swimmers are going, you know, I was a freshman, you know, the seniors are looking at colleges, they're going to colleges, I'd go with them to check out the university, do a workout at their pool or whatever, you know, they would allow that to happen. And I was like, well, maybe, maybe I'll swim in college, try to get a scholarship. Cause I was starting to get a little bit better. I mean, I, was, I mean, most of these kid guys started like when they're 10. So they were like freaks in the water. And I was, I mean, started in ninth grade, I could barely swim a length of the pool. And then Towards my junior year, I started getting really good. And then I, I did not swim my uh, senior year because my coach died, who was a huge influence on me. Uh, but, I mean, there was, like, little segments of life where I'm like, oh, I want to be a lawyer because I watched The Firm with Tom Cruise. I'm like, I think that's a good job. I want to do that. Or I want to be a doctor because I saw whatever. It's just a fluid. You know, yeah. I mean, we influence people or we get influenced by people. And um, everything came back to the military. But I got, when I was a junior year, a, a really good friend of mine was a senior and he enlisted in the Marine Corps. So he went down to, to Paris Island in South Carolina. And when his graduation came around, he had a brother and they reached out like, hey, Eddie, would you like to go down there for the graduation? So I asked my mother, of course, and uh, she, she, yeah, she said, that'd be great for you. So I, I went down there and I like fell in love. I was like, just seeing the obstacle course and they're like doing the pugil sticks and they're boxing and marching and the guns. And it was cool, like the unison of them marching, I mean, I've kind of learned in the military what what looks cool is not the coolest. Like diving at night under a ship, <laughs> that's scary, bro. Like that, that ain't like you know what I mean. You didn't get any enjoyment out of that. I when I was done, I'm like, that's cool. But during it, I'm like, shark, what shark? <laughs> <laughs> Am I gonna get sucked up into the suction of the ship? You yeah. know, I mean, you know, it's the the reality kind of hits you. Uh, but I just fell in love, and I'm like, all right, like, and I wanted to be a SEAL thing because I saw, you know, the Charlie Sheen movie and Michael Bean with, you know, Navy SEALs, and um, I, I did the Marine Corps thing, I did, and just 
I was like, I'm gonna, all right, I'm gonna go be a Marine. What, what year was this? I enlisted and I went August 23rd of 1996. Okay. I, I left to go in the Marine Corps. Right out of high school? Right out of high, I was 17. My 17. 18th birthday was in boot camp, sitting in my rack, hoping no one would find out that it was my birthday. I, I, <laughs> you know, you just don't draw attention to yourself, right? Be the yeah. gray man. Uh, but yeah, it was, it was cool. It was, it was a good experience. I didn't fall in love with the Marine Corps. That's all about rank. It's not so much about how you perform. It's about rank. I care more about your hair than how you operate or do your job. I you picked that up at that young of an age? Yeah, I started. Yeah, I, mean, I didn't know better, but towards like year two, two and a half, three years, I'm like, this is ridiculous. Like, like let's concentrate on like working. Yeah. That seems like a more important thing, uh, like having an operational fighting force than, hey, you look good. Like, are those creases? Like, okay, cool, because the enemy is going to give a crap about that. Like, it's like, who cares? I get the point of being presentable and the discipline. I understand that. But it seemed to override people doing their job and influencing other people and being, yeah. like, and being a leader. And uh, so I didn't like that. What did you join the Marine Corps to do? 0311, so basic infantrymen. And, and that's what I wanted to do. So I did my ass, this funny... It's kind of funny and sad at the same time. Is I did my ASVAB and you know they get the scores back and they're like, so Eddie, what do you want to do? I was like, I want to be an O three eleven, and they're like, good, because that's all you're gonna be able to do. Because <laughs> my ASVAB, I guess, was not the greatest. So, and I was like, cool, I don't, I don't care. Like, just I wanted like what I thought you know the Marines do: storm the beaches, you know, get off of Zodiacs, go do the thing, right? Be on the front lines and. Uh, yeah, that's that's all I cared to do. I just wanted to be in the fight, not knowing what that meant or what exactly came with that that package deal. Yeah. So. So, when did you leave? Did you do one enlistment and then? I did four years. Yeah, about my three year mark. So the reason for me leaving, um, about two and a half, three years in, I was like, I learned about Marine Scout snipers, which everyone I saw that was a Marine Scout that they were just squared away. And Scout Sniper School was right there on Quantico where I was stationed. So I would see them like running with their ghillie suits on with packs. They, they had other, you know, their long guns. I was like, dude, I want to go do that. But you had to be a rifle expert. So you got, you know, you got your three quals. You got basic rifle, uh, base, basic marksman. Then you got your sharpshooter. Then you got your rifle expert. Just like we do in, in the Navy. Same thing in the Marines. But you had to be a rifle expert, the best one, to even go to sniper school. And I was a basic marksman. So I asked my team leader, I was like, hey, can I, can I go to the range to try to, you know, up my qual? And I went and I got sharpshooter. I missed expert by one point, by one shot. And so I was like, hey, can I go again? So they sent me back like three months later. I missed it again by one shot. So I was like, just give me one more chance. And they're like, hey, we do this. You get it. You got to re-enlist or extend to go to school. And I was like, I'll do that. No problem. So I didn't extend, thank God, but they, a spot opened up and I got to go. I, within six months, I think I was back at it. And um, I missed it again by oh, one freaking point. Three times, man. Wow. And I was done. I was deflated. I, w I was done. I was like, this sucks. I'm like, man, I, and I kind of chalked it up like this military thing. Maybe it wasn't for me after all. Maybe I'm not as... It's not what I've always wanted to be. So I was like, I'll go back to Cincinnati and be a cop. Like, you know, I just wanted to... I don't like evil. I just wanted to somehow fight evil the best way, the in some way, you know, shape or form. And uh, I'd say probably around that time, I don't know how much time was left in the Marines, maybe eight, nine months or something like that. I was like, and I don't know what sparked it. Oh, I know what sparked it. We did a trip to West Virginia because when I was in Quantico, everything that we did was training the officers. So you, Officers go to OCS, Officer Candidate School. And then the Marine Corps, you go to a thing on the other side of the base. It's called TBS, the basic school. So every Marine officer does this six-month school. It's it's all field craft, like learning to set up patrol bases, uh, patrolling, shooting, how to do mount, military operations and urban terrain, a little bit of CQB, uh, all the like explosives, grenades, more shooting, heavy weapons, stuff like that. So Every officer does that, which other services don't. So I like applaud the Marines for that. That's, that's super cool. So we were like 
the op four, like the bad guys for, for all this training stuff. So I was in the woods or in the field with these guys. Like my first year, I counted the days, it was 315 days. And it wasn't like overnight, but like some would be like nine to five, like for a week. But some of them were like, all right, you're out there for three weeks straight. And you're like, you're stinking. And just yeah. like, it's just, it's just bad. But I learned so much. And, um, and then, but everything was for them. Everything was for the officers and I get it. But, uh, you know, at the same time, it's like, dude, I have zero experience and you want me to try to feed these guys. So we just kind of played war games. But uh, we did a trip. We were going to teach some officers mountaineering. And I and most of us knew nothing. This is our first duty stations. They actually, at School of Infantry, took all the names that started with a P. There was nine of us. Like, you're going to Quantico. Like, that's, you know, it's not like based yeah. off of anything. It was like, okay, alphabet. Somehow the P's got chosen, which sucked. And um, so we go there uh, to this to West Virginia to learn mountaineering. So we spent three days out there learning to rappel, make rope bridges, you know, tying all the knots, the figure eights, how to like do river crossings, all that stuff. And I like ate it up. I was like, oh my god, there's like, like because it was it was like making me better. Um, so there was like it was training for us, and I was like, dude, this is awesome. So I fell in love. I was like, okay, where do I get more of this? And obviously the answers would have been like sniper school. Well, kind of failed that one. Marine Force Recon learned that their budget for gear and ops wasn't the greatest at the time. They weren't even attached to SOCOM, I believe. So I was like, all right, let's go you back. You looked into all that at that young of yeah, age? Yeah, yeah. Wow, that's impressive. So I, I looked, I asked questions, I guess you could say, because there was a a guy that came from battalion recon. So you got battalion at the time. I, I don't know how it's set up now, but you had battalion recon and then you had force where force is my, like, you're kind of like more of your, the way it was explained to me, more you're like your hostage rescue, kind of like your tier one-ish type where battalion was more just dudes that are more squared away, have better training, kind of infantry type, like rangers. And for people that are watching that, that if I butcher it, I apologize. Uh, but that's what I was led to believe uh, by being told by guys that were there. And uh, I was like, all right, I'm going to go with my dream way back when. Like, I'm going to do the SEAL thing. So not even making sniper school and then wanting to go to the hardest school that I believe the military has to offer, the feedback from family and friends was not of the most encouraging way. It's like, dude, like people don't make it. People don't do anything, but it didn't matter. Like my mind was like on it. Like it was on it. Like I, I know I can do it. I just felt it. Like I, I know I can do this. And so I crossed over. And went to Bud's. You, so there was no break in service? You just went right I had right one over. day break. I couldn't, I tried to like sell back my leave. Like you can just have my leave, just get me there as soon as possible. I was like, I don't need the 90, because I had like 90 days or whatever saved up. Uh, and they're like, no, you have to finish it out completely. Be out for one day to so we can drug test you and all that stuff. I was like, yeah, I'm going to get high on this one day off before I go Before I go in. So you had to do the whole out processing piece for the Marines. And then you got to do the whole in processing piece for the Navy, which is a freaking nightmare, as you know. Uh, so did that and then had to go up to transitioning processing unit, which is up in Great Lakes for other services, veterans coming in. You go up there. They can, it's really like a it's a it's a mess. Let's just put it that way. And so we you know, get all your paperwork and then had to do a, a school, like get a job in the Navy because there was no seal uh, SO, like there was no yeah. job that started. I think when we were in like a couple years in and, um, so I went to gunner's mate school right up there in great lakes. Cause it was something they, they told me it was close to infantry, which it's not, not even close. I learned about circuits and positive and negative and resistors, which I still know nothing about. I know there's red and black and positives and negatives. That's about, that's, that's where we stop. <laughs> but you had to have a school. So if you don't make it through, they mm -hmm. have a place to put you, right? Because I didn't want to go open contract and end up on a ship painting it or something like that. So I did the school and went out to Bud's. And uh, it was awesome, man. It was everything and more. You liked Bud's? I liked it. It sucked at times, of course, but just the learning about my body, what I can and can't do, and then the mindset piece of it all, I was like, oh my gosh, like we as humans have so much more potential than our goals. Yeah. Like we might have like, I want to accomplish this. The truth is you, you set your, you know, the standard here, bro, you should be shooting up here. Yeah. We see it all the time. I see it all the time. I'm sure... 
I'm sure you realize the same thing. It's like, wait, I can do way more than this. Yeah. Way more. You know, when you're like, it's something as simple as like, I can't do any more push-ups. I can't do any more. And then they're like, hey, you're you're out of here if you don't knock out five more and you knock out seven. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like, <laughs> I mean, we can. You know, our, our brain, you know, our brain is our, our worst enemy and it's our best asset. Plain and simple. What was your what was your favorite part of Buds? <sighs> Gosh. I really I really enjoyed like the camaraderie of being with the boys. I really liked it. I I liked the surf torture. You liked the surf torture. I I mean it sucked. I just I like fed off of it. Like I get like if I do sparring or something like that or whatever and I get my bell rung, it like amps me up. I'm like, "Oh yeah, okay." Like the, I'm I'm stimulated by a little bit of pain. Okay. And that would bring on a little pain and just motivate me more. Like, you can't break me. I just had that, you can't break me. You can't break me. I'm getting stronger and stronger and stronger. And that's what I thought to myself all the time. And then seeing people quit motivated me. Really? Yeah. Like, all right, it's not made for you. It's made for me, though. And nice. I would just, I would give myself that self talk. Uh, and a lot of that got me through. And the, and the guy to my left and my right, you know? I tried to hang out with the good people, the, the one with the good personality, the ones that tried to make you laugh. Yeah. Not the one like, this sucks. When is this going to end? Like, I did, I'd, I'd like, get away from the toxicity. So, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe 9 11 happened when you were in Buds. Second phase, yeah. What yeah. was that like? Uh, surreal. It was, it was weird. I remember just getting my tray. Uh, I was at the cafeteria, galley, chow hall, whatever you want to call it, getting my food. And I was, and I was walking out of the line to the table area and, you know, on the backside, they got all these, all the TVs and like, everyone's like paused. It's like someone hit pause on the remote and you know, the, the frame stands still. I'm like, what the heck's going on? Like, I'm not paying attention. I'm looking, looking at my food. Like I can't wait to devour this. Right. I put my tray down and the guys that I'm sitting down with, they're like, just stare. They're just glued to the TV. I'm like, Hey, what's going on? And they just like point up and I'm like. And all I see is one of the, I think one of the, one of the towers, I don't know if it was one or two, one of the towers was, was, was going up in smoke. And then the second one came in and I don't remember exactly what I saw, but I could, I mean, I could tell it was an attack. And right at that moment, it was like, okay, did we just get attacked? And then, you know, the thoughts go, well, they push us through training. Like, yeah. are we going to go to the fight? It just, you just kind of knew instinctively, like, hey, like it's about, it's about to get real. Not that it wasn't real before. And and to say it didn't change the mindset a little bit would be uh, doing disservice of that whole event. But yeah, it kind of, I mean, you know. Yeah. It, it's different. It's different when there's actively something going on versus something something could be going on, which was which is what the case was, you know, first phase and a little bit of second phase, which is like, you know, we'll, we'll answer the call when it comes. But now it's like, okay, the threat is imminent. It's real. Here it is. Let's go. Yeah. So it kind of tweaked tweaked your brain a little bit. Did you guys have any? Did you have anybody quit after? I mean, nobody quits after Hell Week. Uh, I don't think we had anyone quit. I mean, we had you know the basic injuries. We had to roll somebody, but I don't think anyone quit to my to my knowledge. That, there was guys that got kicked out. Yeah, you know uh, that that wasn't fit in the mold, I guess. But I don't think anyone quit. Okay. So, but I don't, I'm not hundred percent on that. Yeah. You, you know how it is. Do you're like looking through your, the toilet paper roll. Yeah. Not seeing, you know, the big picture of everything. You're like, God, just let's like, just get me through this hour. Just get me through this minute. Just get me through the next five seconds. Did the instructor staff change at all um, after 9-11? My memory's a little foggy, but I mean, they would have to. I yeah. know one of our instructors had a, a his, his fiance or wife was a uh, flight attendant on a flight from somewhere to New York that morning. It wasn't her flight, but I, I could see them doing stuff and we were kind of we were kind of brought into the classroom and kind of debriefed what was known, which wasn't a lot, about what was going on. Uh but you know, you could see it in their eyes. You you could see it in their eyes. Yeah. Yeah. You could you can see it. So did you, you finish buds, you go did you go to team two right away? Team two right away. Yep. You went to team two. I wound up at team two later. Yeah, because you went to eight first, I, I went to eight and first, then we crossed and I over. went to two. Yep. And when I got to two, you guys' platoon, or your task unit, I guess I should say, was like the golden task unit. I don't know what you guys did. It was, we had the influence from our tier one guys. Well, we're going to find out what you guys <laughs> doing. 
<laughs> what, what were you guys doing over there? Uh, I mean, you know, we had our, the way it started, you know, the first couple of weeks, because we jumped in right when workup was starting, I believe, okay. for the first deployment. Uh, and, you know, Iraq was, I think, or sorry, Afghanistan was going, or when did Iraq start kicking off? Iraq started kicking off right in 2003. Okay, so I would have been, it was like during that time, both of them were kicking off. So it was like, okay, where are we going? And we, you know, we didn't know, but we're assuming we're going to go get in the fight. But our our leadership that came from the other side of the street, our tier one guys, they um, they changed the whole way we did business and they made it more like them. So instead of like, hey, we got two platoons and you guys were all doing the same stuff, they kind of made it like, hey, we got our mobility guys, we got our sniper element, and then we got our assaulters. And uh, they changed it all. And so I was with the assaulting side and just kind of fell in love with the breaching. In that deployment, I just wanted to go to breaching school, but it was rare for new guys to go. Thus, there was a spot. Yeah. Uh, so I didn't go, but I was like the secondary breacher. I would like just, I was mentored by a lot of a lot of solid dudes um, and uh, just like hung on to every word and just tried to like soak up as much as possible. And I just fell in love with the breaching world. Well, what did you think of the SEAL teams when you first showed up? Was it everything you thought it was going to be? Uh, I thought it would be, it had a conventional taste to it. And I only say that after being at the tier one unit, I only mm-hmm. say that I wouldn't have probably known better, but it was like, oh, we can't let you out until like four. I was like, are we, are we babies? Like if we had nothing to do, send guys home. Yeah. Especially when you're always on training trips, you have deployments. Like we have a thing called families. And I think that's a a problem we have is we want to know why divorce rate is 90%. A lot of it's based off of stupidity because we think that this is the way it's supposed to be. Dude, we, we, we preach this unconventional mindset, this, that we are unconventional. We, we're, you know, we do the guerrilla warfare, right? But yet when it comes to, you know, sticking to the four 30 or four o'clock rule, like, come on, man, like let's, let's, we're done. We're not, we're not regular military here. Yeah. You're expecting guys to fight and get shot at. Where did you wind up deploying to on that first one? The first one, we were kind of like dragged around. First, we were told we're going to Germany. Then we're going to Guam. Then we're going to South America. And we were like, what the heck? And then we were going to Iraq. And then I pulled out. Then we went to Iraq. So we we went to Mosul up north. And we were just like, you guys are going to be doing DAs. We're like, really? Like, yes. <laughs> Like, yes. So we went up there uh, and our first two months was up there and it was, it was cool. It was really cool. Like it was, it was eye opening. It's like just busting, breaching the doors down, going in and kind of like SWAT style. But the whole time we did there, I don't, I don't believe one shot was fired. I mean, cause you're not obviously getting the, the high value targets, the HVTs, you're getting kind of the lower ranking or whatever the Intel says that we should be going uh, but it was cool. It was like in the in the progression and the progression of my career and like in the experience. It's probably it was awesome. Like it wasn't like boom, boom, boom right away. Mm-hmm. It was gradual. That would come later. Uh, but it was good until and then you know two months in, we get the PSD piece, the the, the security d- detail down in Baghdad uh, when the interim government came in. So we packed up all our stuff, which we weren't proud of. Yeah. And to be honest, we like didn't even train for PSD. Yeah. Really. So we were kind of like, all right, this is what it looks like. I mean, we did a little bit, uh, but not not like, hey, this is going to be your mission overseas here. We're going to do a workup for it. We didn't do that. Uh, it was kind of like on the job training. But, you know, we pick you pick it up, right? Yeah. You know, like bad guys, the way they think. All right, let's defend. But instead of, you know, up in Missoula, when you're, you know, when you're taking it to the enemy, when you're on the offensive now you're on the defensive. You're waiting to get hit by the vehicle-borne IED on the side of the road. Your guy that you're watching or constantly around is a target. Uh, I mean, it, when we had a Lowy, uh years before, he was up in uh, England, and Saddam sent his guys up there, and, and he got the, sent assassins to kill him. And, it, and he had scars all over his face from hatchets that they took to him when he was sleeping. Holy and he survived shit. it. Like it took him a year to come back, but like just seeing those scars on his face, like much respect, you know. And, and a lot of people say he was DC's pup, uh, puppet, and he might have been, you know. Now that we're learning, right, um, about this government, uh, 
I don't, but I don't know. But you know, the guy was anti Saddam. I mean, especially when someone tries to kill you, you're probably not going to be friends with you after. Yeah. So, but it was it was an experience that led to my company later. So, I can't. Uh, it was it was good to do. Yeah. Not fun at the time, but it was good to do. Pretty discouraging, probably. It was very, especially. I mean, that's every team guy's dream, I think. Yeah. Kicking down doors, right? Yeah. Taking it to the bad guy. And then you got to go watch somebody. Yeah. I don't want to babysit you. Nothing against you. I just don't want to babysit you. Yeah. I, I'm trained to do more. Yeah. Not when there's a war going on. Exactly. But so you come home, do another workup. Yep. And during that time, my second child was born, probably three months for the second deployment. So. When I was in the Marines, found out that my first daughter, Kayla, was born. She was uh, when I was in the Marines. So when we went out to Bud's, I, she was two or three. So I had one, one daughter. And then before the second one, my second daughter came, Samantha. So I think I left on that second deployment. She was three months old. Was that hard for you at the time? <sighs> as sad as this is to say, I don't know. I didn't want to leave. But at the same time, I wanted to leave. Yeah. I wanted to be over there. Like, I was just itching to get over there. I just wanted to fight. Like, we don't, you just don't go through all this training and volunteer to be put through hell, right? Yeah. Pretty much. And then just not and to, to be back at home. Uh, yeah, it was, it was sad to leave. And I missed him, of course. But I was like, that's where I'm supposed to be is overseas. That's, that's where this is and that's where this is. So, yeah. And then when I came back, it was, you know, she was nine months old and just like, boop. It's ridiculous. Wow. So. Was that, so the second deployment, is that the one we did together? That's the one we did together. So I think there was three or four guys from our task unit. We had to get more guys on yours. Mm -hmm. So I volunteered because I've never been to Afghanistan. So I was like, yeah, please send me. And I, because I did not want to go do P PSD again. Yeah. And uh, I almost said PTSD again because it's about the same thing. <laughs> So uh, I volunteered. I was like, I don't care what I do. Just like, get me over there. Like, cause I heard the fighting was more intense. There was, you know, it was a, a more formidable opponent. Uh, but I, yeah, I just wanted to be over there. So I volunteered right away to go with you guys. And uh, I'm glad I did. Yeah, it was a pretty boring fucking deployment if you ask me, but. Yeah, but it was cool to see the landscape, kind of get to know the people. And that was like my first, like, troop in contact encounter. It was nothing big, but got to shoot the 240 at some trees where we were getting shot at. Yeah. And I was like, okay. And then it's just like what I was saying earlier, like with uh, doing the DAs in, in Iraq, it was just a small progression. Like, okay, you got your first like troop in contact. Nothing crazy, but it was just like adding another layer of experience. Yeah. So, um, I mean, that's just the way I, I look at it because there's no other way to look at it. Yeah. <laughs> Would after that, so that deployment got cut short. We went down to Kandahar, did a little bit of stuff with the Kansoff, which didn't yep. really amount to much. Right. And then, then, I'm not really sure what happened at the top level, but I'm fairly certain that we got kicked out of country. I believe you're right. Because we shut the whole camp down. Yeah. Was it Camp Olet or something? Is that yes. what it was called? Yeah, we shut it, it all down. And then we went back to, back to Baghdad. Yeah, so... <laughs> What'd you guys do when you, so we split ways there. I went to another platoon in Baghdad. You went to, I believe your original platoon. Yeah. So I went back with them and they were doing what they called a mentorship for P, PSD. I almost did it again. Uh, PSD in like training their like Af, uh, Iraqis on how to do it or other entities that were taking over. And it was a lot of sitting down and then we, we are like, we got to do something. I mean, the worst thing you can do is get a bunch of team guys sitting around doing nothing. Mm -hmm. It Just good things don't happen. We're like a bunch of children, which that's fine. Like, we want to go operate. That's that's what we're created to do, and that's like that's what we feel, right? And um, finally, we started getting some of the sniper apps. Like, I know Sadr City was going crazy. Some guys got lucky to, you know, drop some bombs and... I think our snipers and radio men and medics got a lot of those, which I was none of, uh, but got to do a couple sniper ops. Again, no shots fired uh, on where I was. I know a couple guys got some. Yeah. Um, was that who you were with? That, that yeah, side? there was okay. our, we were the lucky ones that kept getting. I, okay. I the thought kills. so. Yeah. 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 I thought so. 
But yeah, nothing. But it was just cool to like another mission, I guess you could say, to get experience on doing. Mm-hmm. But it was nothing. And then I realized, like, I don't ever want to be a sniper. This is so boring. <laughs> <laughs> like, I want to kick down doors, man. Yeah. But uh, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was great experience. It really was. So from there, that was, your, was that your last deployment? At Team 2. Okay. Yeah, so uh, I, I, I screened or sent in my package to go over across the street to our Tier 1 unit, and um, they pushed it back. I was supposed to get back and go right into like a month later, a couple of weeks later. And I got pushed six months and start doing, uh, go to the tra- our training detachment. And then I told one of the guys that was an operator over there and he did something. Cause he's like, Hey dude, you're, you're going to, you're doing the, the, to green team, like right away when you get back. And all I was doing at the point was jacking steel. Like me and Jason Workman, that's all we were doing when I got to, uh, Baghdad was just jacking steel as much as we could. So I put on like probably 10 pounds like so i'm taking all the supplements have my wife at the time send over anything and everything just like to try to bulk me out because i'm like if i'm not gonna do anything at least i can do is like just get bigger and get stronger um but definitely not faster so i was like crap i was like started stressing <laughs> about the run i was like okay i'm gonna start running so i kind of tapered off on the weights a little bit and uh so like probably two or three weeks later once we got back home or total time i had to be doing that uh screening test to get in and I passed the run. Like I had no problem with anything else, but the run I made by like 12 or 13 seconds. Oh, but it didn't matter as, as long as you pass, they give yeah. you a time. As long as you pass, it doesn't matter how close you are. Yeah. So, but yeah. So you went right to green team right after that deployment. Yes. No downtime. No down. I'm maybe a couple weeks. How's your wife and family? I mean, what do they think of that? Uh, I was very self-absorbed. I really, I mean, I, I'm sure I asked, but it, my mind was made up like, hey, here's what I'm going to do. Mm-hmm. And I would justify as like, hey, we get more money if I go over there versus over here. Deployments are shorter. Like I would get pretty much turn into a salesman where I wouldn't, you know, I was like, is that cool with you? But I really wasn't asking. Yeah. I was like, is that cool with you? But inside I'm like, I'm doing this no matter what you say. Um, and that was kind of it. But, but she was supportive. From what I can remember, she was supportive. But I mean, the cracks in my family life. Had they already had they they already started before you went over? I would say I'd say they started around after my first deployment. Okay. The cracks, you know, they weren't they weren't little baby fractures anymore. They were splitting. And uh, it was starting to get worse because I was partying hard. Yeah. I was drinking. A lot, mostly on trips when I come home because the kids, I really wouldn't drink too much unless we had like a, a backyard barbecue or something. Uh, but I noticed she was doing it more. So I guess she, she was kind of coping with her own, you know, okay. dealing with it. And I really didn't take her into consideration at all. Like I was like, hey, dude, like suck it up. And that's just not the way to do it. And uh, so that that didn't help. I did not help. I, I mean, I take ownership that I, I really failed i think i was definitely majority if not sole owner of breaking that marriage apart for sure like i just i was so self-absorbed all i cared about was the teams i cared more about the boys than her yeah do you think that looking back now do you think drinking was definitely part of the culture yes at that time oh of course yeah i mean yeah it's better than cocaine (laughs) yeah Or heroin, you know yeah. what I mean? So, I mean, and of course, in our society, it's socially acceptable. What's not socially acceptable is when you're, you know, just doing it to try to go to sleep. And and my in my brain, and I <laughs> wasn't like, because I didn't really see too much in those, those first two deployments. I really didn't see like a bunch of dead bodies. You know, your buddy's getting destroyed. I, I didn't see that in the first one. I mean, I think the, the biggest thing that I saw was that probably that second deployment. It was the first deployment. There's a huge roadside bomb. And I remember going out to the the prime minister, wanted to go out there and look. And I remember just seeing like shoes lining the streets because and the people blown out of their shoes from the from the overpressure. Yeah. But their shoes remained. And it was and it was it was a crazy sight. And I was like, oh man. And like it's one of those images that you like you don't forget. Yeah. But uh, I really didn't see 
or really experience the stuff that you're like, man, that was a close one, or like, whoa, like, well, like, okay, that's all right, we're good. Yeah, not those first two deployments. Well, before we get into the next step in your career, let's take a quick break. Let's do it. Cool. Serious question. Who wants to take the best shit of their entire life? Right here, I do. How do you do that? You go with Bub's Naturals Collagen Protein. You rip the thing open, you put it in your coffee, you stir it up, and you're on your way. Now, if taking the best shit of your entire life doesn't interest you, Collagen will also give you beautiful hair, great skin, and nails to die for. So, and you'll recover a lot quicker in between workouts if that's your thing. So now that we got the good shit out of the way, get it? <laughs> Let me tell you a little bit about Bubs the company. Bubs is a tribute company to Glenn Bubs Doherty, who is a Navy SEAL and a CIA contractor who died defending American freedom in Benghazi, Libya. Bubs donates 10% of all proceeds to veteran organizations like the Glenn Doherty Foundation and 100% of all proceeds on Veterans Day. Let me tell you about Bubs' latest product that helps with energy, healthy digestion, your immune system, and your metabolism. Bubs Naturals Apple Cider Vinegar Gummies which actually tastes so damn good that I ate all 60 of them the first, <laughs> the first night I got them. They taste amazing, and man, I got a lot of energy now. Anyways, go to bubsnaturals.com, use promo code SEAN to take 20% off your order. Thank you, Bubs Naturals, for being a sponsor of The Sean Ryan Show. Do you get numb to that? I mean, do you, do you even care anymore that, I mean, these are all key players? Or? I think I got a little more numb as the years went by. Uh, I think there's an evolution in empathy that occurs in combat that people don't talk about very often. Christians in the Middle East have been persecuted for years. Saddam was one of those people that was a part of that process. In my last deployment, I went to uh, to hook right around there there was this compound with these hooks that came out of the walls yesterday december the 13th at around 8 30 p.m baghdad time united states military forces captured saddam hussein alive uh, they shifted over and hit the next farm uh, and then yeah, shortly after that, they uncovered the rug with the rope to the cork plug in the hole, uh, pulled the cork out and saw this, looking down on a guy, pulled him out of the hole and it was Saddam. Just hearing that and being in that place was, made me realize how evil that son of a bitch actually was. Christmas Day, 2003. We had caught Saddam on December 13th. This is two weeks later and it was Christmas morning and we're like, what the heck is that? And we're like listening and we walk and we look over and we look over the balcony and down on the lower level is these guys that work for us that are singing Christmas carols. For the wow. first time probably ever. Damn. In English because they were so happy that they were in a place where they weren't going to be prosecuted for their religious beliefs. All right, Eddie, we're back from the break. You wrapped up your Fairly short career at SEAL Team 2. You're moving on to development group. Let's talk about what that transition looked like. I was excited. It, you know, it was it was like, you know, you hear the stories, like they're doing these operations and, you know, they get in these firefights. And, again, I still didn't know what I was asking for. 
Um, but I just wanted to be there. I was so excited. I, w- I was like, it was like Christmas. Daily being over there was like Christmas. Uh, I mean, just some great operators. They treat you uh, like a seasoned operator. I mean, you're still learning from everyone. These these guys got so much experience, and I just ate it up. Uh, great influences, man. I mean, just the the mentors that they were, and and you know they took you under your wing, and you know just show you the way they kind of operate, and it was just it was awesome. It was, it was super awesome. Like I loved it. What was Green Team like showing up there? Uh, it was good. I mean, you're you're around all the guys that are you know are putting out to get to that that you know the uh, next rung on the ladder and. Uh, it was, I think, Green Team was harder than Buds. Really? It seemed like there was more stress. You had more to prove. Your your ego was kind of more on the line. Okay. Like, you know, you, you could go back to the, the to the teams, back to Team 2 as a, um, I mean, you would call yourself a failure. Like, yeah. I failed or whatever it is. Not to say that, like, and the guys that didn't make it through, they're, they're, they're great individuals, great operators, but just it wasn't, I guess, what they're looking for. And um, it was tough, man. It was extremely tough. But, you know, the main thing they concentrated on was CQB. And that happened to be my strong suit. It just like it was. Like I can just walk in a room and I can process really fast. Uh, I can't process in the relationship world. <laughs> but <laughs> or with my children. But for some reason, you know, on CQB, that just, I just got it. Like I just understood threat, bad guy, done. Not, you know, hostage. Don't do anything wrong. Like I just, I just, I just got it. Like I compromise the angles and doorways and windows. I just got it, and uh, and and I say that humbly. I just I, and there's so many other things that I really took me a long time to get. Like I just didn't, I wasn't that great at it. Uh, I, I guess probably more of the passion piece. Uh, but there's nothing cooler than going through a hallway, running and gunning, and like peeling off, coming back out of the hallway, going to the next room. Like what do we got? It's like a surprise behind every door. You just yeah. don't know what you get. Uh, but it was. I strived in that. I did really good. Um, and I'd say probably, you know, the two things that I found in, in Green Team that they you, they get rid of you for was, uh, well, minus your, if you have an attitude or you just like don't fit the mold, was CQB in the beginning of it all. If you do a crazy safety violation throughout and then jumping. If, you know, you're not landed on the X, you're not deploying correctly because, I mean, when you're asked to be at altitude at nighttime stacking, to fly into wherever you gotta, you gotta be. I mean, dudes die. And uh, I remember one. I talk about that. And talk about this in the book. Is like it was like our final jump, like our final test jump. And I came down with strep, and I had like a 102, 103. I mean, I was hallucinating. I was, I was out. And they came in like one of the instructors. Like, hey, you gotta jump. And I was like, hey, can I just do it tomorrow? Like, just let me pump in some meds. And he's like, no. He's like, you have to do it now. And I was like. All right. So I went to, got the medic and I was like, Hey dude, I don't know what you have to do. Pump me up with, do something and get me on that freaking bird. And I, dude, I, I thought I was good. like, I would, I mean, if you have a strep before yeah. and you have a tip, like it sucks. And you want me to jump out of a plane, which I didn't like to begin with. Uh, and I was like, screw it, dude. And I, I really didn't care if I burned in. <laughs> and I got up there and I even think that there was only a couple guys that needed to pass. Like they let me alone because they knew I was sick. And I, okay, just you go, this is your shot. And uh, I just kind of like fell out of the plane, you know, stabilized myself, pulled, and then I, I landed where I was supposed to. I was good to go. Took off my chute, dropped it right there in the DZ, and then went right up to my rack and went back to bed. I was, I was done, man. But uh, that was probably the hardest piece, uh, minus the runs. It's always the runs, dude. That is like, yeah, like take the knife out of my freaking back, dude. This sucks. Uh, I hate the runs. But th- those are probably the two hardest things that I thought. But th- it was again the camaraderie. It was all. It was kind of like buds on steroids. Like, hey, everything's operational. Like we're doing, a, a, you know, an FMP, a full mission profile. Uh, and it was. It was cool. Like it was. It was exactly where I wanted to be. It, it was exactly what I wanted. It was awesome. And then the final stage of that and i actually heard this on uh shipley's it was uh with seer school the final thing yeah and the final thing or the uh, exercise is they drop you off wherever and you have to make your way back to the command uh out there where you, to the schoolhouse and you have no money you have no ids and you have to figure it out how far are you 
I, they, I think they said like 20 miles or something. 20 miles. So you kind of like got to smooth yourself and all that stuff. But what we did was took a razor blade and we cut in the soles of our shoes and we put like our ID and wrapped some hundreds around it, stuffed it in there because they check you. And uh, as soon as they dropped us off, found a cab, went to a bar, <laughs> got ripped. <laughs> and uh, I was with Marcus Capone. <laughs> and we get back, we get to the schoolhouse. Like one guy is coming in with a case of beer. This is like an Air Force freaking school, the final stage of Green Team. Not pay, we're just so excited. Like we just did it. Like it's over. You know, it's it's all good. And uh we come in hammered. I mean, I was hammered. And we almost got kicked out. Had to go see the master chief when we got back uh to the, to our command back in uh back in Virginia. And I was like, Are you kidding me? The last day I'm about to get kicked out. Like I am a moron. Like I am an idiot. And uh they kept us. And I was I was I was scared. I was like, man, like what I what what I do. Yeah. I was like, that this is stupid. What like come on, man, grow up. What did they say to you? Just kind of like again, don't remember exactly the words, but like, hey, we can't do that. We represent this command. Uh just can't be doing that stuff. You gotta do the course to get the experience, all that stuff. And I was like, I understood. And I I mean I was humbled. And I was like, I'm sorry. Uh whatever. I I can't remember what I had to do. I'm sure I had to do something. Uh but there was a punishment. And I, I can't recall what it is, but it didn't matter. They didn't kick me out, and I got to graduate and go uh, with my, you know, with my squadron. So that was literally the last last day, last event. All we had to do was fly home. Holy shit! Damn, dude. <sighs> Dumb. That would have changed a lot of things. A lot of things, but for some reason, man. For some reason. Yeah. You know. You had mentioned that. <clears throat> A lot of solid seasoned operators didn't make it through for whatever reason. That's not what they were looking for. Do you? Can you describe maybe what the SEAL Team Six Command is looking for in an operator? I, I think um, out of the box thinkers. I think that's a big thing. A team player. Mm -hmm. um, I wouldn't say someone that goes with the flow. They just went out of the box thinkers. And some of the guys that were awesome, they would just get flustered and do the same safety violation like three three or four times in a row. Like just because it's it's a lot of stress, man. Yeah. It's a lot of stress. Uh, and then you just got this cadre, these instructors just like watching you and they don't miss a thing. I mean, you know, you know from buds, right? Like they, they see it all. It's like, dude, how'd you, how'd you see that? <laughs> mm -hmm. But um, yeah, I, I really just think like you like – Kind of put it like you didn't fit the mold or I heard and this, I believe this is probably true is, and I know from being up there, you get a list of green team guys and you right there, like this guy's not a, this guy's a turd. This guy's a turd. This guy's good to go. And you write it down like this guy's a turd and you got to obviously give a reason. And I'm sure some of those guys still, some of those guys aren't invited mm -hmm. and some of those guys are invited, but watch that guy because i'm sure if you got one guy saying this and another guy saying the opposite you know they gotta you know do the right thing but there's some of that how much of that is legitimate turds versus personality conflicts i can't really speak on that piece okay. uh but there's there has to be some personalities i mean some people take things very personal like mm -hmm. they had to run in mouthing off whatever it is I really didn't like what you did. You were an idiot when you were drunk. You did this when you were drunk. It usually comes down when you're drunk. Uh, so yeah, I mean, it comes down to a lot of things and it's it's nerve wracking. You're like, you're gonna tell me I can't go before I even get there to prove myself. Yeah. Uh, but you know, there is a little bit of politics I would think into it, but I don't know the grand scheme of it all. Okay. So I would, I would. You saw that list come around a lot when you were I saw it, like, you know, when new green teams would come in, if you're, if you're in town. Um, and I even think you'd get it overseas and you would just kind of eyeball, don't know anybody. All right, cool. Like whatever it is. Or like, Hey, we need to get this guy. This guy's awesome. Like freaking, Yeah. Yeah. It, it just depends. I mean, the same time you're like, dude, this guy's awesome. Like he's got to get in. Like, and they, they, I think they, they have to take that in to make decisions because you know, there's always more than, you know, they only have certain, so many slots versus the guys that are applying Yeah. or that, you know, re requested to be there. So they got to do their due diligence. So 
You graduate. What? How do they determine where you're going? Uh, they have a draft kind of thing. Um, and I think a lot of it is like having good buddies at certain squadrons kind of pulls you that way. I mean, I had the guys that I was a team two with. I mean, I ended up, with, you know, with my at my squadron because of those guys. They're already over there. Yeah, they were there. They came back. And, um, and so I'm sure they, you know, rallied for me to go there. But then it's like... You meet a good buddy, a good instructor that's at a different a different color, and you're like, Ugh, what do I do? Because this guy's <laughs> telling me this. I'm like, I don't know. I'm like, I don't know anything. Just get me up there. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, I went where I was supposed to go. So you went over to Gold Squadron. Yep. There are few people in the military that have experienced more loss than Gold Squadron in your time frame. <sighs> which we'll get into. Chills, yeah. But I want to say that because it is... I. I can't think of any unit that has experienced more yeah, loss we, than uh, you guys. We went through the ringer, and it was a weird time. Yeah. It was very weird. How was it showing up to gold? Phenomenal. Phenomenal. Just walking in, seeing the pictures, seeing the stuff on the wall. You got, you know, Hude and Kusei's freaking gold-plated guns hanging up. You're like, there's like AK-47 chandeliers. It's just... It's awesome. It's just like big old table in the middle. It's like Knights of the Round Table. It, it, was, it was awesome. It was the coolest thing in the world. And the people that were in that room made it the coolest place in the world. I mean, they were professionals. Like the number one thing that was always talked about is doing your job better and better and better and better and pushing you and pushing you. And it wasn't like you're a turd, like figure it out. It was like, hey, let me show you how to do it. And it was awesome. Like it, it was, it was a great show of leadership, and camaraderie and teamwork. It was, it was the coolest thing that I've ever experienced, which is great. Being out and you see other organizations, other businesses, and they're not doing a quarter of it. It's like, man, you can really fix yourself if you do certain things. Wow. So it, it was. I have nothing but respect for the men over there that I served with. I mean, they were, they were true heroes. Was it a welcoming? environment or was it uh I mean, a, what there, are you doing here who do you think you are there's always a little bit of heckling but it's yeah. in good fun it wasn't stupid it was it was fun but it's more like hey you're part of the team man here's your gear we all love gear yeah <laughs> how many guys went over there with you uh from your green team i'd say probably five or six i think five or six i think so um adam brown was one of them Oh, Adam was one of them. We were in the same green. He was. I uh, was his team leader at Green Team. He was in my uh, team. Dom. Dom, okay. went, Dom went over with me. We all we all went over together. Oh. And a couple other guys. So what happens when you get in there? Uh, you know, you get all checked in. You get your cages. Your 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 beautiful cage. I heard Shipley talk about that too. It's it's so like. You know, we got the cages, right? But just like, it seems like every time you come back to your cage, there's like a little package. Like Santa just came and dropped it off. <laughs> More gear. It's like, dude, like where do I put this stuff? Like I need another cage. Like there's just so much gear. Like for different regions, different uh, climates, all that stuff, different missions. And I'm like, I don't even know what this is. But like, okay, I'll put it on my shelf over here of things I don't know what it, what it is. I need to learn. Uh, but, it, but it was cool, dude. And then you, you know, you do the... Uh, Again, which I talk about in here, you do the yard, yarding in, you know, we got the big yard of beer and they drop in a couple shots, down it, start to say a little speech, I tell you to shut up, you get your patches, and those patches, man, holding those patches, it was like better than my trident, getting my seal trident, which was a great time, I don't want to take away from that, but it's just like, dude, this, this, since I was a kid, is what I wanted to do is be here and finally go get to, to fight, like really fight. And I say that not knowing what really fight meant. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you don't realize it until you're, until you're doing it. Uh, but it was, dude, it was, it was the, it, it would be like if Christmas, 4th of July and Thanksgiving and every other cool holiday plus your birthday were wrapped into one day, that would be it. Nice. It was awesome. Nice. For me. 
You know, each one of the, obviously I never spent any time over there, so I don't know, and I am curious. I hear each, and I've picked it up, especially with gold. Um, there seems to be kind of a culture or a vibe in each squadron. And from what I've been able to gather, just from knowing you and Dom and Adam Brown and you know some of our other mutual friends that wound up going over to gold, it seems like gold's where everybody that I know went for the most part. But it seemed to be very religious. It seemed to be a very religious, God-fearing squadron. That's funny you say that, because I've never thought about that. Really? No. I was never, I was not a man of faith when I was in at all. Hmm. But, I mean, if you look at it, the Crusader, Yeah. we have crosses. And a lot of those guys were, you know, their faith was strong. And, uh, yeah, but, and again, I don't know other ones, you know, what the other squadrons are doing, but, yeah, I, that'd be fair to say. That'd be fair to say. Was there a lot of praying and? Uh, not that I was a part of. I mean, to be quite honest with you, I'd be like, get that crap away from me. Okay. Uh, if someone was pushing in my face, but at the same time, I was always, I was kind of like what I like to say, Christ curious. <laughs> like, yeah. what is that exactly? What does that mean? And I, I remember asking Adam and Dom a lot, like, hey, you know, I, mean, I ask stupid questions like, what book do you like better, the Old Testament or the New Testament? Not knowing what the heck I'm even asking. Like, what, what kind of question is that? And uh, and I would ask, dude, and I would just try to, like, get just a little bit of information before I get to... It's probably good to, to give you a little background on that, which I've kept locked up forever until this. It's when I was... My parents went through a divorce probably when I was seven or eight years old. Um, and I was in my bed one night, and... Like, if you can just imagine a room I'm against on the far side of, by my window, my bed was there, and then the door's on the other side. And I wake up, for some reason, I look over, and I see Christ. I see Jesus. And I knew who Jesus was. And I, and I, my mom never took me to church a lot. I, I went a couple times, but you know, you always see the picture. I knew who Jesus was. Where did you see him? In my room. Where? In a closet, on the no, wall. No, he was standing in the middle of the room, and he was transparent. I could see my bookshelf that was behind him. And he just stood there. He made no facial expressions. Kind of had a um, like a, a glowing light to him. Long brown hair, beautiful face, like just perfect. What was he wearing? A white robe. A white robe. And you could. I just remember I could see my books behind him because he was like, I was like, wow. And I didn't know what to think. I didn't know... I didn't know. And I looked over and you know, I'm looking at him and I'm just like, and I'm, I'm not scared. I'm not screaming. I'm just soaking, I'm getting chills, man. I'm soaking this in. And I'm not knowing what anything is. I was awake and I saw that. And for however long he was there, he vanished. And soon as he vanished, my room was the blackest of black I've ever seen in my entire life. It was so dark and the fear that came over me was overwhelming. It was the scariest thing. It ruined, it wrecked me. Really? As soon as that darkness hit and I tried to scream for my mom and I couldn't and I finally got the courage and I guess you could say strength. I was like paralyzed and I went to her room and I really didn't say anything. I don't know if I mumbled anything or like, hey, I saw something or whatever it was, uh, but I freaking um, went to bed in her room. And then the, the next couple of nights, just thinking about it wasn't the greatest sleep, but I was scared. So I would, I'd cover my head up, turn on, you know, my, use a nightlight, which I never did before. And I mean, a nightlight that was like pretty much Batman's freaking signal. It was so bright. I was like, dude, I don't want any more of this stuff. I was like, this sucks. Like that, that scared me. Um, and I was confused. I didn't know, like, and I, and I, a couple of days later, probably about a week later, I think. I somehow, my arms made it out of my little protective fortress of my, of, of my blankie. And uh, I felt tickling in my arm. I heard orchestra, like organ music, you know, the yeah. organs or whatever at church. Like at a church? Yeah. Which is the creepiest sound in the world. And I, I feel tickling and I wake up and nothing's, nothing's there. Just my light. And I'm like freaking out. I'm like, what is going on? And I, the chills are ridiculous right now. I'm like, 
seen at all. I go to my mom's room again and just, just a lot of weird things happened during that time, during my parents' divorce. But I know what I saw and I know I was awake when I saw it. And um, to me, Jesus became the boogeyman. I wanted okay. nothing to do with him. Keep it away from me. I don't want to be near you. I don't want to see you. It was so bad. I went over to spend night, spend uh, spend the night with a friend that I, that I met at seventh grade when I switched schools. Like I, we were awesome. Played basketball together. Like he was just a cool dude. Went over to his house, not knowing his father was a pastor. And we and he like kind of had a loft uh, where where we were gonna sleep for the night. And I was walking up the stairs, and on the left there was a picture, and it was Jesus's face. And instantly, I was like, I got to leave. I called my mom and had her pick me up. I was wow. like, this hurts to talk about. I was scared to death of him. I slept under my covers until I was a sophomore in high school. Are you serious? I was scared to death of him. I'd be sitting on my couch watching freaking Say by the Bell. <laughs> And I would make myself think about Jesus busting in like a Navy SEAL and taking me away from my parents. Just scooping me up and taking me away to God knows where. I would have those thoughts often. I, 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 I painted this picture that he was, he was evil, he was wrong, he was bad. And I didn't know anything about him. Did he ever reappear? No. No? I mean, in other ways which we'll get to, but yeah. uh, no, that was, I mean, I didn't want anything to do with him. I did not want anything to do with him whatsoever. I wouldn't, I mean, I, you know, I, you know, got married at a church, my, my, my first marriage and went to other weddings, but I would never go to church. I didn't want to stand, I didn't want to be around. I would drive by one and I would cringe. I was scared. I, I was scared. I was extremely what was it that helped you overcome that fear after you were a sophomore? That came a little later. Um, do you want to go in timeline or you want me to jump to it? We'll go in timeline. Okay. We'll go in timeline. Well, it is very strange that you had this connection to Jesus as a young, young kid all the way up, what, through high school, and then you wind up at Gold Team as, I mean, I was, do they call you a crusader? Heck yeah. Yeah, so <laughs> interesting. So you get over to Gold Team. We covered the culture a little bit. Um, what's the cycle like? Kind of like, you know, being a team too. You know, you do your, you, you do your individual kind of work up going to schools. I mostly did breaching schools or lock picking, alarm bypass, just like the fun stuff. Like I just, dude, I was, that's all I wanted to do. I mean, there's other schools you do, um, but mostly it was breaching stuff. Like I just wanted to be a breacher. And uh, so you do that in the second, you know, few months, you're kind of working together as your team, then your troop, and then you're on standby for any real world calls. Um, you're alert is what you'd call it, where you have to be, had to be within, you had, you had to respond, come to the command within a certain time limit to be, to be there to a real world event anywhere in the globe. And, uh, that's a few months and then you go on your deployment and then you just repeat that cycle. And every, we just rotate, our squadrons just rotate doing that stuff. Did you jump into a full cycle or I came you... in. I came in right when they got back. Okay. They, they were back for, I think they came back a week later. Okay. And then they went on their leave, did a little family time, some, were, some stayed. And then we were back in the cycle. So you got, you know, guys walking around. They just got all this experience. They're doing all the, they did all this crazy stuff. They're, t they're telling the stories. You're just like, uh, uh, I want to be a part of these stories. And um, so it was cool. And they, you know, they, they all were experienced. They were all experienced. They all had multiple deployments over to either Iraq or Afghanistan. They just, they knew the deal. They knew how to fight. They, they were fighters. They were war fighters. They knew the deal. And... They kind of raised me. So at that point, I mean, you know for a fact you're going to get what you're you fighting. came in to do. You're fighting. No doubt in your mind. No doubt in your mind. There is no, I hope we. It's when we. I can't wait to. That's what it was. How long was it when you showed up to go before your first deployment? 
six, nine months. That's a something like that. How was that? Where'd you guys go? Uh, first one was Iraq, Western Iraq. Nothing but DAs. All it DAs. A, it was breaching nonstop, nonstop breaching, kicking in doors, shooting dudes every night. Multiple times a night. I wouldn't say every night. I mean, there'd be like the stint of like, hey, we're going, you know, it's like, hey, this is the 10th day we've gone out and we're getting it on. I mean, there'd be like a day or two here that we, you know, there was nothing going on or we we're letting something develop. But for the most part, you're going out, man. So when you got, when you got over there, you got on your first deployment to Iraq, you know, in a regular SEAL team, it's, you're probably going to. I mean, I don't know. I can't remember. It seemed like three weeks, maybe even a month before you really start getting into a type of mm -hmm. groove. When you go over with Team Six, is it like that? Oh, or your, is it your targets are already developed by the guys you're relieving. They pass their target set off to you. Okay. And so you're running and gunning, man. So you drop your bags and you're... you got about one to three days. That's it. To, to get it, to get ready for it. And you're you're on. I mean, it's it's game time. Who are you guys going after? Usually, your HVT, your high value targets. I mean, some MVTs, medium value. But uh, I mean, whoever Intel's telling you this is, you know, this is the cell we need to hit, or this little tribe, whatever you want to call them. That's what you would do. And you know, I think I can recall maybe one or two dry holes. Do you want to describe your very first hit? I I can't remember. Okay. I can remember my first kill. Let's but I can't talk remember about my that. First, I can't remember my first hit. Do you uh, want to talk about your first kill? Sure. Uh, we were... Uh, remember the guy? He was wearing his white man jammies, and he had, like, black and white peppered hair, or peppered hair. And uh, at this particular compound, at, at this particular compound, they were they were sleeping outside. Usually they're up on the roof. Uh, and, and, you know, in summer, it was, it was summertime. But they were in the in the courtyard or the like outside. So there's like these little bodies and these little bodies. And you can hear our, our recce guys, our snipers, you can hear <laughs> they're silenced 45s just taking dudes out, taking their little sentries out. And I'm like, okay, that's like cool sounding. And this is probably my, my, I don't know, 10th time out maybe. Uh, never found myself in the right position. I'm like, and I was hungry. I was like, oh God. I think Dom got his first one. I'm like, God, I want to be you. And uh, and he's like, you can just see the smile on his face. I'm like, ah, oh, give it to me, please. And uh, so this dude and his, his wife was were, were sleeping on the ground and we're coming up and we're, it was enough to go white light. And I just see him reach over and, he, and I can see the pistol grip goes for it. And then I just dropped him. Just dropped him right there. Right, but he was already down. Just shot him there as he lay. And, and I remember one thing that was so crazy about that is his wife right next to him did not make any peep, did not cry. She just looked over and just stayed there. She sat up. That was it. She had no emotion. Are you kidding? And I was like, that's, that's weird, right? It's weird. It, it was very weird. It's like she knew his time was coming. She was just waiting for the night for us to hit him. Do you think she was relieved? Possibly. I mean, who knows? I mean, she could have been forced to be there, but she had, I mean, I would be led to believe that. If you have no emotion, I mean. Seems so. I hope my wife would cry or something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but there was nothing, man. It, it was just, seemed very weird. And then we just like take on the targets and then that feeling of putting those bullets into them was just like, ugh. I know crack is extremely addictive, extremely. I've never done it, but you hear the stories, right? Talk to some prior users or whatever. That feeling was like, I was like, I want my life to be this feeling. Like I want to shoot as many bad guys as I possibly can. And that was my mission is like, bad guy, you're going, you're going down. Like that was, I mean, that's what we're there for anyways, mm -hmm. is to take it to them. And I was, I loved it. I loved it. I like, it was my oxygen. It was the blood that ran through my, my system. Do you remember all of them? No. Uh, at times I'll think about something or I'll see something. It will make me 
think of one, uh, but I can't. There's no way. I mean, there's dozens. I can't think of them all. How many times was it just you engaging a bad guy versus... Our whole team or something? Yeah. Dozens. Dozens. A lot. Yeah. I've, I mean, I never kept count. I tried to, and not much luck. I, I mean, a lot. I Did mean, that... I, probably 50-ish or something around there. Okay. Solo ones. I mean, not, not including assists or whatever it is. Did you... Did that feeling ever start to change? I wanted it more. You wanted it more. I wanted it more. As time went on. I wanted it more. Especially when you you know you get into our later deployments and your buddies are passing. And it just, it stirs something up and you just want to take it to them. I mean, you want to take it to them and just get their evil. Once you really learn what they do to women and children, to an American convoy, to other people, other contractors or whatever... We had, I mean, we had, to paint a picture for you, what I mean is we had one op where I took a, a shot on a guy. He was he was reaching for his AK. He, like, had it in his hand. He was, like, about ready to swing it around. Dropped him. And I don't know why I felt this way, but I felt a little bit of remorse. Like, I was like, man, why did I, like, I just felt bad. It wasn't like it wasn't a justified shooting. It just, it felt weird. It felt different than the other ones. It just felt weird. And so I was curious. So I, we get back from the op and I go to the, you know, our Intel shack and I'm like, hey man, if you find anything on this dude, you know, we do our pick up whatever they have at their, at the target and uh, exploit it. And I was like, hey, if you find anything, like, please come get me. And a couple hours later, he's like, hey, follow me. So we go to his little computer and one of the CDs we found, it's this guy that I just took out. He's got KBR contractors, truck drivers from like the Philippines, staked on the side of like this highway in Iraq. They're tied up with their hands behind their back and their feet wrapped around the post. And there's probably, I'd say somewhere between three and five. And this guy, these guys, where this one dude was one of them, was doing ballistics on them. He would stab them, he would shoot them in different parts, not like shoot them in the head and like take them out, but like your leg your side, stab them, stab them here. And they were just, they were just, and they were laughing and they were giggling. And I was like, how could you do that? And then I'm like, you're dealing with pure evil. That's how you do it. I mean, it's pure evil. And uh, that was one of the times something, a, a thing kind of changed. I was like, you get, you get no more remorse for me. You don't, you get nothing. I don't feel sorry for you at all. And I was like, after that, like things upped it. Yeah. I was like, if there was a way to kill harder, I sure in heck was searching for it. Did that, did you see that early in your career? What do you mean? That specific incident. I where they, was, where you saw no, the guy's it was laptop. probably... Man, I mean, they all kind of run together. I'd say probably third or fourth deployment. Okay. Over there. How many deployments did you do? Probably third. A total of seven. Okay. Five with, um, yeah. with Dev. Was were you always privileged to that kind of information? You know, what do seeing you, mean? you hit a guy at a target, or you the team takes somebody out, or you take somebody out, and the intel team does the SSC and the target. You guys always get to see the information and in, and in, and in, in the the what am I searching for the like what they find pretty much yes. all of it not all of it what some, these guys have been responsible for doing some we do but it's like a it's like cliff note version like a couple liners hey this is what they were doing they just hit this convoy last that killed you know five Americans you'll hear about that but not like the details like we've been looking for this guy for x amount of years unless you really want to know and you just go talk to him and they'll tell you you know you get the information okay that guy i wanted to know about and he showed me had i not probably asked him i never would have known about that i'm glad i did but it yeah. changed up that it kind of calloused me we hear the word calloused right mm -hmm. and they'll tell you oh we're getting callous like yeah you're right we are and there's a reason for it and yeah it's just heart of my heart I look at I looked at humanity a little bit differently.
Yeah, I can imagine. So you went to Iraq for your first deployment. At some point in time, the area of operations changed for development group and Delta. Delta took Iraq, development group took Afghanistan. I don't believe there was much crossover. Yeah. When so did that happen? That's kind of a jumble when all that happened, but we kind of got kicked out because the army wanted to get their, they wanted to be where the fight was. Mm -hmm. And then when we moved, it blew up over in Afghanistan. So then they're like, oh crap, we want to go there. They're like chasing it. We were just, you got it. You know what I mean? Yeah. But we were still sending guys to, um, to Iraq. We, we were in both places. Okay. We were in multiple places. And I think that one, when all that was going on, I think I was back in Iraq again. I think oh, I, okay. I think I only did two to Afghanistan and the rest were Iraq. Oh, and, really? Yeah. The majority of them were Iraq for me. I mean, I did a couple like full ones over in Afghanistan. Okay. More in Iraq. We came home from your first deployment with gold. How did you feel after that? You had you had been very busy. Yeah, uh, kind of numb and just went down the rabbit hole a little bit more of like, hey, this is priority. The country's priority. Shooting bad guys is priority. I don't want any. I don't. And I put the kids and my family behind me. And I mean, not behind me as I like left them, but uh, you know that, like I said, those fractures turned into cracks. They turned into gaping holes. And it was getting worse and it was getting worse and I was doing nothing about it to try to make it better. My wife would, at the time was like, we should go to counseling. I said, counseling's stupid, I'm not going. Uh, and just wanted to be on trips. I would volunteer for any and every trip just to be away from my house. Uh, I just didn't want to deal with the emotions. I didn't want to deal with the, the noise of, and this, this, is, this is the truth, but it's, it sucks to say. I didn't want to deal with the school, my kid's school. I didn't want to deal with, you know, the freaking we're having a plumbing problem. I did not want to deal with, hey, can we talk about what's going on in our marriage? I didn't want to deal with any of that. I was like, leave me alone. I'm going to play with my gear and I'm going to go overseas. Like, that's all I want to do. That's all I wanted to do. That's it. I mean, things were okay, you know, mm -hmm. but you could just like, like it just, the uh, the root of evil in our freaking marriage was just coming through. And it was just like, I started looking at her with disgust. Uh, Why? I just, she would, not knowing it, that was really me causing it. She was drinking a lot and I was getting ticked off. Like, you can't be drinking all the time. My anger started getting worse. Her anger was getting worse. I mean, to the point where she, during Green Team, um, she tried to commit suicide. No. During green team. So before green team, man, I'm like, and I knew, like, this has happened before. Like, it happened one other time when I was at team two. Uh, she downed a bunch of pills. I had to take her to the hospital, get her freaking pumped, her stomach pumped to pretty much save her life. I'm like, geez, I'm like, what are you doing? So before green team, I knew that this was there. So before green team, I'm like, hey, like, please, I need to concentrate on this. Like, this is like my brain, everything needs to be into this. Like, I have got to be 100% all in. I have to. And she's like, of course, of course, I'm here to support you, all that stuff. And it was like I don't, maybe a couple months in, uh, it was a SEAL reunion. It was in town for the first time I'd ever been. So we went and uh, sat down with a buddy and his wife and my wife. And we were having a couple of drinks. And I guess she she got irritated. She always got irritated if like she wasn't like the center of communication, like center of the conversation. And we're just talking about stuff. We're talking about green team mostly and, you know, we're interjecting and like we're talking about other things and all that stuff. And she got like irritated. She's like, pulls me aside, like, hey, why, why aren't you talking to me? Or I'm like, dude, if you want to talk, like engage in the conversation. Like we're having a, we're in a group setting. And she got weird. She stormed off. And about an hour later, I get a call for the babysitter. We had at that time two children. So both my daughters. And she's like, something's wrong. She's like, uh, Leah, your wife called and said or texted like, take care of the kids. And she's like, it really worried me. So I'm letting you know. I was like, of course you did. I'm like, here we go again. And so I get a call or text. I don't know if text. Yeah. Te I think texting was. Yeah. And, um, something she communicated to me. She's like, I'm at a hotel. You will not find me. I'm like this. And she's like, this is it. And I was like, gosh. And I really just wanted to be like, it's a cry for help. Like, let's get it. Like, I really just want to be here and drink. 
with the boys. That's, I mean, so self, like just bad things. So I started calling hotels, trying to find out where she was. And it was on the fifth time. Uh, I asked if she checked in and she did. I was like, you need to go to her room, get her out. Cause she's trying to commit suicide right now. So they went up there. She wouldn't answer the door. I was like, you need to get the cops there right now. So I got the cops there and I was like, you need to, and I gave him permission. Like you can bust down that door. I'm like, I will pay for whatever the damages are and get her. They go in there. She's in the bathtub or by the bathtub with just blood soaked towels everywhere. She sliced her wrists. It was a bad one. It's bad enough where she got put to a psych ward for a few weeks, I believe. So her parents came down to watch the kids so I could finish off training. And it was just like, so every night I'd be done with training, exhausted, smoked, and I'd go see her. So walking in, sitting down at a table with just like, very weird. You know, she comes out in a robe. And what do you say? I have no idea. What do you, yeah, I didn't either. What did you say? I don't know. I was like, I mean, you, you can't like, what are you doing? Like, what's wrong with, like, I'm sure there was some of that. Like, suck it up was always my go-to. Like, suck it up. Like, what are you doing? Like, it's fine. Like, what are, you, what are you flipping out about? No compassion whatsoever. Zero compassion, from what I can recall. I mean, that was really me in the day, which was zero compassion. I would show some to my kids, of course. Uh, not to her. Not to her at all. I mean, there'd be those rare instances where I'd be like, oh, everything's perfect. This is so cool. But for the most part, just, I want to go work. That's all I want to do is go work. Damn, man. But that was that was a that was rough that week. I think a week or two she was there and it was like. Thankfully, we were in town doing whatever training at the command. So it wasn't you no know, crazy bad, but dude, it was just like. And all I wanted to do was leave and go get like rest, go see my kids. I didn't want to be there. You did want to see your kids, though. Yeah, I did want to see my kids. Like, the, yeah, I always wanted to see my kids. Always you, wanted to see my kids. Were they old enough to put together what was going on at that time? Uh, I don't think so. I think my oldest now she can remember things. She'll talk about it. She's like, I didn't know this after you know she read the book. She's like, uh, excuse me, listen to the book. She's like, I thought that when this happened, that this happened. So, but she's like, I, I, I could, I get it now. Like, okay. So, she, I mean, she, she knows, but I never really told him or. I mean, I never told him about any of this stuff Yeah. Uh, until my oldest was like 18. They didn't know anything. And they got thrown under the bus by their mother for years. I never said anything because it didn't matter. I wasn't going to tear their mom apart. Yeah. I didn't want to do that. That's not okay. Damn, no matter man. what she did to me. Well, you went back. You went back to, let's get back to the deployment schedule. You went back. Did you go to Afghanistan your second deployment? Man, I, I don't know. I, I think Iraq, I think. Okay. And I, I I can't remember. I think this was uh when we lost Mike Nate and Louie. Uh, and, and I don't know if it was I think it was like the third or fourth deployment somewhere in there. I, I really can't they they all seem to mesh together. Uh but that deployment, that that's the one that changed my world. Um we did we went to a target and our team, our troop kind of broke off. We had three different buildings to hit. And I went to one or my team went to one and then the other guys hit like another compound, maybe 500 yards down the, down this dirt road. And, uh, we get up on the wall cause we're doing call outs cause we don't want to go in. Cause this network was known for suicide vests. Uh, a lot of them, because we, we shot a couple dudes, and every one of them, every single one of them had a suicide vest. Every one of them. And uh, so I'm up on this wall, and I the, my vantage point is I can see through the door, and it's light inside, dark outside. There was maybe a couple, like, dim, dimmer lights on the outside, the exterior of the building. And I could see in there, and a guy stops, like, right where my vision is. So I got my, not even, can't even use my dot because it's light in there. So I'm going to red dot uh, on him. Uh, with my doubler and I'm just on him so I can see him but I couldn't tell what he had he had something on his waist but I couldn't tell and I saw kids like pretty much when I could tell someone was around the way I see kids come in I think like two or three and he like brings them in and he clacks himself off whoa so those kids 
just evaporated. He, he evaporated. And that roof of that house lifted up. And by the time it settled down, that overpressure got to me. And I was knocked off onto my back. And I was like trying to come to like what was kind of, you know, get my bearings. And I was like, holy crap, that dude just killed all his kids. It was uh, another time. I was like, these guys are freaking animals. These guys are savages. They don't care about human life. They care about their agenda or what they want to do. Killing the infidel. That's all they care about. Enough to where they're going to kill themselves and their children. And I was like, how do you fight that kind of enemy? You know what I mean? Yeah. It's uh, It was heavy. It was heavy. So that happened. So the other team sent like two or three guys to help us out because they're like, all right, this is seriously where the action is. We're calling in air support by a couple squirters. Um, just taking as many people out as we can because clearly they're like, we're, they're not coming alive. So we're like pulling in the arsenals. And then we get comms on our radio that two guys, our guys got shot and that was Mike and Nate. And so we finished what we were doing. We go back and, uh, Mike and Nate had passed and I remember I walked by and Mike was on the ground and I could see him. I could see his face. I could see the damage done by the machine gun fire. And that was, we saw a lot of death over there, but death seen from the bad guys and death from your guys, two different worlds. And I can still picture that, every detail, everything. And I and Mike, or excuse me, Nate was still struggling. He was still had breaths in him. And I could hear the wheezing and hear him fighting. And then it just got quiet. And then we had, like, had to move to Exville. We had to, like, dump some grenades, take out as many dudes as we can, uh, at another building, the third building, um, buddy Eric uh, Fro, who we just actually had on the Unaf- Unafraid podcast, uh, he was walking into a building. He like because we were we were we were doing the pine technique. We weren't just rushing in because of these suicide guys, and he didn't see anything. And he walks into the room, and I guess there was some a stack of blankets, and the guy was like in a fortified position with blankets, kind of blocking it, like kind of concealing it. Dude unleashes a full magazine of AK, uh, and it went all around his body. Didn't hit him. He came out of that room, from what I understand and from what he said, and then like the his number two man, just kind of like true lies, where he's like they're checking the body. Yeah, he's like checking all his body. He didn't get hit once. Wow, that's not the first time I've heard that happening. Yeah. yeah. So it was a, it was a crazy target. Uh, and that was my first exposure to losing the good guys, our guys. And uh, what ensued was more drinking to stuff it. Didn't know how to process it. Yeah, you have some guys sleeping it off. You have some guys can't sleep. Personally, I would get a couple hours. I was up for a few hours, get a couple hours. I like didn't know the difference between night and day. I wake up thinking it's day, it's night. Go to sleep, wake up, it's day. It did, like just everything ran together. Like nothing made sense. And we were on a stand down after those maybe, maybe two or three days. And then Adam, Adam Brown, he injured his leg prior to that, to us deploying. He backfilled, came in, he was, his surgery was done. He was healed. He came out, and then a couple of our army counterparts came up from Baghdad to help us out and kind of see what was going on. And then about exactly one week later was the night of the Super Bowl. We were like, had this huge, I'm sorry, that was the night of the Super Bowl. We had this huge party, like, planned to watch the game, chill out, get a bunch of pizzas. But we ended up going out, and then Mike and Nate, you know, passed on that one. Then a week later, same, same... Um, same target set, same same crew. Um, we go to the 
another the, the the compound, and we're we're very weary now that you know they just took out two guys. Um, you know they're blowing themselves up. They don't care. They're blowing houses up. So we're extremely weary. Like we didn't move up to it. So we did another call out, and nothing was going on. Like one dude came out. Everything seemed to be good. Then st- stuff started happening in the house. Started building up. A lot of women and children were starting to get stuffed by the front of the house. So like if you can imagine like a comp like a house front door and on the front door there's like an overhang a very like a, almost like a carport but the carport is like a huge slab of concrete it's not like a tin roof it is like a bomber with like two big stanchions at the end to, to keep this thing like big ones uh rectangle ones i can i can picture it all and uh i i called over to louis louis Safran, and i was like hey dude because he was our eod guy I was like, hey, bro, uh, and I was taking over team leader that one because my team leader was was down. He was sick that night. So I like just took over a spot for that that night. So I came over comms. I was like, hey, brother, Louis, or whatever, uh, Nuke04, I think was this thing, called him up and said, hey, move up and try to help out with the, uh, you know, getting all the, the, the women and children back and searching them, making sure they're not carrying anything. He's like, roger that. Two seconds later, he jumps over a little three-foot wall, runs up to that one of those pillars, and it was getting crazy. Like we, by that time, we had a team moved up. Um, the other team that was primary entry moved up. So on the this wall, th- there's a door, and then Louis over here by this carport, or what, whatever it was, front porch, whatever you want to call it. And it was getting crazy. And so I was like, "Crap, they need help." So I come around my wall, maybe like a it, the wall was probably up to up to my shoulders. Like I could see perfectly to take shots, duck down if I needed to. It was like it was an amazing spot. It was like right in front of the door. Somewhere in there, a dude got shot uh, by Fro, actually. Um, and so I moved up right on Louie. I, I moved up, I got my gun, and I, and, I, and I put my hand on his right shoulder. I was like, what's going on? He's like, oh, just craziness, man. Just freaking, like, we're just trying to get this out. So, you know, we're trying to get people out. And I think I've told you this before, I've got serious Tom's disease. Yeah. Terrified of missing stuff. I always want to put the breach on the door. I want to be the first guy in the room. If anyone's getting action, I want it to be me. When Dom got us killed and I didn't, I was like a little little baby. Like, why does he get to play and I don't? You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so for some reason, man, I, I can still see a bead of sweat going down his neck. I can still smell it. I can still see it. I can, I can, I can feel it. For some reason... I was like, there's too many people here. And it's like, I heard this voice. I got this feeling. I can't even describe what I got. It was, it was like everything wrapped into one saying, get away, get out. Like an, like an intuition? Whatever you want to call it. Whatever you want to call it. Something that said, get away from where you are right now and go back behind that wall you just came from. And that is not me. I've never done it before besides that one time that I can remember. I've always had to be there, especially when we got to deal with some stuff. We got to work. I'm ready to work. I want to work. Something told me. So I told Louie, I was like, hey, man, I'm going to go back behind the wall. We got too many guys up here. And I'm like, are you good? He's like, I got this, bro. Like, I'll see you in a few. I was like, all right, dude, I love you. You know, we do our like little, I love you, brother. So I like had my arm on him, on that shoulder. I rolled out. As soon as I button hooked that wall out that gate and made that turn where I was covered, the house exploded. And it wasn't a baby explosion. Half the house was gone. That team that was on this side was covered, blew a couple guys out 30, 50 feet against the back side of the wall, which I was behind. Dudes were covered in rubble. And I was like, what the heck? I got, I mean, I got hit with debris on the back of the helmet. Nothing, nothing compared to what these guys did. The dust, couldn't see anything. Like everything was just gone. It was like what you would hear the fog of war. It was the first time I was like, wow, this is, this is the real deal. Like I was just discombobulated. Didn't know what's going on. I didn't know what way was up, down, left, right. Didn't know. I finally, you know, got my bearings wrap back around and like I'm a member I'm in the middle of this courtyard and the dust is just settling and I'm like what I left and what I saw were two different things two different pictures 
And I felt something on my foot. I'm like, man, what the heck? And it was our dog, Digo. He was buried. And the only thing that was sticking out was his mouth. And he latched onto the first thing that came, and that was my foot. So I, <laughs> I ripped out my, uh, my hiking boots out of his mouth and went back to where I thought Louie was, and he was gone. And I'm like, what the heck? And there was one of our our augments was over on the side. And I saw him like, what's going on? Where, do you have Louie? And he's like, yes. And Louie was underneath the slab. And so like there was a hole held up by some rubble, uh, some rock, some boulders from the house. And we're crawling in there trying to grab him. We can reach like his calf to try to grab some, some fabric to like pull him out. When I grabbed his calf, it felt like jello. There was no bone structure. It was like when that thing fell, it folded him like an accordion and took out pretty much shattered all bone. It it didn't feel like a leg. It felt like a jello mold. Damn. Or putty. And he was stuck under there and we couldn't get him out. And fortunately, the guys inside the building died. I think there were, there were some random shots by our snipers doing containment stuff. Uh, but we finally got them out. Our PJs came over with our, I think they're called Sava or Savvy. Uh, I talk about more, a little bit more detail in here. But they lifted it up, got his body out, and we just started exfilling. Um, I think by Bradley, I think the QRF came and uh, exfilled out. And to this day, I'm like, man, what if I didn't, what if I didn't come over that radio and say, move up? Would he be here? Why did I hear that voice? And he didn't. I'm no different than him. Why? These are questions that I somewhat still answer or ask myself is what makes, why did I hear that? Why did I tell him to go over? And uh, yeah, it's been a it's been a tough one. I'm sorry, man. It's war, right? Yeah. It, I mean, and and I know Louis. I know. <sighs> that man wouldn't want to go out any other way. I know that for a fact. None of our boys that we lost, they were they were warriors, man. They knew what was they knew what was at stake. They knew it, and they were they were proud to do that job. And they would do it again. There's no doubt. Yeah. But uh, yeah. Let's take a break. You're an EOD guy, explosive ordnance disposal, a Navy SEAL, an actor, a director, a writer, a producer, a stuntman, a video game director, and a master of self-awareness. Rumor has it, and I wanna know if this is true. Rumor has it, Somebody hit you in the face with a baseball bat and you took the baseball bat and resolved the issue. Is that, is that true? That is not true. That's not true? It was a stop sign pole. We went into Solder City. That was uh, one of our big ones. Um, I had guys on the Zarqawi hit. When you go into a place where a guy is chopping off heads, setting it on the neighbor's porch, and then threatening them that they're next any day and they don't know when it's coming. When you go remove that cancer, there's like this dude, like way the way the hell down there, and I'm like, and he's like peeking out from behind this car, and I'm like, 
there's a dude right over there you need to keep eyes on when he pops his heads up, pop it. I was like, that's exactly what the fuck you're saying. I was like, what makes you think that we can go down range for years and take live for a bunch of people that obviously don't give a flying fuck? And I wouldn't do 10 times more for those closest to me. All right, Eddie, we're back from the break. Just had an emotional ending to that last portion there. It's a good time for a break. Yeah. <laughs> and I want to I want to ask you because you've experienced more loss. The guys over at Gold Team have experienced more loss than anybody else that I know. And I'm always curious how you deal with loss. Initially and how I deal with it now are two different worlds. Before, I would drink and I would take pills or I would take any nighttime medicine I could to sleep because I couldn't sleep. It, it, was, it was always to the bottle, beer, wine, Captain and Cokes, just so I wouldn't feel, just so I wouldn't feel. I would stuff it and stuff it and I didn't, you know, I didn't. I didn't, I didn't know you were supposed to feel. Mm -hmm. We signed up for this. We're, that we're supposed to do this. This is just part of war. But uh, that's not the correct way to do it. Because what that was doing is I'm drinking more and just stuffing as uh, I'm drowning out my family. I was drowning out my family. I wasn't, I wasn't present. I mean... Remember, I, I, I talk about this as well. Um, do you remember American Sniper? You've seen the movie, right? Mm -hmm. Bradley Cooper comes, Chris Kyle, the character, comes back, I think, from I don't know what deployment, and he's he's sitting in his chair with a beer, and he and it kind of the, the camera pans around and it shows what he's looking at, which is a TV, but the TV's not turned on, and he's just sitting there. And he's physically there, but he's mentally checked out. He's back over there. And that's, that's, I saw that and broke into tears, man. I was like, that's it. That's the realest thing I've seen out of any combat movie that I've experienced. I was like, that's it right there. And I felt like that. I'd be back home. I'm not, I'm not with you. I'm here. I remember going out to eat with my family or, you know, going to a pumpkin patch or whatever it is. And I'm not even paying attention. I'm thinking about stuff over there. I'm thinking about the what ifs, the shoulda, couldas, the mm -hmm. why did I, the why didn't I, all those things and just replaying these things over and over and over again. Nonsense. It's like on a loop and I couldn't stop it and I didn't want it to stop. It was like, I just couldn't, I, I don't know. Everything was about that. It was about the teams. It was about being overseas. It was about fighting. It was about the losses. How do you deal with loss now? Versus then. Hmm. And we'll get into this, but uh, my remedy has been Christ. 100% saved my life. Saved, literally saved my life. Saved my life. What is it about, what is it about Christ that you find comfort in, or maybe comfort's the wrong word, but when, you're, when it comes to dealing with death? Dealing with loss, friends, teammates. What is it about Christ that brings you comfort? At I, that? I, I read there's a there's a verse, and it's actually Proverbs three, and I don't I don't have verses remember, but this one I remember Proverbs three five is do not lean on your own understanding, because we as humans we just don't get why this why that like why did I miss that one shot at sniper school? I'll tell you why. Because I was not supposed to be a sniper. I was supposed to be a Navy SEAL. And you know, we, we, we talk about these unanswered prayers and all that stuff, but dude, there's there's always this bigger and better thing usually if we're if we're doing the right thing and we're being obedient. And uh it just gives me peace. I can't I, I can't really describe 
the feeling inside, what it did to my heart and my brain, my soul, I should say. I just find comfort like, hey, it is what it, it doesn't mean I don't struggle. I still struggle. But I see the loss for what it is, is I couldn't control certain things. And that's life, man. War, evil, good. It will always be here. Always has been. Always will. And uh, he's just my... He is my, my pole in the ground that no matter what storm com comes through, no matter how crazy the winds are, no matter how bad anything is, I can hold on. I can hold on to that pole and I'm all right. I know I'm all right. I, I know it. I know it. I know he's got me. It doesn't mean that everything's peaches and cream. It doesn't mean that at all, but I know he's got me. And I know if I go through some troubled times, I'm just going to get stronger. I will get stronger. And the life lessons that have happened, getting my kids, dealing with that struggle has only made me stronger. Didn't understand it at the time. It's always hindsight. And I, I kind of, you know, I keep referring to this, but that's, I mean, that's my story. And the hot wash as I talk about it, looking back, I should have realized this or I should have done this. I, I, you know, thank God I did this. But it just, it soothes my soul. He does. It's just, I can't explain it. I ran from it. I was terrified of it until I allowed it. And we can get to that. We'll get to that. When we get to that. I got one more question on loss. And uh, I've never asked this, but I've always been curious of what other people's thoughts are. <clears throat> and I don't know how to word it, but um, so I'm just going to do my best. But when it comes to death and, and loss of friends, who do you, when you experience a loss and it's, it's, it's a friend, who do you, who do you feel worse for? Do you feel, because we have, we have two different kinds of losses happening in the veteran community. You have loss in battle, and then we have the suicide epidemic that's going on. I go back to the used to, like, I, dude, I, there's, there was Eddie, old Eddie, mm -hmm. and then there's the new Eddie. Old Eddie would have been like your weak, your coward. How could you not handle your stuff? You're an operator, and this is how, really? You selfish piece of crap, leaving yeah. your family like that, leaving them like this. That was my thought. I have a different thought because I've been put in that position. So I, my mindset's a little bit different on it now. What it, is it now? It's a real thing, man. It just sneaks up on you. It sneaks up on you, and all of a sudden, you find yourself holding a freaking pistol. And it's like, what the heck am I doing? Luckily for me, I was able to stop myself uh, or put it down and walk away. But I get it. It was just like everything, my world was just crumbling in. And I was always like, how could anyone do that? I mean, how could you do that? You selfish piece of crap. And I find myself in the same situation. And uh, yeah, that'll humble you mm -hmm. real fast. So I have a different approach. I take it way more serious if someone speaks about that. I know it's very real. Are some gonna cry for help? Absolutely. Are some extremely real? Absolutely. Do you wish some of the guys that have taken their own life would have died in battle? I do. Me too. Of course. It's what, it's a warrior's death, man. Yeah. Right? It's what we read about. It's what we watch. It's what we dream of. It's different. It, it feels different. It feels a lot different. But, but one thing that I've realized is there's the battle that we refer to in the spec ops world that's over in Afghanistan, Iraq, Africa, wherever, wherever the war is. But there's another war that we still fight daily. Um, there's evil present everywhere. We can see it. Pick up your phone, scroll. You'll see it. Look in the school systems. You'll see it. Look at things government officials are pushing. You'll see it. 
Like evil is real and it is rampant and it needs to be crushed. Yeah. <clears throat> well, getting back to deployments, got a little sidetracked there, but I wanted to ask those questions before I lost them. Let's get into Afghanistan versus Iraq. You spent a lot of time in Iraq. We've talked about Iraq. Let's talk about what you were doing in Afghanistan. Afghanistan was awesome. Um, I liked that a little bit better because it was a little tougher. Terrain's tougher. The fighters are a little bit tougher. Um, and it really depend on the fighters uh, where media was. Like, is are they over here or are they over here? And they would seem to really, you know, beef up their fighters in that position. But all in all, Afghanistan was way tougher. It was a harder target. They didn't care as much. They were, I mean, they have centuries of fighting. Uh, so, yeah, naturally, they're, they're ruthless. They're ruthless people. Um, we, I remember one, we did one op. And we usually go through the gate, you know, get to the, the, to the door, do a call out or hit them when they, if we can sneak in without them knowing we're there. And uh, we, we get there, we, you know, we kind of do an L. We cut a couple centuries. I think the Rangers are pushed off blocking like the next block or two over. They might be hitting another house over here. And um, we just take, start taking machine gun fire, like crazy machine gun fire, like da 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 you know, you know, I got talking guns over there. Grenades start coming over. Things are blowing up. I'm like, holy crap. Like this is like, they've, it seems like they've, the, the grenades are not stopping. So we had to push back and go on this, like the other side. There was like a, like a canal, like a low canal with a little wall. It was the best cover we could have. So we went back. And then my team leader came up and we, we developed this charge. We used to, I'm sure you've heard of the book bag charge. You put it on the wall, but it's like 20 pounds. I carried on one up. I'm like, I'll never carry this thing again, dude. Like, like no. So we worked on uh, making a smaller charge that can do the same effect. So we came up with like taking two blocks and the overpressure will make a cutting with C4. It will cut through. We can drop a thermobaric grenade in this little hole. And then that pressure will bust out a huge hole. Hmm. Uh, so we can get guys in. So like, all right, we're testing it on this target. So Damn, how the like, hell did you figure that out? Did uh, you, well, are you the one that figured that out? I was, I helped. So my, uh, my buddy, Travis, who was a, it was our, our master breacher. He's like, Hey, we put it, start putting it together. And he's like, we, we started like testing it because we did not want to carry that 21. So he's like, if we take, it's like, if you take two blocks, the pressure from this and the pressure of this will meet and they cut because you know, there's like the science of explosives. Mm -hmm. And then we, we was like, let's try it with a thermobaric to blow it out with the overpressure. And it worked. And uh, we hit this target. And the first wall I did, I actually grabbed Dom. I was like, let's go, cover me. So we run up there, do the first on this. Like you can see, like on the back side, there's like, the, there, there might've been some windows, but they were up top. You couldn't see, but all you could see was like a flat mud hut, like thick mud. But you could see where the rooms were divided because it was kind of sticking out from the adjacent wall, whatever you want to call it. So the first one, the one closest to us, put the charge on there, blow it, and the explosives was enough. I didn't need to do a thermo, and we go up there, we're clearing it, and there's like a donkey in there. So like, okay, you're not, like you're just kind of looking back at us, like, all right, you're, you're good, bro. <laughs> so, uh, so... We go to the next one, and I like I started like calling them like, "Hey, give me my charges." Like I had them like space throughout the team. Like people carry a couple of them uh, for this very reason. So we go to another one, uh, a little bit further down where we think they would be. Blow that one down. It was a kitchen. No one was in there. I go back because we're like setting it up. I'm running back, getting in our little canal, command detonating, and there's freaking. So it's like it's crazy. There's dust everywhere. Explosions are going off. Um, I get one one more of my charges, put it in between the two holes that I've already made, put it up there, uh, blow it, and I believe I th I did not throw a thermo in that one either. The second one I did, uh, but it made a big enough hole where I didn't need to do a thermobaric. So the dust is going out, and like the the dirt was like kind of make a little ramp, and uh, so. Dom kind of wraps, goes far as the dust is. So he was concealed by the dust. Go, we just kind of pan. Like we start pying off, like doing our cross cover. And we just start seeing dudes. And there's like machine guns, like grenades. Start, we finish, take off the couple dudes that were still breathing. 
They had a couple guys with their AKs in there just trying to take over the next explosive that was going to come. And when I walk into this room, like after we took out the dudes, like we, we call in the team and we're just kind of holding on our adjacent doors and we're going out to the rest of the compound. And I'm standing and I'm like, man, this is really weird. Like the things you think about, right? And I'm like, it was like, like a, a perfect carpet, like a very nice carpet. I was like, huh, interesting. I'm like, I got to check this out later. So we, we clear the compound, come back to that room. <laughs> I got to check this out put, later. Put on the white light to like, because I want to see what exactly we just did. Because the dust, I mean, it was, it was, it was hectic, you know? Mm-hmm. And I go to where I was standing and I felt it. And I put my white light down and all I see is a freaking eyeball staring up at me. So the dude got flattened by the breaching charge, like folded. And uh, I was like, that was my first breaching charge kill. And I was like, that's awesome. Wow. <laughs> oh my God. But it was weird, man. Because like, you just see this dude flattened out, see the side of his face and just his eyeballs just like staring at you. Totally. I mean, he's done. So you weren't on a carpet. I was not on a carpet. I was on his insides. Interesting. Yeah. I've never felt that. But he, dude, folded. His back had to bend right on that wall. Like he had to be like on it. That's I, I can't even I can't even picture it, to be honest with you. It, it was uh it was weird. It was weird, but cool at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. Like, don't shoot at us. <laughs> <laughs> or this is gonna happen. Right. <clears throat> what was the op tempo over there in Afghanistan? It was it was it was big. I mean it was it was a lot. It was fast. It was we went out a lot, a lot. And the targets, they weren't like cheesy targets. They were like they weren't like one or two guys. They were like a lot of guys. Um, like how many? We did one. Uh, these guys took over um, whatever cell, whatever whoever they were, uh, bad guys took over a school, and there was probably I think there was eleven, eleven got bad guys on that one. I mean they were just everywhere. We had another time standing right by a door. And I moved positions. And about a minute later, ISR looking down, saw 30, I I can't remember, it was like 30 to 50 men run out of the door I was standing. And like went down and went down uh, to the draw and back up. They were getting away because they knew we were there. Wow. Poured out right where I was. I was so mad. I was like, dude, that was a lot of kills I just missed. Yeah. I was like, dang it. <laughs> Damn. But dude, I mean, it was it was real. Like there was like it wasn't, you know, ones and twosies. It was um like dudes like gathered together to go fight. That's who it was. It was different. It was different in Afghanistan than Iraq. I mean, Iraq had some targets where there's a lot of dudes, but not 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 like what I saw in Afghanistan. Were you on the operation that Adam Brown got killed? Okay, so before about two weeks before we, I was actually going to go to um, an outstation for that one. Two weeks before is when I got custody of my my three kids. So I my command uh, my head shed knew I was like I can't I can't deploy. I was like I'm going to be out of this command. They're leaving me, and they just uh, pretty much told me like Hey, on this deployment, figure out how to be a dad. They left me alone. I was alone learning how to be a dad that whole time. And about halfway through, I get a call about two in the morning from my team leader who was had to stay back too because he had to get surgery done on knee or shoulder or something. And uh, he's like, Adam just passed. And um, and I was with Adam at team two, mm-hmm. green team. I remember you guys were really tight when you showed up to our platoon in Afghanistan. Yeah, he, he's just a good dude to be around. Yeah. He was just fun to be around. His stories... Uh, he, he, I mean, nothing, some things might've slowed him down. Nothing stopped him. I mean, when he lost his eye, I was right at the top of the stairs as he was coming up. I was next to the guy that shot him in Afghanistan. When he lost his fingers, I was the one that put his fingers back on and tried to wrap them up the best I could. Uh, I knew Adam well, he was a he was a he, dude, legend. He had a great energy about him. Great. You know, and uh, he was, I don't think he was always a stand up guy, but he, he be, became a stand up guy. He did. I never knew him previous to, mm-hmm. to when he was a stand up guy. He was just a picture perfect 
team guy. I was very upset all the time because uh, I wasn't doing what I wanted to do. He had a great way of kind of mitigating that, re-motivating me, and uh, I learned a lot from him. And we also had a conversation last night at dinner about, <clears throat> and I've had this conversation with several other um, former work colleagues or guests on the show, and I mean, Adam was, he was just a, he's a great role model for any human. Oh my God, yeah. And he yeah. wasn't, he wasn't a shithead team guy like me or like you who was, I mean, I, I'll speak for myself, who was boozing, bar fighting, womanizing, yeah. pills, yep. everything uh, that you shouldn't be doing, I was doing. Adam wasn't that. Adam was a family man. Adam cared about his kids deeply, he spent a lot of time with him. He's, he was he was he was a man of God. He made you wonder why. He yes, was like that. That's yes. He made me Christ curious. He was one of the guys. I was like, and he. You're right. Everything you just said. You're absolutely right. He was he was different. Why him? A lot of a lot of yeah. it seems to me like a lot of the guys yeah. that die in combat. It's like. Why the fuck wasn't that me? Or why wasn't that Eddie? Or why wasn't why wasn't that the guy that's fucking three other chicks on the side and not paying attention to his wife? It's always the stand up good example to others yeah. that winds up dying. Do do you feel that? Yeah, I question that a lot. Yeah, I'm, I'm I question you know a guy that seeks God. Why why that? But I've also learned that when we look to God and like, why would you do this? That well, there, there's another, there's a thing out there called evil mm -hmm. that can get into evil men, and and I don't. And it goes back to lean not on your understanding. It's really not up to us to more our business to even know why. Yeah, we like to think of it, but I but I don't know why. And maybe with his book Fearless, the lives that he's changing by his story. Maybe that's why. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know these answers. Well, I mean, I, I like to think about this stuff, you know. And, yeah, and, um, yeah. It's, It'll get you to go down this little thing called a rabbit hole. It will. <laughs> it will. And then, you know, when you think about it and, and everybody everybody has their time and everybody has their, their place. Yeah. And they make their mark. And he made you Christ curious, which kind of formed you into who you are today, which you're spreading a very positive message and it's impacting thousands of people and maybe you wouldn't have gotten there without knowing yeah. Adam you know and now you are carrying that torch but it's a big torch yeah it's a big torch but um can you talk about that night that he all? passed yeah even though you weren't there I, I you know I know the story I think it was like in a tree or on a fan or on a wall or something like that and then got nailed from an adjacent building but I don't know the details. I'm, I'm, I was told, but I don't recall. I just know on my side, got the call, and we started drinking at 2 in the morning when I woke up and just started doing shots. And I'm like, not again. Another guy, and again. And I'm like, man, like it just seemed like every deployment we were losing dudes. It's like, you know, you question yourself, like, is our tactics wrong? Like, what are we doing wrong? It was just... You know, it's war. It's war. It's not supposed to go the way you think. It's just not. I mean, that's why we do contingencies. That's why you have multiple LZs when you infill, right? Because if this one's messed up, we're going to go over here. Because <laughs> nothing goes as planned. We. It's, it's, what does Mike Tyson say? Everyone has a great plan until they get punched in the face. Mm -hmm. It's very true. War is no different, you know, just like business. We're so set on this. You can't be set on this. You got to flow. You got to yeah. flow. You got to move. What's the recovery time after over at Development Group? What's the recovery time for the next operation if you do take a loss? I think the ones that I was, I'm sure it's always different, you know. Um, not long, maybe two to three days. That's it? I think so. How do you send the guys off? We usually do a wood-like stand, which 
just turns out to be a cross. You know, you put our put their gear on it, their uh, their carrier plate carrier, and then we put their helmet on top. And one thing I've learned is we won't mess with it. I remember with one of the guys, and we'll just keep it. I mean, just the blood, the you know, the, you know those pads and the Mitch helmets, they soak up, they soak up blood. If you would like press on it, blood would just seep out. It was covered. Every one of the pads, you know, you got the different pads you can move around based on your head shape and com comfortability. It was just covered with blood. And you put that helmet on and the, the weight of the helmet and you can just see the blood trickling down this wood stand. And it's just like, oh my God, man. Then you got the rifle out there. And I think we put the boots out there and we put them right by the flagpole and they stay there. After we lost those guys, they would go with us every every deployment. We would make it. We'd bring it. Holy shit. And um, you lose your guy. You get the alcohol that they have. And the next morning, because you're, you know, you're running ops at night. And um, next, you know, it's daytime by, you know, by you get everything done. And you get in a circle with those still there in bottles just get passed around you take it and you pass it another one comes you take it and you do that until every bottle is dry and the crazy thing about that is you don't feel anything you don't feel it i don't you recall don't. feeling it i don't recall feeling the drunkenness the buzz it was just empty fluid it was you just don't you're not there. Your brain's not there, man. Your brain is shut off and it's like just shuts it down. And uh, then you walk around questioning everything, questioning all of it. Why? Why? The, the, you know, the why. A lot of guys start to question why we were there in the first place. Do you question that? Again... At the time, no, I was like, hey, we're, we're, we're fighting bad guys. Like, we're going to get the bad guys. I was like, yeah, I was sold on it all. Now, knowing government and agendas, I question a lot of it, if not all of it. I question a lot of it. I do too. And, and I hate saying that. I love this country more than, I mean, more than anything. But one thing I've realized is that government officials, you aren't the country if you're doing your shady crap. You're nothing but a terrorist. You're the exact same thing that we were hunting down over there. You're just domestic. That's why we do our oath, right? Foreign and domestic. There's a reason for that. And we can see the reason. So, yeah. I, uh... A lot of it's BS now. And it hurts. Yeah. Thought you're really part of something. Thought you're making a difference. Which... In a roundabout sort of way you are. You're killing, you know, you're killing the bad guys. They're not, can beef up and get stronger. But I, I don't, I think it's all comes down to an agenda. And, and unfortunately, I don't think we're ever going to find out what that is. I don't either. But, yeah. But I totally agree with you. I don't, yeah. Let's move on to your family life. Cool. So you missed a deployment. Yep. Got custody of the kids. Yep. Got custody of the kids. How did you get custody of the kids? So around the deployment storm of leaving and going, she, when we were separated, she's like, hey, her, her family lived out in Tennessee here. And she's like, I want to go out there, take the kids and live with my parents and get on my feet and go to school. And I was always gone, always gone. And the shooting school that we go to quite a bit was right, right by c close to where her uh where she would be and i was like hey just let me talk to him when i want to talk to him and this was this wasn't like a okay sure like i had to really think about this one and uh, i was really thinking about her well-being and the kids i'm like i'm always gone i'm like this train ain't stopping which which it did <laughs> but um yeah i was like I th maybe this is the best thing is for her to go because i really wanted her to get on her feet take care of those kids, be a role model and do the right thing. So they had a good example. So she goes out there, radio silence, couldn't text, couldn't call, nothing. The only thing that I could in like a span of maybe 
I don't, I don't know how long it was, a few weeks, a month, two months maybe, as I was out um, in Oklahoma and I drove six hours to get my kids. And she's like, she's like, you have two hours. If they're not back in two hours, I'm calling the cops on you. And I did not want to deal with that being where I was. So as a good little boy, I dropped him off in two hours and drove my six hours back. I took him out to dinner or like a early lunch or something like that, or early dinner. And that was it. And I was like, this is enough. So I went to my lawyer. I was like, here's what's happening. This is, this is BS. Like, let's, we got to do something. So we get her to court and she paints this beautiful picture for her, horrible for me, of how I caused her to do this. I'm the reason for all of it. And she was probably right. But I mean, all blame was on me on the other side of, you know, of the, the, of the tables. And I'm like, and I was, and I'm like, that's not true. That's not, and I just wanted to speak out so bad as she's, she's telling this amazing Academy Award winning acting scenario. And, uh, but I had one card to play and I knew she was not clean. And she was saying she was clean. And before we went in there, I told my lawyer, drug test, drug test her. And I'm like, I volunteer myself. I will totally do a drug test. I know I'm clean. Let's go. So at the end of all these stories, my lawyer doesn't say, they, they asked me a couple questions and I said, I will stop deploying. I was, I was in there in court in a suit with a full beard, shaggy. I looked like, you know, the caveman from the Geico commercial. Mm-hmm. I pretty much looked like that dude. Like trying to get my children. Just all I wanted her to do was I wanted 50-50 custody to move back to Virginia Beach. That's it. I didn't want full custody. I still wanted to work. Like, I figured, like, I could still do, you know, get both of get both of uh, both best worlds. Both of the best worlds. And um, so I, t- I tell him I'll stop. I'll do a training position, all this stuff. And uh, he awarded her to stay out there. And he just, all he said was, hey... If he wants to talk to him, he gets to talk to him. If he wants to see him, you make it happen that he can see his children. End of story, period. And so my lawyer before was like, hey, drug, we request a drug test. And the judge said, Roger that. So we both, I didn't even, she didn't even want me to do one because she knew better. She did it and she popped. And um, she lied. So everything she said was BS. So the judge told the lawyers, you need to move back to Virginia Beach right now. And uh, she refused. Her lawyer dropped her. And the judge found out about this and told my lawyer to go, tell I to go get his kids. I was deploying in two weeks. Holy shit. Are my you command serious? knew about it all. My command yeah. knew about it. I, I kept him informed. I was like, hey. And no, one, no one's like, team guy's not going to get his kids. I, I'm, like, I'm not getting my kids. That was the last thing I thought would ever happen. And uh, I had a choice to get my kids or keep deploying. And to be transparent, I had to think about that. Yeah. And it wasn't a long thought. It was maybe a few minutes, but it wasn't like, yes, awesome, I get my kids. It was like my world was closing up really thing. I mean, really, really fast. And it was, it was rough. That world closing up had, had sharp edges and it was hurting. And my identity as a seal, which I live by, was 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 dissipating really fast. Um, so I asked that I asked if I could do one more deployment. <laughs> my lawyer was like, "No." So I got my kid. I went out there. My mom and my stepdad met me out there. I got my kids, and we drove back to Virginia Beach and went back to the house that I was going to let, let her have because it was where the kids grew up. Started to refurnish all that because she took everything out, like everything. Like I had no birth certificates. I had no social security cards. I had no shot records. I had nothing. I had a bag per kid. I had no idea how my 10-month-old, what diapers he had minus what was in there. I had no idea what he ate, what formula, nothing. She gave me nothing. She told me nothing. Zero. I had to start fresh on everything, getting birth certificates and all this stuff and just figuring it out, refurnishing a whole house, getting groceries. I didn't, I had to ask him like, what do you guys eat? I don't, I don't remember. I didn't know oh, what they ate. Man. I, so I how, old, how old are your kids at this? Your son's 10 months old. 10 months old. Sammy, my uh, middle child, she was five and Kayla was nine or 10. I think she was 10. So, I mean, Kayla stepped up the plate.
and she um she's a rock star putting those kids through that life dealing with honestly a turd dad that all he cared about himself is not fair it was not fair at all but they got strong, man. I had some strong, strong kids. And uh, we, we did it, man. I mean, my my thought process was like, all right, just keep them alive. Don't let them die. That was everything, man. Just like, don't don't let them die. And um, we made it through. And, my, and the command was super cool with me. Figure it out. Figure it out. Started coming back. Uh, in a little bit working in, in the breacher cell, like just picking locks and, you know, doing some RSOing stuff. And um, but they let me like, hey, figure out how to be a dad. And and I did and, you know, started to come into work a little bit more. And then after about a year of that, maybe two, I, about a year, uh, we were going back out on deployment. My boys were going back out on deployment and my kids, their summer break was coming up and we worked out, I worked out with their mother, like, hey, since you never see them, you could have them for a few weeks in the in the summer. Because the kids still need to see their biological mom, they just need to. And so I realized that we deploy a week after my kids are gone. So about a month out, month or two, a few months out, I, I talked to my old team leader or to the command, I'm like, can I, can I, can I jump in and hear, and they're like, how can you? And I explained it and they're like, okay, cool. So I started training with them. They trained locally. I tried to jump in with them, go to the range shooting, do CQB together, do any, uh, I would have babysitters come by, watch the kids. I'd go do a training exercise, come back. You know, dad's all freaking opt out. And um, I deployed that, that was my last deployment. I think I was gonna do a, it was like a 45 or 60 day deployment just to, because my kids were coming back. They had to come back for school. And three days before, I was going to rotate out to come back home. Extortion happened. Oh, man. And um, we were supposed to go out that night. So we were in Jabad, Jalalabad, and they were in, I can't remember where they were, but they were, we had the birds or, or something like our, our 160th guys. We had weather or something. They couldn't, they couldn't, they couldn't fly. So we didn't go. So, they couldn't get our birds, so they used National Guard ones to go do their op. And I remember being in my, you know, we got a deployment, you got all your individual rooms, and you got like a common area where, you know, the coffee's made, and you got the video games, and you watch TV, and got the couches. I remember sitting in there with my freaking feet propped up, just chilling, watching, probably Rescue Me or something, some, something good. And uh, my team leader comes in, he's like, hey, your bird just went down. And he's like, it's our, it's our boy's bird. Like there was two of them. One of them had all our guys. Another one had just the air crew. Devastating, regardless of which one was shot down. So obviously we're hoping it's the one without our boys. Less lives lost, right? So we all like rush over um, and they got it up, pulled up on, I can't remember if we were starting to get our gear on or we were trying to get SA situation awareness of what was going on. But I remember watching the TV screen, like this huge monitor, and they had uh, the thermal uh, from ISR looking down, and you could see the helicopter down. And uh, there was bodies spilled out of the backside at, of the open ramp of the, of the 47. And I remember seeing, like in the thermal, you know, heat signatures are white, right? Mm -hmm. um, and you could see their white bodies slowly, slowly turned to black and their life was leaving them and they, they were gone. So we see that we finally like figure out like, hey, we need to get in there. Once we finally got it, like crap, that is our bird. That is our boys. Like we need to go. So we all go get our gear on. We're grabbing quickie saws in case we got to cut dudes out. We're grabbing anything and everything that we think for this rescue operation slash keeping the enemy at bay. And uh, they wouldn't let us go out. They were sending the Rangers and the decision was made by our CO. And at that time I wanted to, I wanted to, I wanted to stick my fist through his face. I was like, how, how dare you? That's our boys. That, that, that how, how dare you? 
but thinking about it now, always hindsight, right? Uh, he didn't want he didn't want those images to be our last images of those guys. Uh, but you know, some of the Rangers more than capable of, of taking care of that. They did a great job. They were out there for probably I think three days dealing with that, getting the bodies. So we get the bodies back, and we had you know, I think it was a total of like thirty eight or something like that. Um, and they had, we had two C-17s to get all these bodies back to Dover. And it was my time to go back a three, a couple days later. So I just, that was one of the guys that, there was like four of us, escorted all the bodies back to Dover to meet the family members of all these guys. And when I was over there, I somehow, I was told by my team leader, because the command was got in touch with everyone, and work, Jason Workman's, really sneaks up on you. Jason Workman's wife and family wanted me to... Workman was my boy. Wanted me to escort his body back uh, to Blanding, Utah for memorial service. And then... Take him to Arlington where he was going to be put in the ground. So, of course, I would, wouldn't refuse that. So, I talked to the doctor or, or whatever who was dealing with the bodies. And I had him point out workmen's. And most of the bodies were, you couldn't, they were charred. They couldn't, you couldn't tell who they were. But workmen had some tattoos. And they, they he, he showed me his casket. So, steel caskets. And, um... I put my, my ground pad uh, next to him, put my sleeping bag next to him, sat there, laid there, ate there. And you know how they always tell you like on takeoff, like, please sit down, buckle up. They wouldn't dare ask that. Just lay there the whole time next to him, put my back on his casket and just escort him all the way back, get to Dover. And then we land, the whole family's there, and just seeing. <sighs> Got a whole new bucket to bust out with my therapist when I get back. <laughs> just to see the families, man, and their faces. And, um, and the tears, and the kids that had no clue Man. that their dad's gone, their uncle's gone. It was the most, it was traumatic. It was traumatic to try to find words to comfort them. And those words, they were hard to come by, if, if any. What do you say by I know, I know. I'm sorry. He was awesome. What do you what do you say? And um then Obama came out and we and and I'm not a fan of his policies or anything whatsoever. I'm not a fan of him at all. But I will tell you this. He greeted and shook everyone's hand in that room, and there was a lot of people. He went to every single person. And I was like, I was like, that's cool. I was like, regardless of what, what BS you're involved with, I was like, that was cool. And when we went to the hangar to offload the C-17s with all these caskets, flag draped, he stood um, at a hand salute, a very crisp one, the whole time. That dude did not move. And we were like going on like three days no sleep. I mean, we're sitting down because we're like exhausted. Our backs are killing us from the pain of just operating. And that dude did not move. He was just crisp. Did not move for 45 minutes. Like nothing. The whole time. And as much as I don't agree with his policies and all the 
corruption I think that he's maybe involved in. I he earned some respect to, for me on that day, for that for showing that right there to the respect for those men. I have to give that to him. I have to. I saw it with my own eyes. Um. So after that, they have to do their autopsies and try to put body parts with whoever. I mean, gosh, however you do that. I mean, there was caskets coming back, which is body parts. Like, no names, just body parts, legs, hands, heads. Cast, like, I think there was like two caskets full of this. So I had time. I went back to um, Virginia Beach. I got my blues. Stayed one night. I had my girlfriend at the time. Flew in from Oklahoma. Stayed one night. Went back up to Dover to catch an angel flight with Jason. And um, so we get on the bird and there's another casket that gets on. I'm kind of confused. I've never done an angel flight before. And it was a uh, an army guy that passed at a different operation. And his little escort was on there too. So we fly, we drop them off. I think it was in St. Louis. They get off and then it's just Jason and I um, went on to Blanding. And I just remember just like staring at his casket, like just, attempting to process things. And I, and I just couldn't. And uh, when I got to Blanding, his brothers were there. He's got uh, three brothers and his mom and his dad. And they're an amazing family, amazing family. And his, his wife and his son, Jax, who was the same age as my son, Tristan. So that made it worse, seeing that, seeing him. And um, and we had, you know, we had a memorial service out there and we I was out there with him for two weeks because there's all these memorial services going around because there's so many guys. And our command like chartered a huge bus, I think a couple buses, and they're just hitting all these spots. And we were like two weeks in line. And I'm just sitting out there with his brothers. And every night, what do you do? You get tore up. Drinking, suppressing, stuffing. Because I know what to do. There's not, a, there's not a manual out there that tells you what to do. Because no one knows what you're feeling. No one knows your insides. We can put a scientific name to it, but they don't know. They don't know. And everyone handles things differently. And mine was drinking. <laughs> to the point of passing out every night so I could sleep because I would not sleep if I didn't have something or at least that's what I thought maybe I just developed a habit I don't know but I I felt like I had to have it to think about Mike Nate Louie Adam two troop on extortion Josh Harris Colin Thomas guys that I did training with so I mean Axelson and buds with him. Like, just the, just the numbers of, like, all these guys I went to training with, and now they're all gone. And it's like, I knew before I went that that was going to be my last deployment. But that was, like, I was like, okay, I need to st stop the Eddie show and think about your kids. And I did not want to do that. I did not want to get off that train. It's like the train was going on, the operator gets left at the train station, but the identity is gone. So um, finally had his memorial service out there in Blanding, and uh, one of the guys at the command, Jason loved Robert Earl Keane, you know, if, if you're familiar, he's an awesome singer. And uh, I, I didn't even know anything about him until Jason you know, got me. He'd always come over to my trailer when we were in Baghdad, that second deployment. That was his first. And we'd watch movies and, you know, drink and all that stuff. And uh, he, we'd, we'd play Robert O'Keen. Someone reached out to Robert, kind of explained the situation. He shows up at the memorial service, gets up on stage, sings uh, Come Coming Home. And finish the song. Everyone's in tears. No one clapped. 
no one did anything. He got his guitar, sat down in the most classy way I've ever seen. Like he, um, he just, you know, gave his respect. No questions asked. From what I understand, that that conversation was like, I'll be there. It was no, oh, are you going to cover this? It was none of that. It was like, I'm there. Like that was one of my fans and he did that and he was doing this. I'm there. That is America. Yeah. That is America. That is respect. That is how you earn it by example. And that man is an example. He is a phenomenal, phenomenal man. Never talked to him. I don't need to. I watch it. I watch his actions. The way he handled himself. He didn't want to do signatures. He didn't want to do anything. He just walked in with his Johnny Cash all black suit on, played that guitar, sang a song that Jason was definitely smiling down on, did what he came to do, left. And then after the memorial service that night, we went to a place called Spirit Cove, drank, of course, and just talked Jason's stories and had fun. The buses were there from all the all the people going to all these memorial services. I mean, we're, we're just like, can you imagine this? Like, it's just death. You're just consumed with death. I can't imagine that. You're just, you're consumed. Everyone's like crying. You drink too much, you're crying. You're not drinking, you're crying. You're like, but you don't know what to do with yourself. It's like, what do I do with my hands? <laughs> you know what I mean? It's just like, you just don't know. And uh, after that, it was time for him to go back to Arlington. So we go back to Arlington and... Um, we're, we're, we're there and they've got them all lined up next to each other. All the guys that decided to go to Arlington and, and Jason was right next to Millsy. He was a really good friend with. And uh, Stacy and Jason had this thing for rainbows. And sure enough, she looks back. I'm kind of standing behind them. You know, we've got Jax and i got Stacy, family. And I'm kind of behind them. And she looks back to ask a question or something. And she just looks at me. She like pauses. She gets like a weird look on her face. And she goes. There's a rainbow behind you. Wow. I turn around. And it was the. Uh, brightest. Most colorful rainbow I've ever seen. And that rainbow stands for one thing and one thing only. And I'll tell you this much, it ain't homosexuality. It's a covenant that God gave. And just seeing that, I was done. I was taken out at the knees. Emotions took over that I was stuffing and stuffing and stuffing. And trying to be a pillar of strength for his family. I was just standing behind them, hoping they would not look back at me. Bawling. It took me out. It was like, internally took me out. I was done. So the, we do the service, you know, do the, put the trident on the, on the coffin. I had a couple extra, uh, I had another, Tried and had to do Millsy's, put one on him and then put one on Jason. And then went back home. And uh, the kids weren't home yet. And the rest, it started to go downhill. More downhill than before. Did that rainbow you saw, did you start to believe in Christ more? Was that a sign I, for you? I, I didn't think about God then. I didn't think about God then. I, I, you know, I chalk it up to, what a coincidence. How weird. You know, it's because of the rain and the sun, and that's what happens, right? You get a rainbow. I didn't, I didn't put the two together. I didn't give it the time of my thought. Um... It came right after that. Um, I had to leave the command. I was at the breaching cell, and I, and I knew I had to do something. I think I was at my, I was like at 16 and a half years in, 17 years, and I'm like, dude, I got to finish this out. I got to get my retirement. Like, I'm not going to stop, but I couldn't operate. So I found out about the coordinator position that they had around the country, 
Uh, you familiar, were you familiar with that? I'm not. So you kind of like, you got mentors, like they're usually retired, like SEAL, SWIG, EOD, divers, uh, air rescue guys. And you, I think there's like, there was like 28 around the country. And the point of the whole, or, the, the program was, is to help train guys up, get them some more awareness about what they're about to go do. Because we were losing, the Navy was losing so much money about guys showing up, the water's cold and they quit. Well, the Navy just paid for you to go out here. Now they got to pay for you to go somewhere else. So they're like, we'll start these programs and you kind of like run them through the ringer, give them workouts a couple times a week, kind of answer questions, kind of give them some mindsets, mindset stuff, talk to them about some mental toughness. And I remember my first workout, I had like, there was, I think there was probably like 10 of these like high school, maybe like a college or two kids there. They were like in tears and every one of them quit. And I was like, am I being too tough? <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I'm like, and I didn't know. And, but my job was like, hey, man, like you need to know where you're going. And if you're, you're quitting now, you're for sure going to quit out there. Like I'm, I'm saving you. I would like, I'm saving you. But the recruiting command, it's like, you got to have this amount of number. You got to have this many. And I sort of told him like, that's ridiculous. Like you cannot force these programs on individuals. They have got to have their heart and soul into it. That's, that's it. It doesn't work any other way. There is no, I think I might try that. It just doesn't work. I mean, you weren't like that. No. I know for a fact you weren't like that. You got to be all in. You have to be all in. And uh, and I didn't, you know, it, it was ridiculous, that whole recruiting piece. Like, you guys are like, morons uh, to, like, if you get, like, you have to. And, like, you're just, like, making people go, like, all right, cool. Like, if you need something, like, we'll give this guy a shot. That's totally going to wash out. And they do. They wash out in boot camp. And uh, so we did that. So during that time, drinking got horrible because I was away from my guys. And I was just on an island. I was in Tulsa, Oklahoma. No friends. Uh, I think she was my fiance at the time, my children. It seemed like the right thing to do moving out there because I could help with my kids and then try to build my business. I started a contingent group. I worked on my degree, got my degree in security management. Uh, because it was 100% tuition assistant, like, why not do it? Like, I was just, you know, trying to do anything and everything to, like, to try to stay busy, uh, to, like, not think about the past that I was not involved with anymore, which, which, which hurt. Was it hard for you to leave the command at that point, or were you ready? I did not want to leave. You didn't want to I leave? I did not want to leave. I did not want to leave. But I knew it was the time for me to leave. And looking at my kids... And thinking about them over me, which was hard to do, to be honest, it was the, it was the right thing to do. I, I wasn't going to try to do more deployments, pawn them off on this, try to figure out a sitter for this trip. or the, I, I just like, they needed a dad. And uh, I tried to step up to that, and, I, and I, um, I messed up a lot of things as a father. I didn't know what to do. I just didn't know what to do. I remember the kids would come home and I didn't know what to do with them. Like, what do you do with these kids? Like, you're not going to work on my gear with me. Like, what do we do? You know, and then you just kind of, and then I like dug back to my childhood. Like, what did I like to do? Let's go play wolf of ball in the back. Let's go play tag. Dark hide and seek. Um, and just like started to make sense slowly. And then my uh, girlfriend at the time, she was a Christian. Go to church all the time. Would talk about God. And I would just kind of like, you know, Go back to my childhood. When I would, we had a long distance relationship. She was in Tulsa when I was in Virginia Beach. And when I would go out there, it would, you know, sometimes I'd stay as long as I could. So she'd go to church Sunday morning. I'd have her drop me off at a bar so I could drink and watch the Cincinnati Bengals play football. Well, she went to church. I wouldn't go to church with her. I didn't want to go to church with her. I did not want to go in there. I knew... The things I would hear were going to strike me like a lightning bolt. And I didn't want to deal with it. I, 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 I started to feel it kind of like, no. And, and I did that for quite a few times. I was like, drop me off. I'm not going with you. And I, I, I kind of told her, like, here's why. Like, she's like, that's not like that. It's, and I'm like, you don't know. You don't know. I do. You don't know. I do. And, uh... It kind of came to a head once I moved out. You know, I was doing the coordinator position, starting contingent group. 
it came to a head. We went out to, uh, we left Tulsa, went to Oklahoma City for her work. Her brother, who was her boss, had a, um, like a work party. Had like a party bus. Meet at this bar at five. We're going to go all night, have a good time. Right up my alley. So five o'clock comes, Captain and Coke. And somewhere around nine-ish, ten-ish, I guess I'm blacked out. I had one of her co-workers giving me lap dance right there in the bar in front of her, all her colleagues. And she pulls me outside, and I think she pulls me outside. And uh, she's like, you're hammered. Like, you are a mess. And I straight up said, word for word, I will cut your fucking face off. Classy, right? You said that to her. I said that to her. With her brother slash boss right there. I didn't care. I didn't care. And of course, literally, I didn't mean that. But in my brain, that's exactly what I was doing. Right, and I looked as I looked into her eyes. That's exactly what I was picturing. And um, that's one thing crazy about killing, I guess, is when you you know, and you're engaging, and some of those engagements are close, real close, not sniper shots at a thousand yards, but like, come here, dude. And you're holding dead bodies as they fade. And you see those eyes looking at your eyes. You see the whites of their eyes. And uh, you just watch the life drain from their bodies. And you love it. Picturing that was not a problem. Picturing that was a joy. And I would never do that to her, but in that moment, hammered. I was doing it in my brain. And uh, the next the next day, I end up at my house because uh, we were living in two different houses. I woke up by myself in my clothes with shoes on, on the couch, and knew this was not good. <laughs> yeah. And knew this was not good. And she came over, and she goes, do you remember last night? And I go, absolutely not. And she tells me the story I just told you. And uh, we were engaged at that time. She took her ring off, threw it at me. And she said, I want this in my life or in my family's because she had, she had two kids as well. And I couldn't say anything because she was right. I had some things I needed to work out. So it's probably a good time for a break. Let's take a break. Right. The Jihadi Manifesto was recorded right before his December suicide bombing, which killed seven CIA employees and a Jordanian agent at this base in eastern Afghanistan. So everybody wasn't supposed to be outside there. It was just supposed to be the GRS team to meet him. Uh, Darren and the Jordanian uh, officer were supposed to be there. And that's it. That was a last minute thing there. Everybody comes out to, to form a greeting line. And unfortunately, that gets a lot of people killed that wouldn't have otherwise been dead today. We will get you CIA team. Inshallah, we will get you down. And he boastfully showed off the trigger for the bomb strapped to his body. Look, this is for you. It's not watch. It's a detonator. To kill as much as I can. Unbeknownst to them, there's like, let's go out and form this meet and greet line. I don't know if you know this. I mean, we worked at the same department over at CIA. I want to give a big thank you out right now to all the Vigilance Elite patrons out there that are watching the show right now. 
Just want to say thank you guys. You are our top supporters and you're what makes this show actually happen. If you're not on Vigilance Lead Patreon, I want to tell you a little bit about what's going on in there. So, we do a little bit of everything. There's plenty of behind the scenes content from the actual Sean Ryan show. On top of that, basically what I do is I take a lot of the questions that I get from you guys or the patrons and then I turn them into videos. So we get, right now there's a lot of concern about self-defense, home defense, crimes on the rise all throughout the country, actually all throughout the world. And so we talk about everything from how to prep your home, how to clear your home, how to get familiar with a firearm, both rifle and pistol, for beginners and advanced. We talk about mindset, we talk about defensive driving. We have an end of the month live chat that I'm on at the end of every month where we can talk about whatever topics you guys have. It's actually done on Zoom. You might enjoy it, check it out. And if Zoom's not your thing, or you don't like live chats, like I said, there's a library of well over 100 videos on where to start with prepping, all the firearm stuff, pretty much anything you can think of, it's on there. So anyways, go to www.patreon.com slash Vigilance Elite, or just go in the link in the description. It'll take you right there. And if you don't want to, and you just want to continue to watch the show, that's fine too. I appreciate it either way. Love you all. Let's get back to the show. Thank you. All right, Eddie, we're back from the break. This has been a very heavy interview. It's been tough. Yeah, I, but I know. It's all right. It's I know. This is going to help a lot of people. I hope so. But um, let's get... We talked about, you know, you left Dev Group, you're at home, you broke up with the ex fiance or she broke up with you. What's going on with the kids at home? Uh, just, you know, trying to do dad life, whatever, whatever the heck that is, trying to figure it out. And I mean, this is, this took years of struggling and still drinking. Uh, I quit drinking. After that night, when I told her I was going to cut her face off, um, I quit drinking for almost a year, I think. I quit drinking. And, and the reason why I quit drinking is she had me, or she gave me an ultimatum to go to this certain conference, but we'll, we'll get to that in a second. But uh, I mean, kids are at school doing their thing. Um, I would do, you know, during the day I would do contingent group work or schooling or go, you know, train these kids to go to uh, one of the special programs in the Navy. And uh, then they come home and, you know, try to figure out how to entertain these kids, make what's for dinner, all that stuff. It's just all the, the mundane stuff of life. Um, Before you quit drinking, would you try to hide your drinking from your children? I would do... I think I would put it sometimes in a different cup, like just like a normal cup that I'd be using, but usually no, I didn't. And I usually did not, I would have like a glass, like with dinner okay. or something, but usually that stuff would start when they were in bed. I would bust open the wine, usually the wine, and down a bottle, sometimes two, and then go to sleep. But I usually, I mean, there was times where I was like, I don't care. Like, I need it. I need it, right? Yeah. Um, so, but most of it took place when they were asleep. What kind of pills were you on? Uh, I had to get a lot of surgeries after I left um, Dev Group. So I had to get my knee done, my foot, some hernias, both shoulders. Had to get some anchors put in. Um, so they'd give you, you know, oxycodone, cotton, whatever the heck you want to call it. And I fell in love with that stuff, dude. I was like so happy. It was like my happy pills. And I would take those, try to get more if I could. And uh, I would take it all, all the time it, until I, until the prescriptions ran out. I would just keep doing that. But that was really the only pills I would like, like I think I need surgery on this. Like it's bad and come to find out it is bad. Um, just to get some more of those pills. Um, but mostly I would do like nighttime mucinex. You, you were getting, you were doing surgery just to get the pills. 
Yeah, there was like, there'd be time like I could deal with the pain. It really wouldn't be bad. Like maybe I'll deal with it later. But at the same time, I'm like, oh, let's just do it now. Like I love surgery. I love being put under. It just escapes reality. And the pills, those pills are nice. Yeah. But then they would always run out. And um, I would do um, a lot of nighttime mucinex because I learned that they would give me extremely vivid dreams. So I would do, you know, one, and then I would have my dreams. The next night I'd do one, you know, one teaspoon or one little capful. And then when I wouldn't have my dreams, I'd up it to two. And I would do two. And then when I wouldn't have my dreams, I would up to three. And then so on and so forth. And then I was like, okay, I, gotta, I stop this. But my dreams, every single night, I was killing people in my dreams. Buddies would die. Um, I was killing bad guys. And I was like... My war, but my battle was like in my dreams, just over and over again. It was always in the back of a heli helicopter, and there's just big bodies, and just like see the guys coming at me, and I was just like like a video game taking them out. Sometimes my gun would stop working, and they were like advancing, and then I'd wake up. Uh, <clears throat> you enjoyed those dreams. Yeah, I did. That was back in the fight. Yeah, is. Pathetic as it sounds to say right now, I was in the fight in my head. And, um, yeah. How long did that go on for? Uh, quite a while. Um, the drinking mixed with that stuff wasn't a great thing. And I don't know exactly when I quit drinking. Uh, I think it was after, but when after the cutting of the face thing happened. I pretty much had the ultimatum, ultimatum by my uh, girlfriend at the time now because she threw me the, threw the ring back at me. Is she wanted me to go to this like Christian camp, uh, which I didn't know was a Christian camp really. I mean, I kind of knew, but it just sounded like the way it was sold to me or told to me was, hey, it's a bunch of dudes you do a bunch of shooting, a uh, bunch of food, talk about some stuff. Like a, it's like a men's retreat. And I had no friends, so I was like, I mean, and it was kind of like, hey, you do this or else, like this, there's no hope for us. I was like, all right, I'll I'll do that, and because I'm like, I'm in the middle of Tulsa, by myself, I have her, kind of, and um, I was like, I'll go, but I didn't know. So this this whole thing was called. It's based off of John Eldridge. I don't know. He's got a book called Wild at Heart. For the audience, if you have not read this book, you and you're a man, or or even have a man in your life, highly recommend it. Um, it's a great book for men uh, and it kind of like kind of tells us what we're supposed to be like we're supposed to be the hero in the story and it gives us great thing and you know I'm hearing all this crap for the first time I'm like what what the heck is going on right here um, but when I go to this camp dude um, like I'm looking for alcohol like surely there's like some wine or beer like looking for coolers I open the coolers freaking sodas water I'm like what <laughs> so I'm like already I'm like this sucks so I'm sitting down, you get like your little lawn chairs, like in this open like conference area, you put your little chairs down and you got a big screen and they kind of go into it. So it's, um, it's like three days, uh, get there on a Thursday and you're done by like Sunday afternoon. And the first thing it kind of like, it goes into like, uh, father wounds, how we're the hero, you know, we're built as men to rescue the princess. Like it's in our DNA. And he kind of John Eldridge is like on this on the screen saying this it was it was gone th done through another satellite like church out of Oklahoma City, but it was via you know Colorado where John Eldridge was. And I'm like, this is this is so dumb. I'm like, what am I doing here? Like this is ridiculous. And um, he said something that really kind of like it really got me, kind of hit home a little bit. And, he, and, I, and I'm a big movie buff. You know, like when we go to deployment, we're watching nothing but movies, movies, series, movies, movies. Like we, we've got to memorize. Like we're, we're, we're the douchebags with the quotes, right? <laughs> like what movie is this from? Like we, that's just what we do. I still talk in quotes. It's ridiculous. And uh, my wife looks at me like I'm a moron and she's right. <laughs> but, uh, but he said, if you, if he's like, if you think about movies, he's like, it's built in our DNA. It, movies have three things, three elements that is in every movie. There's a hero, there's a villain, and there's a love story. And right now, people as they are listening are like trying to think of movies, and I can't, you can't think of any. 
Finding Nemo all the way to 300. There is those three components in there. Yeah. There is the hero, there is the villain, and there is a love story. And he takes that and he says, that's exactly what the word of God, the Bible is. There's Jesus, there's Satan, and it's God's grace that we're going for. It's that love, it's that heart. He wants to love us. He wants to be loved back. And he said that, and I'm like... And I was really more hung up on the movie thing. I'm like, that is so true. And he's like, the Bible's all around you. We just don't realize it. Like it's in every single movie. It's the same thing, different characters. And I was, and, and so they, they use, cause they're trying to hit home to men to like stand up to be more manly and to like stand up for the right and lead your family, which we have a, a hard time in this freaking in this country, probably across the globe. And looking at me with my children, he was right. I wasn't a leader. I was a, I was a failure. I was not doing the right things. I mean, it was a right to stand up to take care of those kids. Yeah, but I wasn't doing what I was supposed to do. I wasn't leading by example. I was leading by talk, which is BS. And um, so he teaches that and he shows movies like Braveheart, William Wallace. He had a villain, like the English, right? He was the hero, save the Scots. And it was a love story in that movie, love for the country, love for the woman, the Patriot, last of the Mohicans, all the gladiator. We, we can see it in everything. And uh, I was like, okay, I'm here. This is actually kind of cool. What's, what's this? I'm going to give it a hundred percent. So we kind of go into this stuff and um, they, they, they have classes throughout the day. And uh, I just noticed as these classes go on, there's probably like, I'd say about 100 people from the age of like 16 to like 70, of like just men, boys, whatever you want to call them. And I just start noticing every class, like dudes are getting picked off. Like they just start crying. And I'm like, I'm like, get it together, bro. Like there's other dudes around. Like suck it up, right? Mm -hmm. That's how you were taught. Um, that's how I was taught. Like suck it up, what are you doing? And uh, I didn't get it. I don't understand it. And um, I didn't like shame on you. It was more like, what's, it was more, what, what, what is, what's, what's happening? What, I, I don't have what that is. What is that? And so at the end of, I remember our end of our first course, it was the, fir the first class or the second class. They're like, all right, we, they give you some questions to like think about to kind of ask yourself like, hey, please take your notebook and your pen and this, uh, this, these questions and just go find a place outside and, you know, go pray and write down these answers. And I heard the word pray. And, and remember, if we go back to childhood, like this stuff is kind of like coming out. It gets me every time I talk about it. Um, and I was like, man, like you, 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 you pose. And I'm talking to myself here. You pose and act like you're a man. You can go overseas and face evil and take it to them. You can take a blade and stick it in some flesh, but you're going to have a hard time to go outside by yourself and pray. And I had that conversation with myself and I was like, self, you're right. <laughs> so I went out there. I found a little like uh, outcropping of some rocks and like the sun just wasn't up. It was like early. We got up like at six, six thirty, whatever. And I sat down. I said my first words to God. Ever? I mean, minus the, please don't let me die on this op tonight as we fly in or I'm getting shot at as I'm trying to be as low as possible as bullets skip over my head. Yeah, ever. I wouldn't call that. Hey God, that's what without I, fear. I need a handout. You're talking to him. I was talking fear. to him like he was my father. This gets me, man. This gets me. 
And I just started talking. I was like, I don't know you. I was like, you know my past. You know how you scare me. And soon I'm saying whatever the heck I'm saying, not even know what I'm saying, and it didn't matter. It didn't matter what I was saying. The sun breaks the top of the trees in this warm, because it was chilly, this warm sunbeam just nails my face and just warms my whole body. It just warm like right when I started talking to him, like maybe a couple sentences in. And I was like, oh my God, it's like, like I got zapped through my whole body. And um, I chalked it up to it as a coincidence. Of course, I mean, it's a, at the right time, at the right angle, sun, you know, comes up in the east, that's in the west. I mean, just that's just happened to be here. And that was it. That's all, that's all it was. And I, and I say all this in hindsight, knowing now everything. And uh, I go back in, I do my thing, I write it down. And, but something was stirring inside me. And uh, I was curious. I was, I, was, I was curious to see what these guys are crying about. I was like thinking about all my past. I would always think about why I took my hand off Louie and, and went around that corner. Um, I wanted answers. I needed answers. And I wasn't going to find answers from any human on this earth. I know that. And um, I started going through more courses, more classes, more going outside praying, trying to get better at it. But, you know, I think, I know for me personally, we always think that there's like, oh, you got to do it this way. This is the wrong way. That's not it at all. Just like talk. Just talk. God knows your heart, man. And uh, once I learned that, it's like, it just came, it just flowed. And, uh, but I thought there was like, oh, step one. Okay, step two, now that you click, go step three. And that's a bunch of BS. And uh, I started just seeing guys throughout the, the weekend get taken out and taken out and taken out. And then guys were like, may I pray for you? And I, like, I didn't tell anybody this, but in my head, I was like, I really want someone to put their hands on me and pray for me. Like, I want someone to pray for me. I don't... This weekend changed my life. Um, I don't know why I wanted someone to pray for me. All that crap. I never thought I could be forgiven, you know, forgive of your sins. I'm like, man, I've killed more people. I've done things that most people don't even dream of, think of, can't even think, concoct in their brain. I've done it. Uh, from booze to women to pills to killing Gun, knives, grenades, explosives, nothing, a anything and everything, all of it. I'm like, there's no way, there's no way you can forgive me. And um, I wanted someone to pray for me. And the last night of this thing, nothing's happening to me, really. I mean, a little bit of something, but nothing monumental. At the end of the... Um, at the end of the, um, at the, they have the bonfire and like they give you this like little post-it note. Like, hey, the things that you want to get rid of, write down what you want to get rid of. And I was like, this post-it ain't going to do it. I need like a legal pad with like 100 pages. <laughs> so I like, I'm like, give me some more of those post-its. <laughs> so I'm putting down, I wanted my drinking to go away. I wanted my anger to go away. I want a direction on how to be a good father. I didn't want to be a slave to watching porn on the freaking internet. I wanted to be there for my family. I didn't want to be absent. I wanted peace in my brain from the stuff that we went through overseas. I wanted clarity on my future. I just want to be a better man. I'd be happy with that. And, uh, you know, you get around this, you get a bunch of these dudes around the fire and you got your little piece of paper and everyone goes around, which I didn't know. And you, you say what you want to get rid of. You don't have to, but, uh, you know, about halfway through I, I got up and, you know, I said my thing and I, I got choked up. I got really choked up and I threw it in the fire and it felt good. It felt good. And, um, 
I'm like, you know, it's still in my head. I'm just like, this is stupid. It's a piece of paper, blah, blah, blah. Nothing's going to change. Questioning everything, testing everything, not believing anything. Uh, but there was still just something tugging on my heart. There was just something very small just tugging on me. Enough to keep me engaged. And uh, I was walking away from the fire when they, like everyone went. And I was like, all right, I'm going to get out of here. Like, I just, like, want to be alone and just go do something. Go to bed, whatever. I had no Mucinex. I had no alcohol. Like, how do I do this? <laughs> um, and this guy comes up to me, young guy. I was pro I think I was 32 when this all happened. He was 26. His name, uh, Kyle Thompson. He actually has a podcast, Undaunted. Um, and he, he came up to me. He's like, hey, dude, that was really cool what you said. And I was like, thanks, dude. And he's like, do you mind if I pray for you? This dude came up to me. I was probably 230 tattoos. I was a big boy. Um, he was not. He was younger. And he had the balls to come up and do that. And that right there is obedience. I've seen many men that you can, you can just see them like they're intimidated just to have a conversation with one from one human to another. I'm not just saying me, but with many people just because of, uh, oh, he was in this movie or he's a UFC fighter, whatever it is, you're still human. I don't care. It doesn't matter. But he did not. He came up and he did that. And as soon as he put his hand on me and started praying, I lost it. I... <laughs> it was starting to make sense. It was all making sense to me. And uh, so I talked to him for about an hour, two hours at the end of that night, went to bed. And the next day was Sunday. And we had like a, um, they played worship music, but not like, like kind of like rock, you know. Um, and they played it every day. And it's been like, okay, can we please turn this crap off so we can like get on with this so I can get that guy out of here? For some reason, man. I'll never forget the song. I had to look it up. It was uh, by Matt Matt Redman, 10,000 Reasons. Uh, it was playing in the beat of that song and the words of that song rocked my body. It was different. Something changed. Something changed. Internally. I would say I don't know how, but I do know how. <laughs> It just changed and I felt different and I started to smile. You know, when you're a kid, you do something you're not supposed to do and you're down on yourself and your mom or dad or a family member or maybe even a close friend comes up to you and embraces you or just kind of pat you on the head and say, hey man, it's okay. It's all right. We all make mistakes. That's what God did to me. Right. Right then and there. That's what he did to me. I can feel it. And still, being the hard-headed SOB I am, like, it's probably another coincidence. Maybe it's just I really like this song. <laughs> it's like... Dude, when do you get it? Uh, so I'm just like jamming out to the music and like, it's just like, it feels good. Like, so I'm like, dude, I'm like, I'm like, this is, I'm like, put my arm up. I'm like, man, this is just insane. And um, I was moved. Like I was moved internally. Like I was, di I felt different. And so at the end, they kind of like thank some of the presenters, some of the guys that give some of their speakers, some of the guys that share their testimony. Because some of the testimonies, man, they're like, hey, dude, I cheated on my wife. I did this. And they're, they open up. They're very real. And I like, I, I really, I appreciate that. And I think that like that conference kind of made me who I am now where I'm not afraid to be real. And I will be transparent because... All of us go through something, some degree. It might, it might not look the same. It's a different flavor for all of us, but we're going through some stuff. We're all going through some stuff, some way, shape, or form. 
relationship, work, health-wise. We're all, we're all going through some stuff. But they did that, but they were saying thank you. And then one of the things is like they, they said, um, we wanted to recognize the guy that we think did the most change. And I was like, well, that's not going to be me because I haven't really talked to anybody and all that stuff. So I'm like just waiting to listen. They're like, Eddie Penny. And they called my name. And I was like wondering if I'm that guy. <laughs> so I go up on stage and they're like, hey, we can tell a change in you. Wow. I always, I always explain stuff like this, man, when we don't really know what's going on. Like, if you can imagine two boxers in the ring fighting each other, they're looking head on, you know, chest to chest. I, I have, this is my vantage point, right? Mm -hmm. The coach and the fans, they can see looking in, right? They can see, they have a bigger picture. I just have this. And that's kind of what happened at that conference is, um, I guess they saw something that I didn't think I was doing or feeling or acting. And they gave me this pin. It was made out of uh, an olive tree from, from Israel. And it had like a cross on it. And I still, I carry that pin with me everywhere. Uh, and, it, and I started crying right there on stage in front of all these men. And I didn't care. I didn't care. I was about 80% sure that I found God. I'm like, okay, wow. Like, so this is real. This isn't, this is real. And I think back to things like Adam said and other guys that I deployed with. And I'm like starting to think, I start to see it. I start to see these deployments. I start to see certain things, why this happened versus this. I start to see my life experiences. Why? I'm getting the why answered. Um, get in the car drive back to a, a gut, was getting a ride um, from my girlfriend's brother, same one, that took me, uh, he took me back to Oklahoma City to get my truck and I drove from Oklahoma City back to Tulsa and I called my girlfriend at the time, slash fiance maybe, depending on the day. And uh, I called her and I tried to explain the weekend and I couldn't talk. I just start crying. I cry 15, 20 minutes. I haven't cried like this. I mean, I stuffed it for decades. I thought I was good. I'd call back. I say a couple words, I'd start crying again. I'd, like, I had to call you back. I can't even, can't even get, can't even muster the words. And I tried this throughout, and then finally I'm like, hey, I'll just talk to you when I get home. Like, I just got that out real quick, and I hung up the phone because I was going to, and I started crying again. I cried pretty much the whole drive home. I, I, like, I just didn't understand. But in that moment, I felt so loved. Like, I just felt so loved. And I'm like, all those things that I'd hear, or I call you a crazy Christian, or you Bible thumper, or all these things, it was making sense. It was just making sense to me. It was just, I could feel it inside. And, um, and so I get back, I tell her about the whole weekend and supposedly she went up to St. Louis with her friend and she had no intention of coming back. I guess when she was out there, she went out to a bar and she was sitting on some couches and um, a fight broke out and some dude got pushed into her, knocked her off her, like off of her couch, like knocked over the couch. And I guess she got some kind of something. And it's like, I, I shouldn't be here. And her and her friend like drove back that night. And uh, she's like, she told me that. She's like, I had no intentions of continuing this relationship after this weekend. She's like, I wanted you to go just to help you. And so we worked. And I think that's when I decided to quit drinking. Um, I quit for a while. <laughs> but it wasn't, I think it was maybe two or three days later I'm in my car driving from a workout or something. And uh, I pull up to this red light, just turns red. There's like this car wash over to the side. And they have one of those like blinking sign, like the red where like it flashes, like save 10% or, you know, buy a car wash and come back in a week for a free one. And I'm, I'm sitting in my car and I'm like, show me, I, I'm like, I just, I just straight up saying, like, show me, show me I'm saved. Show me I'm saved. And I was getting... 
I was getting aggressive. I was like, show me I'm saved. Like, I don't believe this crap. I'm like almost testing him. And um, even though this happened, this happened, like that's, that can be explained, this can be explained, this can be explained. Like, show me, show me I'm saved. Cause I'm like, I've done this and I'm, I'm crying at this red light and I'm talking. If anybody's, you know, parked next to me at this red light, they're gonna be like, this guy's loony. Probably should call the cops before he kills, kills us or himself. And I look over to the sign and all I see is one word, saved, S-A-V-E-D. That's it. One word. It wasn't save 10%. It wasn't pulling now to save $2. It just said saved. That's incredible. I saw that. And I'm like, I'm yours. I'm like sold. I'm like sold. So um, at the end of that conference, they tell you, um, I like to go all in on everything. Like I want to be a SEAL. I would read everything, listen to everything, watch everything to try to be the best. And they would give some books out. They'd be like, hey, you should probably start off with this book. You know, it teaches you about prayer. And I was like, okay, if you say that's what I should start out with, I'll go buy that book. And they're like, oh, this is another one, but it's a little more, it talks about spiritual warfare. And so I heard, I heard the word war warfare. I'm like, what? I'm like, what'd you say? I'm like, that sounds like something I would like. And not knowing or not believing or just not even taking the time to have thoughts about that, about the evil and um, all that stuff. But um, I started with this prayer, prayer life book. And I was like, okay, this is like boring. This is like trash. Like, no wonder why people don't want to be Christians. This is weak. Um, and I was like, what's this spiritual book? And I looked at my notes. I found it and I, I ordered it uh, and I started reading it. And I was like, there's, there's a whole other world. There's, there's, there, the evil isn't the evil over there. I mean, it is, but there's evil all around us. And like, just like those, like if you have, you got to question yourself, like why, do, why am I having this not good thought right now? Was it provoked by something? A lot of the times it's not. Like why did all of a sudden do I want to cheat on my wife? Why did all of a sudden do I want to leave my wife? Why are my kids, do I don't want to give them up for adoption? Like, if we're honest with ourselves, we have maybe not those exact thoughts, but thoughts like that, like that guy that just cut me off, I want to get out and rip off his freaking head. Yeah. Why do we have those thoughts? And if you a believer and you believe in that spiritual warfare that you got the good and evil, then there is this unseen world that, you know, you got certain forces that will put these evil thoughts in your mind. Um, and you really sit down and think about it, in my opinion, it's very real. And I look back, um, I'll, 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 go, I'll go this way. I did not, it was not easy. I still went back to drinking. I separated from my, when we, we ended up getting married, I separated from my wife and started sleeping with everybody I could. And I would call, I would call myself a Christian because I believe in Christ and all that stuff, but I was still doing not the right things, which is where, to be honest with you, most Christians live in that world. And I was that guy. I was that guy. Uh, thinking I'll be saved. Um, you know, I was, I was more of the, the talker, not the walker. You know, I wasn't walking in obedience the way I should be. And um, it's kind of funny, like, talking about this. If I was, like, me 15, 20 years ago, I'd be like, okay, so my, that future me is a freaking nut job. <laughs> I'd be like, yeah, you're, you're, you're crazy. Um, but, um, I wasn't walking in it at all and I was drinking and my relationship was falling apart and I was doing the wrong stuff. And then one day my kids were at school after I like moved, like we moved in, we ended up getting married. We moved into a house like eight months later, I moved out of the house. Oh man. Got my own freaking house. I was just, I was a freaking wreck, dude. I shouldn't have been in a relationship. I couldn't even, I couldn't control this. Even after coming, you know, people think like, oh, you, you should be fine. You're a Christian. Dude, there's a war going on. You still got to fight daily. It's not easy. It's not easy. It talks about it in the Bible all the time. Like you got to fight. Like th you're, there's a fight. And that's where a lot of men are failing. They just, they're a pushover. Yeah. And I was being a pushover. I was getting trampled on by evil. I mean, that's all you, I mean, that's a great word for it. And uh, I found myself... In my bedroom when the kids are at school, 
And I'm just sitting on my bed and there's a nightstand. My nightstand's right here. And my, my good old SIG 228 is sitting right there. And I just look over and I hear a voice. Yeah, this is a way. I've never thought about suicide in my life. That's what I'm saying. Why do those evil things pop in your brain? Because there's a different side. There is stuff going on around us that you just got to, and people call me crazy. I don't, I don't care. Um, based off of my experiences, uh, I picked up that gun and I remember holding it right here. I just like was thumbing it, touching it, feeling the cold steel. And I was like, yeah, it's that time. Enough is enough. I'm done hurting. And, um, I had like this view of like a bird's eye view looking down at my room and seeing my lifeless body with my brain splattered, big old pool of blood, very detailed, very detailed. Being Seeing all the body parts and mutilations and disaster I saw. It was easy to, to visualize, right? And I pictured my kids coming into my room after school with their backpacks on see my lifeless body. And what that would have done to him. And I, I put the gun down and I stood up in a freaking rage. And I was like, what the fuck am I doing? And I'm like, my God, my God. And I, and I start cursing him. I'm like, you say you're the savior and all this stuff. And I was mad, man. I was like, how could you let me? How could you let me do this? You're supposed to be healing me. And I blamed him, which was wrong. And I got out of my house and I went to the gym, my, my therapy. And uh, that, was my, that was the one time where it was about that time to clock out. And... Um, Something was wrong, man. I couldn't figure it out. I was going back to sleep issues. I'd be up for two days straight, sleep for a couple days, be able to sleep for a couple of nights, up for a couple more nights. I couldn't figure it out. And I'm like, what is wrong with me? And then a buddy reached out, um, Ken, and he's like, hey, there's this brain center down in Dallas uh, called Cerebrum. And he told me about it like a year ago. And I was like, yeah, I'm good, dude. And um, and I'm like, maybe that's what I need to do. Because what I, what I failed to mention earlier, when I was doing the RSOing, uh, when I was a breacher cell, I would, you know, watch other, like we'd have SWAT teams come in and or other units do the breaching stuff. And I would just make sure they're doing it, you know, safely. And they would use uh, just like deck cord, like not a big explosive, right? Not like a C, like a uh, C6 strip or something like that. Just yeah. like a basic, like let's get the effect of like this, of get a, of the explosive. And these, in the, in the overpressure from these weak charges would go off and my head would be pounding. Pounding compared to the charges I was doing overseas. I mean, you know, I had part, I mean, times where I thought my, my, my pants were ripped off by being so close to a freaking charge. And I'm like, just having your bell rung. You just like, but I fed off of it. Like I told you, like the pain, the, the, the pain for some reason. And feeling that amped me up before I, it was like the, a fighter walking out to the ring and they got their music playing. That explosion and that blast, feeling that overpressure on my body was my song as I walked into the arena, which is some bad guy's house. That was it. And, uh. But towards the end, it started hurting. I like I had to, I was like, I can't do this anymore. I can do it from way back here, but it was so bad. Every explosion, I was like, oh. It was like, almost took me to the ground a couple of times. It was so bad. Damn. So I, I thought about that um, when, he, when he recommended it a second time to go down there because he asked how I was doing. I was like, dude, I'm, I'm struggling, man. Uh, my workouts were struggling. I wasn't eating as much as I should. And if I was, I was eating crap. I was angry with my kids. I couldn't take, I would start yelling at people at the gym for not putting their weights back. I mean, I was a, I was a jerk. I was a punk. I was a, I was a 100% tier one douchebag. So I went down there and they did all their stuff on me. 
did all their crap and definitely had some some spots in the brain. And uh, they did a bunch of like to therapy to kind of get it back. And I got back uh, after a two week trip down there. And uh, I sat down to work the first day I was back. And for the first time, I sat at my computer for like six hours and like was just knocking out work. I was starting to get my seven to nine hours of sleep at night. It, w it was like someone pushed the reset button on my body. Damn. And it, it just, uh, it, it helped a lot. It helped a lot, dude. Uh, so the brain, the brain definitely had some stuff going on that I was oblivious to. I didn't realize how angry I was. I didn't realize the effect that all the drinking did. You know, I was, I was so busy trying to stuff my pain and think about my pain. I didn't realize the pain that I was causing my family. <clears throat> Extremely selfish. Let's go back to that weekend, the retreat. Yeah. Christian retreat. At the beginning, you talked about when you saw Jesus as a child. It scared the hell out of you. Did you think about that? Mm -hmm. What were you thinking? I saw the reality of it. If you, if, if you remember, and the way it was, was when I saw Jesus, I wasn't scared. Mm -hmm. When he left, I was very scared. My opinion and my, I believe, like, no, I was deceived by the devil until I was 32 years old from that one day. He used the darkness and made him look to be the boogeyman. He wasn't the boogeyman. I believe that. I believe that with all my heart. 100%. How long did it take you to replay that in your head? Just now? No, at the retreat. Were you thinking about that day when I, you were I, I, I was scared to go there, but I'm like, man, like you just got to go um, and do this. <laughs> I think it happened probably, there might have been little clips of it happening when I was there, but it happened more after the fact when I started to read, I tried to read the Bible and started to seek him and listen to, to, to people that talked about him. But the thing is, man, is like that, that was, was weird about, I wouldn't say weird about me, but is where I feel like my calling is now is that there's not a, I, I, I feel like Christianity, the church is very watered down and it, 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 it's, um, it's like, it's designed for women. Hmm. Like I'm so. not, I'm not, I'm not hearing, I'm, I hear a lot, I go to church or, I, or you hear something and it's like, oh, let's love each other. We have grace. We're going to, you know, turn the cheek, all that stuff. We're going to, we're going to be kind to each other no matter what happens. And that's great. That's good. That's good to have love and it's good to give grace and it's because we all mess up and it's good to give people second chances and it's good to forgive. It, that is good. But there is a warrior piece that we are called to do and it is the men are failing. They are failing. They are failing. They are failing. And it starts with that mindset. And I believe that men just need to be called out in a positive way so they can realize their potential. Like you have got to realize your potential and what you were created to be. And I believe you're created to be to lead your family and stand up for evil. You've got to expose the evil and you've got to stand up for it. Look at our world. Look at our country. Yeah. What do you hear the most? Evil. Because the good people that really have good in the intentions and goodness in their heart... They're keeping their mouth shut. And the big reason is that because they're afraid. They're afraid for someone to come out and they're afraid of any tension. They're afraid to be confronted because they wouldn't go there. Oh, I don't want to, you know, rustle any feathers. Like, that's not your call to be. And they're like, oh, well, Jesus, like he was, okay, cool. Read the Bible. Jesus was starting crap all the time against all the people that were freaking, like that were more legalistic. And, um, yeah, I think that's my, I think that's like where my heart has taken me is like to bring in that warrior mindset is like from the battlefield to this battlefield. 
uh, there's a lot of dudes that are good men and they just don't have the leadership or the know-how. I mean, if you don't know, you don't know. And with what we're surrounded by, we are the product of what we are surrounded by. That's like it says, don't hang out with the wrong people. If you listen to a bunch of death metal, satanic music, guess what you're going to start believing? You start eating a bunch of donuts, guess what? You don't go to the gym, guess what? You hang out with a bunch of smokers, you're probably going to start smoking. It's the same thing. We are surrounded by, and I don't mean this in a bad way, but at the same time, I mean in a bad way. We're around some weak people. And it's not okay. It's it's They need to stand up. They need to rise up. And they need to speak out. And they need to lead by example. And I was so guilty of this. And until recently, I'd say probably the last year or two, it's like, I mean, since I found Christ, it's been getting stronger and stronger. It's kind of like when we were in Buds, right? We are this, um, oh, we're, we're, we're cool guys. We, we you know, we, we did Buds. Yeah, but we were way better after we did our next school at Jump School, right? We were way better after SQT. We were way better after our first deployment. We were better than that after our second deployment. And we just get better and we get better and we get better and we train and we train. It's the same thing here in life and the same thing in Christianity world is you learn to get better like, crap, I need to stop drinking. Like right now, I'm like, I got to stop cussing. Like, I don't, I want to better myself. And I don't know what's next. Hopefully it's not sweets. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, I got like, it's just like, dude, it's just bettering ourselves. Like, why would we not want to better ourselves? And there's that evil in the world that pushes everything but. And here, and here's an example of that. Around, around my house, it's a newer development, kind of like our area we're in right now. And they've been putting up new stores, new restaurants. In the last year, Marble Slab, Cold Stone, Great American Cookie. All these are phenomenal places, by the way. Um, Nestle Toll House Cookie. Nothing Bunt Cakes. A Pie Place. A Cupcake Place. Tiff's Treats, which is a cookie place. A Cinnab a, Not a Cinnabun bun place, but a sort of like Cinnabun, but you get to like put a bunch of other toppings on it. All opened up within a square mile of each other. Wow. You eat, and I'm just going to use this as one example because there's many. You eat a bunch of crap. You eat a bunch of crap, and you, you know this from personal experience. I know this from personal experiences. Our listeners know this from personal experiences. You, you don't function good. Your energy goes down. You get that freaking food coma. You get that sugar rush, and then it drops, and you just like turn into a miserable piece of crap. You don't have no energy, and that filters over to your kids or to your colleagues. Our society is not helping our case. We preach all this stuff. Oh, we need to be healthy. Oh, we need to exercise. But you weren't you weren't hearing that during all this COVID stuff, were you? No. Is is because they want you to push whatever they want to push. We know what they want to push. They want the the dollars. But we are surrounded by people with cruel intentions. And if you don't stand up, and if we don't rise up, you will succumb and you will be a victim. Period. I mean, we talked about this a little bit last night. Yeah. It's um, it's sad. It's very sad. Yeah. <clears throat> Let's take a quick break. I promise to uh, solemnly swear that the testimony... Amid fresh reports of reckless Please behavior by Blackwater in Iraq... Blackwater's CEO, Eric Prince, made no apologies to a congressional investigating committee. I disagree with the assertion that they acted like cowboys. And it says three senators, Joe Biden, Chuck Cagle, and John Kerry, the future vice president, secretary of defense, and secretary of state, respectively, posed while waiting for Blackwater rescue. Their U.S. Army helicopter got lost in a blinding snowstorm and set down in Taliban territory on the side of a mountain. Do not ever discount the Iranian influence on the Biden-Obama administration then, as there is now. He said, Mr. President, give us the authorities and a billion dollars, and in three weeks the flies will be walking on the eyeballs of our enemies. 
Prince said his employees act with restraint and professionalism. He boasted that none of the U.S. diplomats he has paid to protect have been killed or wounded. It, it was a great honor that they turned to us because it was a very important mission, right? Because the CIA is the ones who made that victory possible for the United States. We've had a better response from Blackwater than we have from the State Department. We fought back on all fronts. The one place that they had us over a barrel was in the State Department. Witnesses say the two SUVs were ambushed as they drove through town. Another convoy of guys that got ambushed and shot up on the Baghdad Highway. The contractors worked for Blackwater Security, a company that protects coalition personnel. Knowing that the clowns at the State Department and the Obama administration did everything they could to block a program like that, because it's not something they directly controlled, it is such a mess. It is such a fetid swamp. Trump was right to call it a swamp. It is. All right, Eddie, we covered a lot. We covered your your career in the military. We're covering your transition out and how bad it got at home, how you took your kids. Where are we going from here? So after Oklahoma, we were getting a divorce with my we, we did we got married and that was a very I mean, I think the total marriage was a year. And uh Anna she I, I take full responsibility for that, man. I was I was drinking a lot. I was angry. I was mad at the world. I didn't realize what I was doing, and I don't use it as, a, as an excuse at all. I just I messed up, man. I messed up hard. And um, so I had no one to help me with my kids. I started a contingent group, uh, risk mitigation, donut security. Before we get into contingent group, we talked about why you left Louis shoulder why you went why yeah you so that kind of goes back to the um, i always wanted to know why 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 did i hear or feel or sense or whatever i don't I, I can't even i can't even put a label on it what i felt or heard um why did i leave that position and he didn't and, and that was a question i asked myself forever and and it was it it, it the only thing I, it, it's, it was God. It was God, his angel, was something pulling me away from there. And now I question why me and not him? Why didn't he hear it or feel it? Why? Have you come up with that answer? I have, I gotta be honest with you, man. My life, has done some twists, some twists and turns. And the SEAL thing was always a passion. I just knew it. I, I just knew it. I knew the military. I, I just knew it. Probably the last year, my mindset has gone from that to more of like, like my faith. Like I just want to share the word. I want to share my story. And show that God is real, that that our society will do anything and everything to push it aside from the Pledge of Allegiance to not discuss certain things in school. And in my opinion, taking faith away is the number one thing that is destroying this country. It ain't the people. People suck because there's evil. You take away the good but still leave the bad, well, what's going to happen? Evil yeah. will reign. And I believe that's what's happening. And I just, I have a passion. I have a passion for God. My heart is for God. And I mess up. And I, and I 
don't like some of the things that I should do. I want to do some things that I want to do, not him. Um, I still fall into that trap at times and need to pull myself out. But he always pulls me out. Uh, but that's just that's where my passion's going. I want to, I want to, I want to tell my story and encourage others. That's that's where we're going. Well, you're definitely doing that. There's no doubt it's, about it. And it's not, it's not even me doing it. It's not even me doing it. But it's it's awesome, man. It just makes me feel good. It makes me feel alive. I'm it's been my cure. This is as twisted as this thing still is. It's good. From where I was to where I am now, I look back, I'm like, oh my gosh, I, I almost took my life. I almost took my life. And that was not in the cards. It was not, it's not time. And I question sometimes, like, what, 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 what do you have for me? What do you want me to do? And I feel by the certain circumstances and the people that are coming into my life and doing certain things, I know what I'm supposed to be doing. And that's... I'm I'm his freaking warrior. I am a warrior for him. And I'm going to lead other people to fight. Good for you. Yeah. When did Contingent Group start? So Contingent Group started uh, when I was in Tulsa. I did a contracting job with a friend uh, that I was, uh, that we were at Team 2 with. Um, good old Joe, J-Lo. And uh, so I started on some contract with him. I was like, dude, we could bring some more people into this. Uh, so I developed a company, got the insurance, so like guys could fall under the the, um, the insurance umbrella, and just started it from there, and just kind of morphed, and uh, finally got a I got a really good client that does a lot of work down in Central America, and then we were starting to do a lot of trips, and then other clients are reaching out, and then we're kind of adding in driving services, armor cars, up armored intelligence reporting assessments it just started kind of like then we're tracking money and then we're doing this and all this stuff just started happening all right now we need to put this freaking huge security system into this freaking huge building uh and not just your cameras but like we need drones flying around we need this we need that i'm like okay and we figure it out and we get it done just gotta with our network i mean we got all the guys pretty much on our phone ready to call yeah them. you know when we were talking about contingent group yesterday I had no idea how in depth and technically advanced yeah, it's... these security systems that you are putting together for these clients are. I I thought it was uh, all right. He's probably going in and wiring up some some camera systems on the house and and maybe putting some reinforced doors no. and hardened windows in. And when you were describing me describing to me that the the technology. I didn't even know that shit existed. Yeah. I mean, it is incredible. And that's not me. That's the guys that that's their specialty do. We, I'm kind of like the bigger overall like manager. Like we need to, I, I kind of go and do the assessment. I look for the weak points. I'm very good at thinking like a bad guy. Like, are we need to fix this? We need to fix this. You probably should think about this. Like, do you travel? Okay, let's put these, you know, protocols in place. So we just develop this whole, it's not just the cameras. It's not just like, hey, making sure you got, you know, um, a license plate reader out by the street. It's all of it together. Because not just one thing's going to protect you. It's multiple things, right? Like we carry a gun, carry a backup magazine. Now we have a blade. Maybe I need to use my car. So it's just like, you know, putting those layers of protection around the individual family, organization, whatever it is. And it's it's cool. It's um, everyone's different, what they need. I'm I mean, sorry. how many... How many, you probably don't even know, but how many different aspects of this business are there? I mean, you're wiping people from the internet, you know, wipe, cleaning it up, cleaning their names up from the internet. I mean, home security, business security, travel security. All of it. Personal protection, everything. I, I don't have an answer for that question. I don't know how many things yeah. that we do. It's a lot. I mean... I mean, from a simple of a background check to, um, you know, putting in the most advanced technology to keep you safe based on an asset to someone traveling overseas and knowing what, what it's like over there to going with them uh, to pose as a camera crew because we're going low key. Whatever it may be, uh, we do it all. <clears throat> what is, uh, 
What's your typical client base? What what type of client are you looking for with contingent group? Uh, more, it's more higher end. It's definitely on the upscale or or like an organization. Um, but there's some smaller things that I mean, individuals need protection or just like, hey, let's monitor this, and we need to do the right things to just protect them. It just it really just depends. But it's more on the upper end. Okay. Uh, the majority, not all, but the majority. Okay. It sounds like you're kind of stepping out of contingent group. It sounds like unafraid, motivational speaking, becoming an author, spreading the word of Christ. Yeah. Is your new passion. That's the passion, man. And contingent group is, sounds like it's a well-greased machine now. You don't, that doesn't need all of your attention. Right. So let's. <clears throat> Which is hard to walk from when it's your baby. Yeah. It's like, ah, I'll come back. <laughs> <laughs> I understand. But I'm that. still fully engaged in there. I'm still doing things because I, I do enjoy it still. It's just, I'm being led. I'm being led and I got to listen. Yeah. Well, I mean, it continue, when you were telling me about that yesterday, it really blew me away. I was like, holy shit, this is uh, way bigger and, and way more advanced than I yeah. had imagined. But let's talk about Unafraid now. So, how did, how did that start? Did this start with your wife? No. So my wife comes in at the very end because the book was not done. So this book, the first thing that I come up with, came up with for a name was this was facade. And it was, I was the facade. I was the poser. I was the fake. I was this Navy SEAL, right? But below I was a bag of crap. I was, I was weak. Physically strong, but weak mentally and emotionally. Very weak. I wouldn't say mentally. Uh, but one night before the suicide piece, like right before. Wow. It was like right before. That's interesting. I never thought about this. Wow. I woke up about 2 a.m. And I just like thought, heard should write a book. And I was like, that's stupid. I'm like, do you know how many Navy SEALs write books? I will not be a part of that category. <laughs> that's exactly <laughs> what I was telling myself. And I couldn't go back to sleep. And I literally was like, fine, like a little kid. Went to my office, got my legal pad, got a pen, came back to my bed, propped up my pillows, started writing. And that night I wrote out the, pretty much the outline of this book. Uh, so I went into in depth to give it some, to give it the meat and potatoes of it. And I didn't know where to start. So the one thing that I knew very well was the chapter about Luis that night. Um, I knew everything. I knew the details. I knew the way things touched. I knew the way things looked. I knew the way things smelt. I know how I felt. I remember everything. So I started that chapter and I did that chapter. And as I'm writing that chapter, I'm bawling. I'm losing it. And uh, I'm like, I had to like take a break. And I went back to like my childhood, wrote about my childhood. Then I went to the Marines and I had a specific incident in the Marines where I like turned the corner and like, I'm now a man. When I learned really what mental toughness was. And um, I wrote about 150 pages over the next couple months. And I just, I don't know. What was the turning point in the Marine Corps? Uh, we were, I'm sure you've heard of like the sand fleas down in Paris Island. Like these little bugs, they just bite you. They suck. They are so annoying. It's just like a, a tick or a, a bee that doesn't hurt too much. It's just like it kind of stings you. But they have tons of them down there. And we were, we were drilling. And I just like had my rifle at right shoulder arm. So it's like laying like this. And we're just standing there. And this one of the little sand flea kind of f comes up and lands on my forearm. And I'm kind of like looking on my peripheral vision, like looking for the instructors. And I think I'm clear. And I kind of just do this, kind of wipe it away. And all I hear in this deep voice was, recruit Penny. And I was like, my gosh, here we go. And it's like, fall out. So I fell out and I just followed him. And I knew where we were going. And we were going to the, what they call the sand pit. There's these pits. They look like a big sandbox all over the, it's like the beach, right, for buds. But they got these sand pits everywhere. 
and they just beat the crap out of you in there, like side straddle hops, jumping jacks, what are called push ups, sit ups, sprints, eight count bodybuilders. I don't think burpees were invented back then. Uh, but all these different calisthenics and things, just, just annoying, make you sweat. It's the middle of summer. Um, and I was alone with him. This is the first time I was alone with a drone instructor. And, uh, and I was like, I'll, I'll take your punishment. I don't, I don't care. It's not a big deal, dude. Like, so I'm, we're going. And we were there for so long. Like, the shadows moved to the other side of objects. Like, we were there oh. so long. I was like, I was, I was like, uh, I want to file a grievance. I feel like you're abusing me. <laughs> like, it was like, I was like, dude, is he allowed to do this? Like, it was, got, it was getting me to that point. And I, and I wasn't looking for a safe place. I'm like, this just seems awkward to me. Like, it seems like I'm getting uncomfortable right now. And um, he just starts beating me. And then he starts having me do these sprints. Like, to this, there's, like, this shed where it, like, howls, like, um, like, lawn mowers and, you know, lawn equipment for that area. So he's like, hey, sprint back here and, or sprint there and come back. And you've got, you know, 45 seconds, whatever. The time was never enough to go do what he asked and come back. It was by design, right? And I was getting frustrated and I got this, I was dripping sweat. It was going to my eyes. You know, the feeling that's just burning like acid in your eyes. And I was starting to get irritated and I was starting to feel sorry for myself. And I was like, give myself the victim mentality. Like, oh, poor me. what I do? Like, well, you're the one that did that. You actually started this. And he kept doing it and he kept doing it. And uh, I started crying. 17 year old, away from mommy, getting destroyed by this drone instructor Martinez. Never forget him. Wearing glasses, his Marine Corps glasses that I just wanted to rip off, punch him in the face. I wouldn't have been done anything because I couldn't even lift my freaking arms or move. I was smoked. And he just kept doing it and doing it. And I, I, I was like, dude, when is in? And, and he can see me breaking. He can see me breaking. And he comes up to me. He stops barking orders and he comes up to me. And he looks at me and I was hoping that he didn't see the tears, but they, they don't, you know, they see it, right? And he goes, discipline. He goes, he goes, it might seem like a small thing to itch a bug off your arm. But in combat, sitting in an ambush, it can mean your life. And then he goes, more importantly, the guy's next to your, his life. And he just stared at me. And it was like he was looking through me. And something switched to my brain. I was like, let's go. Let's go. Give me more. That's what I was thinking in my head. Yeah. So he steps out of the sand pit and I'm like, okay, are we done now? Like, I think you made your point. And he starts doing it again and we keep going and we keep going. But this time... I'm like angry. I'm mad. I was like, you will not break me. I was like, I was like huffing. I'm like, let's go. Like I was like saying stuff. I was like, let's go. Let's like, I was amped. It was like someone just hit me with a shot of adrenaline and I was going. And that has changed my mindset ever since. Probably important to throw that back in there, but that was a big deal. That was a big day for me. That is when I became a man. That is when my mindset and the kind of bird that unafraid, how I think. That was it. That was it. I was different from that day. Very different. Wasn't timid or shy. I was like, let's go. So that was, um, yeah. That, that was, was a turning point. That was a turning point. So unafraid. Let's get back to that. Started as a book. Yeah. Now so now it is a brand. I, I had the. And I put, I put the 150 pages that I wrote by myself in Tulsa, Oklahoma, up on the shelf. So started working with the NRA. It was a carry guard course. It was a bunch of spec ops guys. Uh, they, they put in a bunch of tier one guys to run these shooting courses for the NRA to give it some life. Because the NRA is made up of like a bunch of older people. And it's just, well, it's yeah. old. It's outdated. So they were trying to give it life. So we were trying to breathe it into it. So we did these shooting courses, phenomenal shooting courses. Uh, so I met Keith on one of these courses. He was actually writing for the NRA and he was writing for Guns and Ammo, Field and Stream. Like he's, he's, he's you know, does a lot of, he's a big hunter, big gun guy. Um, 
he actually knows like the nomenclature of things. Like, I don't know anything. Like, I'm like, dude, just give me a gun that works. Like I'll like, I'll tell you what it does, <laughs> but uh, he knows all that stuff. But uh, I put him through that course. I was his instructor and he didn't need any instructor. He just did it so he could write about it. And he was going to do interviews with instructors to kind of talk about it, to give it like, to boost it up, to try to get some traction. And um, that course went away. And I knew Keith was writing for, did a book um, that we discussed last night for a New York bestseller. It's turned into a motion picture now on Prime, on Amazon Prime. Uh, he did a couple of those books. He was a big part of that. Um, but due to legal issues, you won't see that. Yeah. Uh, but I, I hit him up. I was like, hey, man. Or I did, I did the Ritland podcast. Episode 23, I think that's the one you listened to, the first one. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of people are like, dude, you should write a book. You should write a book. And I talked about a lot of the things that I initially wrote about. So I was like, ah, oh, maybe I should maybe I should do that. It was kind of weighing on me for like a couple of weeks. And I was like, I, I wouldn't know where to, I don't know how to write. Like I, I like, like a fifth grader. So I remembered Keith and I, I, I texted him. I was like, hey man, can we, can we talk? And he called me like right away. And I was like, hey, man, can you do me a favor? Can you listen to this podcast? I sent him the podcast. And he's like, yeah, man, I'll do it uh, sometime this week. I was like, cool. He calls me the next morning. He's like, I listened to the podcast. <laughs> and he goes, that's awesome, man. And I go, um, think it's good enough to be a book? He's like, yeah. And uh, I'm like, would you help me write it? And he goes, I thought you would never ask. I did not know this at the time. Keith was having a falling out with the person that he was working with at the time. And he was looking for another project. And he actually is like, I thought about you because I knew some of your story because we talked about it, you know, over drinks or whatever. Uh, and then when he's like, when you sent that to me, he's like, I already knew what it was and I already knew my answer. And it was just like, wow. And, and we started working on that. Uh, it took a couple years. He would fly down. We would do the interview. He would interview me. Mm -hmm. I gave him what I had and then he, he, um, he put the words to it and, and I, and I have got to give him credit for the words in this book. I told the story, but this, that, that man made art. Like it is, it is so good how he, he's a, a phenomenal, he's a phenomenal writer and he's a, a very dear friend, very, very upstanding guy, a uh, very trustworthy guy. And uh, at that, before, like kind of at the beginning of this, it was like pre-COVID, I was kind of getting a little piece of like the motivational stuff. And I was like, man, why is everyone afraid of everything? Like I, I saw like the Trump, the Trump versus Biden was going on and I heard a stat on the radio. I don't know if it's true and it doesn't matter, but it probably is. It said that 63% of voters are afraid to tell you who they're going to vote for. 63%? 63%. I was like, that is the dumbest thing in the world. And it's because they don't want to, they're afraid of any conflict. It goes yeah. back to what we were talking about with the Christian men. Same thing. So I was like, unafraid. Like I fell in love with the word unafraid enough where I got it tattooed. Like it was everything. Um, and I'm like, and I was just brainstorming thing. And I found, I was going through Shutterstock. Uh, to get a photo for a post for contingent group or something like that. And I saw this logo and I was, I was looking for a picture of a heart. I think it was for, I don't know what it was. It was something for, uh, based around security or whatever it is. And I saw this logo. It was a half a heart, and half a brain. And it had some like paint splattered around it or something. I was like, that is awesome. So I downloaded it, kept it on the computer, didn't really use it for anything. Um, and then when the unafraid thing, it's like, dude, I need to make a logo for this. So I did, did a t-shirt, t-shirt started to sell. People are loving it. Like, I love that. I love the way, I love the way it is. And then we started putting the logo together, um, which actually a little bit before, sorry, I'm a little confused on that. So we did the logo and then started doing just a t-shirt. And I was like, man, like people are like, Hey, thanks for just that shirt. Like it, 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 it helped me. I was like, how does a shirt help you? But then I think about the stuff that I wear. I love motivational stuff. I love motivational quotes. I was like, okay, cool. I'll just, I'll do another t-shirt. So we started doing more. And then what I realized without realizing it is all my branding was kind of 
moving to Christ. I didn't realize this. I wanted to be a fighter, I, like to be a fight, not so much like a, a fighter, but like to fight for what you believe to be right. And uh, so I did like biblical verses that show tell you that you need to be freaking a fighter, like shirts that say not passive, like I'm not going to be pushed around. Um, and just like I'm going all in. Like, and I just tried to like turn it into that. It just kind of morphed into this, um, this thing. And, and one day I'm up in, up in the shipping room, turned our movie room into a shipping room. Um, and I'm just looking around and like all the stickers and then, and the bands and the shirts and the pins and just all of it. And I'm like, I just gotta look up the sky. And I'm like, you are so sneaky. <laughs> I'm like, like, I've got face stuff everywhere without even realizing I've got face stuff, faith stuff. I'm like, it was like I was blinded to it all. Like, I'm I'm all about the warrior piece. All about the warrior piece. Like our shirts say, you know, warrior, but I'm like, well, we'll put that on a cross because I believe that. We go back to gold, got the cross. Yeah. It all meshes now. It makes sense to me. It comes full circle. It's full circle. It's a great way to put it. And then I'm like, okay, so I'll, people were starting to reach out on Instagram and like saying, hey, thanks for posting this. And I started putting some just some Bible verses that meant something to me. I'm like, hey, maybe it'll help somebody else. And there was one time, one time, this individual reached out and I, I and it was, I think it was a dude. And he goes, you posted this and it just saved my life. He just, How'd that feel? I was like, wow. One quote, a few words on a little screen or wherever he watched it, saved his life. And I knew it wasn't like, oh, you saved my life, man. It was, you saved my life. I could feel it by reading the words. And it that started happening more and more. And I'm like, that feeling I described about killing someone. Got trumped by the feeling of helping someone. By encouraging someone. I was like, that is awesome. If it just helps one person that would have taken their life or would have gone home and beaten their kids. I was like, okay, okay, all right. All right, I'll do that. And it's like nonstop, especially when this book came out, the, the messages. You really helped me out. I was a single father struggling. This helped me out. I've been addicted. This helped me out, showed me light. And that's what it's about. Enough of me, enough of me. It's about them. It's about him. That. That. Is a better feeling than putting a bullet in somebody's eyeball. And don't don't let me fool you. That is a great feeling. <laughs> but <laughs> it won. It won. I'm one. I'm sold. I'm all in. I want to keep doing it. And I'm going to. Good for you. Yeah. What else did that lead into? Uh, led into some speaking stuff. And I was actually talking to Keith about this. I was like, I need to do more speaking. I want to do more speaking. I want to I want to f- feed guys. I want to feed more. I mean, it led into more products and, and stuff like that. And it's leading into books two and three coming up. Uh but as I was talking to Keith, I was like, dude, I need to somehow give these talks, but kind of, I want to interject God more. I want to talk about God more. And I don't want to talk about God where someone's like in verse, yada, 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 where it's just like, because I remember me, I'd be like, all right, I'm checked out. I don't know what that is. I mean, yeah. you, lo- you lost me. And um, I was like, I need to do that in a tactful way. And I'm thinking to myself, because man, if you said anything wrong, I'm like, I'm, I'm stiff arming you. Like, I don't want anything to do with you. Like, you can't force that stuff. 
Um, but I was like, I, I want to somehow do that. I want, I want to talk about him more. And uh, cause he's a part of the, he's, he's that story. He's me. And um, a day later, two days later, I got a call from a guy I did a podcast with a year before who was a pastor at a church. And he calls me and he goes, hey, Eddie, what's going on? He goes, this is, you know, so-and-so. I don't know if you remember doing a podcast. I was like, yeah, yeah. I'm like, how you doing, bud? What's going on? He's like, I, he's like, I have to talk to you. I was like, all right. He's like, I, I have two questions or two things I need to talk to you about. I was like, okay, cool. He's like, one, do you think, you know, next year around Memorial Day or 4th of July, you come up and talk to my church? I was like, yeah. I was like, sure. Like, I'd love to do that. And it kind of goes back to like, I need to interject more faith into my, my speaking and my testimony, right? Because I, if I leave that out, I'm not doing it justice. Um, and I'm lying. And he goes, one more thing. And he goes, this is, he's like, I've been thinking about this for weeks. He's like, I've been thinking about this for two weeks. He said two weeks, exactly. And uh, he goes, I don't know why. why I'm even asking this. He goes, I do know why, but it's just kind of crazy. And he's like, I really have no, and he was really worried about my reaction to what he was about to say. And he goes, you've been on my mind. And I was like, I want to be like, that's not really how you start a conversation with another dude, bro. <laughs> <laughs> but he's like, I can't stop thinking about you. I've been praying for you. He's like, you've just been weighing heavy on my mind. And uh, he goes, I have a gift of, I can write really good testimonies in a good way that you can tell your testimony and how God interjected and how it does, you know, it did certain things for you. And he said that. And I was just talking to Keith about this a couple of days before. It's crazy. I, I was blown away. I was like, what the heck? And so I said, sure. I'm like, sure. Okay. Like, that, that's good. He's like, well, just, you know, think about it and pray about it. And like when he said pray about it, I wasn't like, okay, what does that mean? Weird. I was like, okay, I will. And I will. And I did. And I was like, okay, I feel, I feel good. You know, I feel good about it. And he's like, let's talk, you know, next week. Uh, he texted me like, hey, let's, let's, let's talk in a couple of days after you have time to, you know, digest and process. So we talked and, um, one thing I didn't mention. So I, I told you this book was called Facade. And then it was like, once Keith and I started, it was within war. Cause just because like what I'm feeling within, like the war within inside of me, there's like a freaking combat zone in here, bro. And my heart and my head, every, everywhere, every little piece of my body. And then the war being in Afghanistan, Iraq, you know, Africa, all that stuff. And um, so it was within war. And then it just changed when we got to the publisher to be unafraid. So I have this call with this pastor and he goes... He goes, hey, Eddie, I, I really don't know a lot about you. He's like, I listen to a couple podcasts. I know you got the book out. He's like, I need to read that. So I really get to know you just so I can deliver a better testimony, speech, whatever you want, or sermon. And I was like, let me stop right there. We're not going to call it a sermon. We're going to call it a battle cry. I'm like, we're doing warrior. Like, I've been convicted. It's warrior. It's warrior to teach people warrior. We've got enough soft crap going on that we don't need that anymore. We don't need, we don't need more. And I'm not ripping on the soft crap. We need that compassion. We need that love. We do need that. But just think about it when you talk to your kid. But at the same time, when evil brings its head up in, into your face, you need to be ready to fight. And we're not, we're not equipped. We are not equipped. It's like us going overseas and we don't have any body armor and we have a gun with no ammunition. That's how we are right now. Yeah. I'm carrying stuff, but I, I can't do anything with it because I don't know how. I don't have it. Um... And so he goes, okay, battle cry it is. And so he goes into, he's like, here's what I'm thinking. I'm like, I was like, I've been thinking about the same thing for probably like the last year. He was like, he's like verifying every thought that I've been having. Uh, that I thought I was just like, okay, Eddie, you're thinking, you know, you're thinking about yourself here. You're going off on your own. This is just something you want to do, which I'm trying not to do. And uh, he goes, I also want to send you my book to read just so you know who I am, kind of what I believe, just so we, you know, before we work together. And I was like, sure. And he goes, so my, my book is called um, The War Within. And I go, what'd you just say? And he goes, The War Within. And I was like, I was like, dude, 
We the book Unafraid was going to be called Within War forever, for like years, and it changed at the last minute. And he's sending me a book now called The War Within. Like you can't make this up. No, you can't. You can't make it up. Another coincidence. Another coincidence. <laughs> and I'm like, dude, okay, like, all right, so like my passion and what I think, you know, where it's taken me and being verified by individuals not even that I know, um, you know, it's coming to life. And I read his book and it was like eye-opening, just really eye-opening stuff. And it was a great book. And uh, and so he just just the day before we came here, before I came here, he sent me the first draft of the testimony. It was like six pages, and it was like good stuff. It was like my story because he he knows my story. He's like, you plug in this story here. He's like, we're gonna work through this. We'll change some stuff up, and and it was like, you can't make this stuff up. The timing. Yeah. I mean, how many coincidences do we want to call out here? We've called out a lot. Yeah, it's not. <laughs> and I mean, I'm convicted. I'm convicted on what it is. And I really just think like my next, my next chapter, as I'm, as I'm fighting for God, man, I'm, I'm like going to be that warrior and I'm going to tell people my experience because that's all I have to go off of based off of his word and what I've experienced and how you process and what you take in is up to you and up to him. I have nothing but to tell the story. And, uh, and I'm, I'm fine with that and to encourage people and to motivate people and to give because I've taken too long. How's it feel to get up there and speak? I like it. You like it? I do. Do you get a rush out of it? I wouldn't say a rush, but I feel I feel very comfortable and I, I feel it's where I'm supposed to be. It's like, okay, this is my domain. This is where I'm supposed to be. And uh, it's just good to feel people. I can see, just seeing their faces, like it clicks, like, oh. Like I'm like, oh, yes, cool, rock on. How do you give your speeches? Do you give? It's more based off like a mindset, your it's mindset. A mindset. And I, I mean, I use past experiences. Why? I mean, because that's all I have to go off of. Yeah. Of what worked for me, what helped for me, um, and I just kind of go off of that and talk about the mindset piece. And now I, I, I feel I have a, I'm talking to my first church in December, uh, possibly same time, maybe before this thing comes out, uh, and I'm excited. I'm yeah. really excited just to be in God's presence, and I have a. I feel when I get up there and it's my floor being in that arena, no matter what the structure looks like or what it is, knowing what it is, I'm going to lose it. And I'm okay with that. Good for you. I'm okay with that. Do you want this out before that speech? You do your thing, man. You do your thing. Um, But yeah, I think that's what I'm supposed to be. I think I'm supposed to be encouraging, talking about faith. That's what I think I'm supposed to do. I think I'm supposed to be producing the gear that helps people. Like I, I my daughters wear this. My son wears this. Our, my sons wear this. Um, Amanda will wear it, my wife. And they'll just walk down the stairs and I'll just see unafraid and that just singing that. I'm like, that's right. I'm gonna tackle everything. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna be afraid of it. I'm going to go do it. And uh, yeah, just accountability. I love it. Good for you. I love it. How'd you meet your wife? And so that's like the biggest, that's a big piece. So God is awesome. God is awesome. He was the savior of my life. Christ was the savior of my life, 100%. Meeting my wife is like a whole nother type of awesome. I mean, you know what it is, right? Like you're, I really believe, we've seen the, the, the pictures on uh, media. You're only, the man is only as good as the woman next to him. And I really believe that. And um, I, I, I see see that now. Um, when I moved down to Texas after I was at Cincinnati for a brief time, I moved down and I went into the gym. And I walked. It was the first day. I'll never forget it. 
and I was in a relationship at the time. And I looked over and I saw my wife, Amanda. She was just a nobody at the time. And she was on the stair stepper on her little perch, looking over the gym, doing her on her <laughs> stairs, black yoga pants, hair up in a bun with a red tank top on. And I was like, stay away from that woman. That is bad news. I'm like, that is going to make me do some things that I've done in the past. And I don't want to go there again. And uh, so I would see her there quite often at the gym. Just her schedule would work out. I would be lying if I say I didn't tweak some scheduling pieces <laughs> to <laughs> coincide with hers. Um, but I didn't talk to her. I, d- I kept my distance. Um, I knew what would happen if I ever talked to her. And I was right. She was going through a divorce. She had two kids. I had my kids, uh, only two of them at that time. One was out of the house. Uh, two were, two were with me, and I was with another and with another woman. And we were going through some stuff. We were on the verge of breaking up. She was going through a divorce, and we just became friends. There was, it's the first woman I've been with that there was nothing physical. I didn't hold her hand. I didn't kiss her for like two years. For two years? Nothing. What was the initial conversation? I guess one of her friends is showing. spot? Show, what's that? What'd she say? You need a spot? <laughs> <laughs> you can get a spot. Uh, she said, what, I guess one of her friends came over. I don't know if she asked her friend to come over uh, or she just did. But I'm sure they were, I, I could tell they were talking about me, which secretly I loved. Um, the validation, right? So she comes over, she goes, her friend, she's like, so are you in a relationship? I'm like, I am. And she goes, oh, okay. And we just started like going back and forth. And then she goes, so you're not in a relationship? And she like changed her wording. So she asked me first, are you in a relationship? And I go, yes. And then we do this conversation and I'm like looking over at Amanda, knowing why she's asking me this. I know it's because of her. I know it. You you just know. And uh, she goes, so you're not in a relationship. And I go, that's right. I'm not, I go, uh, no, I just say no. Or I say, or I go, I go, yeah, I go, yeah. It's just confusing. Like, and then when she left, I'm like, oh my God, I just said I wasn't in a relationship. Like I was like, crap, I was so flustered knowing it was her. Cause I, I like Amanda's gorgeous. Like she just, she takes it. Like I understand the song, take my breath away from Top Gun. I get it. <laughs> from Top Gun. <laughs> the original. And, um, and so she probably goes, tells her, yeah, he doesn't have a girlfriend or is not with anyone. And so Amanda goes down. She knows a friend that works in the office at the gym. And she goes, look this guy up. She like saw me come in one day. She's like somebody that, let me see the, all the people that just swiped their card the last 15 minutes. So they get it up. She pulls it up, sees who it is, goes to media, figures it out. And she's like, and there was, my girlfriend was attached to the account. She's like, okay, this guy has a girlfriend. And so we eventually start talking. Her dad, she like, I can't remember how that first, like we just started making little comments to each other, like little, little things, nothing crazy. Then we just started like talking and just like a friendship kind of developed. Like there was no, dude, there was nothing. Like, like a little harmless flirting. Is that where we're going? I, I wouldn't even say that. I mean, it got there, but at first it was like, I, like I asked her, she's like, hey, do you need a job? Like I needed someone to do background checks because I didn't want to do it anymore. And like it's something that she could do remotely as long as she knew how to do it. And uh, so she started working for Contingent Group and she was just like a friend, like God honest truth, a friend. We didn't do anything, but we started working out at the same time, started like talking to each other. And then my relationship ended and then her divorce was getting bad. And she was kind of like me talking to her. Then she would talk to me. And there was like some ups and downs with the relationships. And then we finally just said, hey, let's, um, let's, you know, let's see each other after her, you know, she was done with her situation and all that stuff. And we just, that was it, became exclusive. And like, that woman's got my heart, man. I can tell. She's got my heart. She, I love seeing it, man. She is my best friend. She, I know I get no judgment, judgments for her and she holds me accountable, which I can't stand sometimes, but that girl holds me accountable. <laughs> 
<laughs> she would be like, you are being a loser. Like, stop. I was like, okay. <laughs> uh, it, I mean, just, just doing life with her. It's Good heaven, for you, man. It's heaven, man. Thank you. It's, uh, it's the greatest thing. So when we were doing the book. We got to finish it up with me proposing to her. I went and talked to her uh, mother because her dad passed, uh, who was a uh, green uh, spec ops dude in Vietnam with the army and uh, had a security company, like the same stuff. That's so, weird. So I guess like, Damn, that's weird. I would say a lot of the same things that he would say. I would be messing around be like, okay, pumpkin. And she would be like, what did you just say? And I'd be like, pumpkin. I'm just joking around with you. And she goes, my dad used to call me that all the time. Like that was happening all the time. One more coincidence for you to show you or to show everyone pretty much and myself. We, we got, we, we did a Montana trip. We did that road trip I, I discussed with you. And uh, I proposed her at the Grand Tetons up in Jackson Hole. And it was awesome. We, we did, you know, 13 day, like hitting Montana, shooting over to South Dakota, coming back, Colorado, all that stuff. And uh, we got engaged on that trip. And then, so we, the venue we wanted, we couldn't get until we just had it like two weeks ago, our ceremony, but we got married, went to the courthouse, got married. And uh, I was like, hey, why don't we go get some dinner, or, like celebrate somehow? And she goes, okay, cool. So we go to like our favorite little Italian place. And, uh, I, I text my son. I was like, he was the only one. I think the, her kids were somewhere else and mine was gone somewhere. And I was like, hey, dude, send me, look at the menu. Here's the website. Tell me what you want and we'll bring it home for you. We're going to grab a bite to eat. He goes, okay. So he sends what he wants. It's like the most expensive thing. And I'm like, and so Amanda's like, he's not getting that. Like, dude, my, my son's palate's like ridiculous. He's like wanting red snapper while all the other kids want chicken nuggets. Like, it's like... <laughs> Like it's good to have kids test or taste everything, but dude, when they start liking, it's like your bill's like now nine hundred dollars when it's supposed to be nine dollars. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, he's like he he eats it, he eats it all. He loves sushi, he loves it all. But I was like, what did that? So we got him something else, and I was like, what did that? What did he want? So I like look at the menu. I was like, dude, that does look good. So I got that, and it was like clams, mussels, calamari, and like some pasta with some marinara. So we get it and, you know, we say grace and, um, right that earlier that day, um, I did a podcast and I have to rehash past relationships, my past. And it, and it, it's hard for her to hear sometimes. Yeah. I mean, rightfully so. I understand. I, I really do. But I tried to explain like, Hey, I have to talk about my past. I've got to talk about all the bad things. Otherwise the redemption and pulling myself out of a very dark place means nothing. I've got to set the stage. And we talked, we were talking about that. And I'm like, it's all good. Like we are, it's it's good. Everything's fine. And um, and I felt bad for her. I, I was like, I don't want her to relive this. I want her to re I want us to live us right now. And so I take a bite, I I, I dig into a clam and I get the meat out with my fork and you know, pop in the meat enjoying all of a sudden I get this crunch. I was like, what the heck? And I thought like a molar or some kind of weird cap that the Navy put in was falling out. And um, so I, 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 like a fat kid, eat all the food around whatever's in my mouth, this, this forward object. I pull it out and I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. It was a freaking white pearl. What? It was a white pearl. Not a black pearl, not a piece of rock. It was a white pearl that you would see if I'm going to go pick out a piece of jewelry and get it get it for my girlfriend, fiance, or wife. That's what you would pick. That's what you would. It would be one of those. Are you serious? I swear to God, I could not believe it. I could not believe it. And um, she thought I staged it, which I was like, man, I really should have. That's a great idea. But I'm like. I'm like, what the heck? I, we're like, we're looking at this thing. And we're just like, we're putting like a napkin and our waitress comes by. And I'm like, we just found a pearl. And this waitress we use all the time. She's been there for 20 something years at this restaurant. She's like, never has anyone found anything like that. And she's like, let me see it. And we show her, she's like, oh my God. She's like, you just found that? And we're like, yeah. Like, yeah. 
And we like, so we start Googling, right? Because Google tells all. And it's like the chances of finding a pearl in a clam or oyster is like every 10,000. Clam is more is more rare. Uh, but usually when you find a pearl or what we would consider pearl, there, there's like multi, like five different colors. There's black ones. There's all these different colors. The chances of finding like a white pearl is like, it's just it's not going to happen. It doesn't really happen. Another coincidence. So I'm like, and, it, and, it, and it's, and we're looking up, okay, what is the meaning of this? What is the meaning of it? Like says, you know, like it says like new beginnings, wisdom. And it's just like all these things. It's like, oh my God, like what's happening? Like what the heck? And, and I go, and, and like after I process, once again, I start crying. <laughs> And I'm like, do you understand this? And she goes, what do you mean? I go, we just got married today. This is a gift from God. I truly believe that that was a gift from God. It still is a gift from God. I believe it. The coincidences, it doesn't add up. Yeah. It doesn't work that way. It does not work that way. So we call our moms. She's talking to her mom on her phone. I'm talking to my mom, explaining this. They're crying. We're crying. I had to like, she called her good friend. She's crying. I had to call Dom. He's starting to choke up. I'm like explaining all this, like trying to like calm down. I'm like, dude, can you freaking believe that this is insane? And it's just like, finally, out of trying to like get my life, that was like a tangible sign. Like, hey, you're on the right track to me. That's what it felt like. It's like, hey, you're doing good. Keep going. Good job. Here's your water. Here's a cliff bar. Keep going. And it was just, it felt really good. So we took that pearl and we turned it into a bracelet. And we keep it um, where we, we always have these two seats where we have coffee. And we got a little, I call it the battle box. And it's the clam, the clam that it came out of. And this pearl brace that sits in it with a bunch of pictures oh man that's so anytime cool. we're arguing with each other we pull out that battle box and we put this on top and it's like do you remember this and we hash it out and it's really cool good for you man and minus her rings that was the only piece of jewelry she wore was that pearl uh this past weekend it was i'll make sure i give you the picture I'm really happy for you. Uh, I, and only if, only when I finally started to listen, I stopped listening to myself and started listening to him. And uh, since I did, like I said, when I quit drinking, things started changing a lot. And I, I mentioned that pastor that reached out, he's like, I've been thinking about you two weeks ago. Exactly two weeks to the day is when I stopped drinking. To the day. I'm not making this up. Wow. Yeah, man. It's beautiful. It really is. It's beautiful. And it's not like it's all, like I said before, peaches and cream or a walking through the field of daisies. It's still daily a freaking grind, man, to try to do the right thing, dealing with kid issues, wife issues, work issues, friend issues. The news, current events, it's still, it's still a battle. Yeah. But we can choose how we handle those. And there's certain things that we can do to make this and this better. You know? Yeah. Th there is. Happiness is a choice. Oh, 100%. 100%. It is. Yeah. It really is. And, um, yeah. You got it. I do. I see it all over you. I do, and I appreciate that, man. That means a lot. It really does. Um, yeah, I'm very happy, man. I'm I'm very happy with my wife. My wife is. I love her so much. I can tell. I do. What's this podcast you guys are doing together? So we have the penny. So we have two podcasts. We got the Unafraid podcast, where we kind of like talk about the chapters, and we're starting to do other things now. But then we got the Pennies podcast. Which we just started having these conversations and we're like, I was like, man, why don't we, we should do a podcast over this. Or she said it and I was like, okay. So 
being true to my word, I just started ordering a bunch of stuff off Amazon, got it sent up and just took a room that we were really like, it was a sitting room. Like, all right, this is the new podcast. Actually, I had jujitsu mats everywhere that the boys and I would just mess, mess around with and do fighting stuff on. So I ripped those out and made a podcast room. And um, we just wanted to be real. Like we just said, we want to be real. Talk about relationship things. She talks a lot about having to deal with deal with me, my anger, certain issues, the drinking. Uh, we lay it out there. We talk about it all. We we talk about a lot of stuff, faith stuff, the struggles. We talk about it, and we just we're just real, man. We're just we're just real, and uh, it's I loved on that podcast with her. We just get so close, and I can just see see her working, and I just I think that's probably one of the the best times that I truly understand what she's talking about and what she's getting and uh it's good it's really good yeah it's 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 fun i like watching it i mean you guys interact with each other yeah really i mean it's a it's a good example you know for for there's not a lot of I don't think there's a lot of happy married couples. I don't think there is either. You know, in in I've um, had two of them that were unhappy. Yeah, and you see that. At least me and my wife see it when we hang around couples who aren't happy. They get the. It's just not a good atmosphere to be in. I, I sense. You can sense jealousy. You can sense mm-hmm. they want your relationship to crash. They want to drag you down on your level and end up. Uh, so putting things out like that, like what you and Amanda are doing, it's it's just a good example mm-hmm. for 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 married couples. I appreciate that, man. That's good to hear. Yeah, that's good to hear. It's it's hard to do them sometimes because the mindset's got to be in a certain place, especially for her. She's like, I really just don't feel like it. I just don't feel like it. And I and I and and we had a discussion about this actually like two weeks ago. I was like. We'll be amped to do a podcast and she will like, it's time to do the podcast and she'll get a real bad headache or she'll get really tired or she'll be like, I just don't want to do it. And it happened like two or three times. Mm -hmm. And like on the third or fourth time, I was like, I was like, do you realize that we will have it ready to go? We know we're going to talk about, we don't like plan. We just, we just want to free flow, right? Shoot from the hip. Yeah. But we have a topic, right? Because of based off of something, I was like, "Do you realize that this has been happening right before we're about to do a podcast?" I was like, "Is it possible that you're getting these feelings because this message shouldn't go out to help all these different people? Like, it's not a coincidence that you're feeling that, and it goes back to that spiritual warfare piece and calling it out. Like, dude, we got to fight this. Like, let's go. We're, we're pushing through this. We've got to do it. Yeah, it's helping others, man." Yeah. It's helping it's helping others much like this show is going to help others. Just like I watch your shows that I'm not on and it helps me. I mean, listen to Chipley. I was like, dude, man, wow. Like it was good. I mean, I hate hearing that and hate to hear other buddies go through that, but at the same time it's like, okay, I'm not alone. It's yeah. normal. Yeah. It's not normal, but it's you know what I mean. Yeah, you know, I mean, is that is the podcast still on? It's on Unafraid or Eddie Penny. Uh, the podcast is on everything, like YouTube, Spotify. It's on everything. But you can if you go to EddiePenny.com, I put some of them up there. But I have links to all the podcasts on all my profiles. Okay, I got like the link tree or whatever. Yeah, that goes to anything and everything. Okay, we'll link it below. How do you guys pick your topics? Me and my wife do a podcast to a very similar, but not mm-hmm. so similar. Uh, where we just we call ours. It's not just us, and it's 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 bringing up struggles. And the whole yep. point is to be like, look, you know, this is what social media looks like, but that's not that's not what we're dealing with. Mm-hmm. You know, this there's real there's a real we're a real couple behind the scenes with right, real struggles, right? right. And, not this facade, yeah, right. And so we put it out there, to, you know, in hopes that people are like, oh, you know, we deal with that shit, right? We, we get advice from it. We oh, learn a hundred percent. Oh, absolutely. It's, it, it goes both ways. Yeah. It goes both ways. You're just kind of starting the conversation. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, we just kind of go over what we're honestly dealing with or struggling with. We'll go over some of that at the time. Yeah. Like in some of it, like, oh man, we should have talked about this or we, we, or another couple or something. 
we might hear about something and we're like, let's talk about this. But usually it's stuff that we go through. Like I talked about my anger, like getting the gangling block shots did really nothing for me. Uh, we talked about that stuff. Talked about that vision I had about the craziness that's been going on, the coincidences, just like crazy stuff. We just, we just talk about it. Yeah. But a lot of the struggles, I mean, we, we, we call it like the PTSD piece a lot because she lives with it. She had to deal with her father. Yeah. And now she's dealing with, with me. So she's, she understands it very well. That's how she would probably deal with me. And I'm much better now, but I still have my issues, man. Mm-hmm. It's gotten way better since I quit drinking, but. Uh, What's yeah. something you would like to work on? The cussing still. The cussing? Yeah, but I mean, I don't want to get. I have a tendency if I'm upset with someone that I can kind of pretty much treat you like you're dead. I don't want to do that. I can do it with my kids. I do that. I don't like doing that. You're almost like you're dead to me until I'm over pouting. Mm-hmm. And then I can come back and we can engage like nothing ever happened. I want to get better at that. I want to look at it for what it is and be like, okay, you're a child. I'm a 44-year-old man that claims to be mentally tough, right? Mm-hmm. Like I, and like I said, man, I, I still struggle like just like the next guy. I just fix one thing and move on to the next. Uh, but that would probably be my number one thing is like, the patience and the understanding and the grace uh, a little bit more. Oh God. That's, that's the, that's my battle right now. That's my battlefield. Well, Eddie, I just, man, I'm happy you came. I'm glad I got the invite, buddy. I appreciate it. It was awesome to see you, dude. You too. And well done on this podcast. Like, You've got a very good podcast here, dude. I'm very proud of you. Thank you. And like, I'm just glad things are working out for you. Got the family. You're getting overrun by Californians. Uh, like, I'm, I'm super. <laughs> 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 it's it's good to see your brothers like doing well, man. Yeah. I, I, lo- I love it. I love it. So just keep going. Keep going. I know you will. I will. I you too. Will. I got one last question. Yes, sir. You have a son. I do. Your wife has two sons. So. I have a, right now, I have a 13-year-old son, I have an 18-year-old daughter, and a 23-year-old daughter. She has a 7-year-old son and a 10-year-old daughter. So we all we both have all these. Okay. So that's what that's what she brought in. She brought in two. I had three. Okay. Only one's in the house from my side right now. So we have three total in the house. After everything you've been through, would you want your sons to join the military and go to war? Am I allowed to pick a good government? That's. <laughs> Would you want your children to experience what you experienced? No. And yes. No. Because I don't want them to have to deal with the aftermath. Yes. Because I want them to understand evil and I want them to live. And I know that sounds kind of weird going to war living, but. It makes sense. That's living. And uh, fighting for a great country. This is, a, no matter what the tabloids say, this is a great country. The people of this country are great people. Um, what we stand for is a great country. That flag is great. Yes, I would want them to stand up, but only, only if their heart and soul is in it. That's it. If their heart and soul is not in it, then I wouldn't want them to do it. If they felt forced to do it, I wouldn't want them to do it. If they wanted to it, if they fiend it, if they craved it, absolutely. And I know the baggage that comes with it, and I would be there to support them the best I possibly could. Well, thanks for answering that. Yeah. But once again, Eddie, it was a a real honor to have you here sitting across from me and and uh I just wish you the best of luck with Contingent Group, with Unafraid, with your book, with your next book coming out, your podcast, your personal life, and your family life. And, Likewise, uh, my friend. Likewise. Thank you. It's good to see you where you are. It's good. <laughs> Thank, you. Uh, All right, I'm in. Thank you. Appreciate it.
Hey everybody, I'm Sean Ryan. Click here to subscribe to the Sean Ryan Show YouTube channel for the hottest and most compelling interviews that you will not see anywhere else. I've also made a playlist of all the previous SRS episodes so they're easy to find. You can find that right here.